Section 19 of The Great Events by Famous Historians, Volume 10. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Ted Leinhart. The Great Events by Famous Historians, Volume 10, by Charles F. Horn, Rossiter Johnson, and John Rudd. Section 19. Building of the First Theater in England, A.D. 1576, Carl Mancius. A history of the theater, the scholarly work of Mancius, has had no time to become a classic, published 1904, but certainly the author has delved into his subject with a minuteness and presented it with a lively interest which fully justify the selection of his work for presentation here. The theater has become so prominent an institution among us that its origin must be of interest to all, and the building of the first theater is inextricably interwoven with the larger and vaguer story of the rise of the modern drama itself. The dramatic arts of Greece and Rome had never been wholly forgotten. Their traditions survived in Italy in the crude pantomime performances of the common people. Practically, however, the Middle Ages invented a new dramatic art of their own, developed from the gorgeous religious pantomime of the church services. The theater was born of the cathedral, the stage of the altar. The plays, at first purely religious, rapidly developed a comic side, which by degrees became their central theme. The moral purpose of the performance was forgotten, and the church disowned its evil changeling. To none of these early plays can the term drama be accurately applied, for each and all of them lack plot. They are merely a series of disconnected scenes, pictures having small connection and less development. The idea of pursuing a single, slowly developing story to its climax and conclusion dawns upon the modern stage only with the English Elizabethan drama. Despite our imperfect knowledge of the plays and players of that time, one feels almost justified in saying that the modern drama was created about 1580 by Christopher Marlowe and was raised to the highest point of its development about 1600 by William Shakespeare. At the date of Shakespeare's birth, 1564, no permanent theater as yet existed in England, but there had long existed a class of professional actors descended partly from the mystery and the miracle-playing artisans of the Middle Ages, partly from the strolling players, equilibrists, jugglers, and jesters. Professional Italian actors, players of the Commedia dell'arte, who in the 16th century spread their gay and varied art all over Europe, also supplied English players with that touch of professional technique in which their somewhat vacillating and half-amateurish arts were still wanting. Well, however, as far as France is concerned, the Italian influence must strike everybody who studies the stage history of the country. The evidence of a fertilization of English scenic art by the Commedia dell'arte is scanty, yet I think it is sufficient to deserve more attention than it has hitherto been bestowed upon it. In any case, there is sufficient evidence to prove that Italian professional actors penetrated into England and exercised their art there. In January 1577, an Italian comedian came to London with his company. The English called him Druciano, but his real name was Druciano Martinelli, the same who, with his brother Tristano, visited the court of Philip II, and there is no reason to suppose that he was either the first or the last of his countrymen who tried to carry off English gold from merry London. The typical Italian masks are quite well known to the authors of that period. Thus, Thomas Haywood mentions all these doctors, zanies, pantaloons, and harlequins, in which the French, and still more the Italians, distinguish themselves. In Kidd's Spanish Tragedy, and in Ben Jonson's The Case is Altered, mention is made of the Italian improvised comedy, and a few of the well-known types of character in the dramatic literature of the time bear distinct traces of having been influenced by Italian masks, for example, Ralph Royster Doyster in Udell's comedy of that name, as well as the splendid Captain Bobadil and his no less amusing companion, Captain Tuca, in Ben Jonson's 
Every Man in His Humor, and The Poetaster, all of which are reproductions of the typical Capitano. However, it is not these literary testimonies that I consider the most striking evidence of the influence of Italian professional technique on English professional actors. It is a remarkable discovery made by the highly esteemed Shakespearean archaeologist Edmund Malone about a century ago in Dulwich College, that mine of ancient English dramatic research founded by the actor Edward Allen. Among the notes left by the old pawnbroker and theatrical manager, Henslow, and the various papers, letters, parts, accounts, etc., of his son-in-law, the famous and very wealthy actor Allen, among these rare documents to which we owe a great part of our knowledge of the Shakespearean stage, Malone found four remarkable cardboard tables on which the plots of his many plays were put down, together with the names of the persons represented, their entrances and exits, cues for music, sonnets, etc. According to Collier's description, these tables, one of which only is preserved, the three others having disappeared through the carelessness and disorder which at that time prevailed in the Dulwich Treasury, were about 15 inches in length and 9 in breadth. They were divided into two columns, and between these, toward the top of the table, there was a square hole for hanging it up on a hook or some such thing, they bore the following titles. 1. The Plot of the Dead Man's Fortune. 2. The Plot of the First Part of Tamar Cain. 3. The Plot of Frederick and Basilia. 4. The Plot of the Second Part of the Seven Deadly Sins. The last mentioned play is known for certain to have been composed by the excellent comic actor Richard Tarleton. Gabriel Harvey, the astrologist and the implacable antagonist of Thomas Nash, tells us in his letters how Tarleton himself in Oxford invited him to see his celebrated play on the seven deadly sins. Harvey asked him which of the seven was his own deadly sin, and he instantly replied, By gee, the sin of other gentlemen, lechery. Tarleton died in the year 1588, and some of the other plays, especially The Dead Man's Fortune, are considered to be a good deal older than his. They belong, therefore, to an early period of the English Renaissance stage. These four tables caused considerable trouble to Malone and his contemporary Stevens, as well as to later investigators, as they are without equals in the archaeology of the English stage. If these men had known that such tables, containing the plot of the piece which was acted at the time, were always hung upon the stage of the Italian Commedia dell'arte in order to assist the memory of the improvising actors, they would have seen instantly that their essential historical importance to us consists in their showing by documentary evidence how the early Elizabethan scenic art in its outer form was influenced and improved by the Italians. The fact that one of the principal characters in the oldest scenario the Dead Man's Fortune, bears the name of Pantaloon, further confirms this supposition. This is not the place to investigate how far the English were influenced by Italian professional dramatic art. At any rate, the English national character differed too much from the Italian to allow it to receive more than an outward and formal stamp, and even this superficial effect is much less significant in England than in France. Still, we are certainly not mistaken in assuming that it helped to strengthen English dramatic art, which already possessed no small amount of power, and we may take it for granted that about the time of Shakespeare's birth, London possessed a socially and professionally organized class of actors, in spite of the fact that they did not yet possess a theater of their own. Before proper theaters were built, and after the time of the great mysteries, the actors found a refuge for their art chiefly in the inns, those splendid and expensive old public houses which convey to our minds the idea of old-fashioned and picturesque comfort, where the nobility and clergy sought their quarters in winter and where the carriers unloaded their goods in the large square yards, which were surrounded on all sides by the walls of the inn. On these walls there were galleries running all round, supported by wooden pillars and with steep picturesque ladders running up to them. It was in these yards of the Cross Keys and Grace Church Street, of the Bull and Bishopsgate Street, 
La Belle Sauvage on Ludgate Hill or the Tabard Inn in Southwark that the actors set up their stages. Perhaps it was this very circumstance that became one of the indirect reasons why they finally were obliged to build a house for themselves. Certainly the inns offered advantages to the actors. They were meeting places for the public, frequented by lords and other persons of distinction. Probably the companies paid next to nothing for the use of them. In themselves, they afforded good room for the audience, with a natural pit for ordinary people in the yard, and with more comfortable boxes for the more distinguished part of the audience on the surrounding balconies and at the windows facing the yard. On the other hand, these inn theaters had their drawbacks. In the first place, the actors were not on their own ground, and so, after all, they were only tolerated. Secondly, it must have been very difficult for them to keep to regular prices, and especially to secure the payment of the entrance fee, as they had probably to collect their money during or after the performance, thus depending on the liberality of the public for their remuneration. And finally, worst of all, they were led into quarrels with the Lord Mayor and with the citizens. Indeed, it is not unlikely that these performances in the inns caused a good deal of noise and disturbance in the quarters where they took place, and that the joyous, but by no means refined or quiet, pit, when going home, excited by one of Tarleton's jigs and by the strong ale of the inn, was not animated by very respectful feelings toward their sour Puritan fellow citizens, who were scandalized as they watched Mary London crowding past their windows, nor is it improbable that these anything but respectful feelings vented themselves in some of the coarse expressions in which the plays of those times abound, where Puritanism, the sworn enemy, is concerned. This barbarous sect, as it is called by a modern English author, from whose inherited and contagious tyranny this nation is as yet but imperfectly released." It is certain, at any rate, that the Puritan citizens entertained a deep and sincere hatred of anything connected with plays and actors, and if it had been in their power to do what they liked, the world would once for all have been relieved of such pernicious and wicked vagabonds as William Shakespeare, Christopher Marlowe, and Ben Jonson. Fortunately, however, this power did not lie with the Puritans only. Luckily, this sect which, like a malicious growth, seemed to have gathered to itself all the stubbornness, insensibility, and rude obstinacy of the nation, was counterbalanced by a refined and intellectual nobility, which was inspired by the new artistic and philosophical thought of the Renaissance, and seemed to foresee, if not fully to recognize, what a mine of poetry the English theater of those times was destined to be. Thanks to men like Sir Francis Walsingham, Lords Leicester, Nottingham, Strange, and Sussex, the drama resisted for a time the violent and unwearied attacks of the Puritans. Most fortunately for the actors also, Queen Elizabeth, as well as her successors, James I and Charles I, was fond of plays and favorably inclined toward the performers. Elizabeth rendered a great service to the actors by placing them under the patronage of the nobility. The municipal authorities, who were frequently Puritan, considered neither dramatic art nor dramatic poetry as an acceptable means of livelihood. Consequently, those who cultivated these noble arts easily exposed themselves to being treated as masterless men, unless they could give a reference to some distinguished aristocratic name. The Queen ordered by law, in a statute which has often been misunderstood, that all common players of interludes wandering abroad, other than players of interludes belonging to any baron of this realm or any other honorable personage of greater degree, to be authorized to play under the hand and seal of arms of such baron or personage, shall be adjudged and deemed rogues and vagabonds. In other words, the queen urged all actors, for their own sakes, to place themselves under the patronage of some nobleman, in order to protect them against the persecution of the Puritan citizens. But even such mighty protection could not entirely shield them, and it was this very power of the London Corporation to injure the actors that caused the establishment of the first London theater. 
In the year 1572, the plague broke out in London. It killed many thousands of people and kept recurring at certain intervals during the next 20 or 30 years, carrying horror and death with it. Under these circumstances, all dramatic performances were prohibited for a time in London, a precaution which was reasonable enough, as the dense crowding of people might have helped to spread the disease, but the magistrate seems to have caught eagerly at this opportunity of interfering. In Harrison's Description of England, the event is reported as follows. Plays are banished for a time out of London, lest the resort unto them should engender a plague, or rather disperse it, being already begone. Would to God these common plays were exiled for altogether as seminaries of impiety, and their theaters pulled down as no better than houses of bawdry. It is an evident token of a wicked time when plays wax so rich that they can build such houses, as much I wish also to our common bear baitings used on the Sabbath days. We cannot help noticing the predilection of the Puritans for the coarse bear fights, which in their opinion were only displeasing to God when performed on a Sabbath, whereas the playhouses at any time were no better than the ill-famed stews in Southwark. It can be denied, however, that under the prevailing circumstances it was quite right that the playhouses should be temporarily forbidden. But the sudden and unwarranted expulsion of all dramatic performances from the precincts of London a few years later, 1575, cannot be accounted for otherwise than by the increasing popularity which these plays enjoyed among the non-Puritan public, and the envy with which the clergy saw the people crowding much more to the places where actors interpreted the rising poets than to those where the preachers themselves enunciated their gloomy doctrine. In the year 1574, the actor James Burbage, with four other actors, all belonging to the retinue of the Earl of Leicester, had received permission from the Queen to perform all kinds of plays anywhere in England, for the recreation of her beloved subjects, as well as for her own comfort and pleasure, if it should please her to see them. Perhaps it was a counter-move on the part of the Puritan community when the Lord Mayor and the Corporation in the following years straightway forbade all plays within the precincts of the town. If so, it proved a failure. James Burbage resolutely hired a liberty outside the city, and here, in 1576, on the premises of an ancient Roman Catholic priory, he built the first English playhouse, which he named the Theatre. In the following year, the Theatre gained an ally in the Curtain, which was built in the same neighborhood, both, of course, causing great indignation among the Puritans. In 1577, the year after the first playhouse had been erected, there appeared a furious pamphlet by John Northbrook, against dicing, dancing, plays, and interludes, as well as other idle pastimes. No doubt all possible means were taken to have plays forbidden and the playhouses pulled down, but though the attack of the Black Army never ceased for a moment, the Puritans did not succeed in getting the better of the theaters till the year 1642, when they acquired political power through the Civil War. And fortunately for the part of mankind which appreciates art, this precious flower of culture, one of the richest and most remarkable periods in the life of dramatic art, had developed into full bloom before the outbreak of the war. In a sermon of 1578, we read the following bitter and deep-drawn sigh by the clergyman John Stockwood. Will not a filthy play with the blast of a trumpet sooner call thither a thousand than an hour's tolling of a bell bring to the sermon a hundred? Nay, even here in the city, without it be at this place and some other certain ordinary audience, where shall you find a reasonable company? Whereas, if you resort to the theater, the curtain, and other places of plays in the city, you shall on the Lord's day have these places, with many other that I cannot reckon, so full as possible they can throng." that the bold defiance with which James Burbage and the other actors met the Lord Mayor and the Corporation should prove so successful lay almost in the nature of things. 
the prohibition of plays within the bounds of the city of London did not mean that they were looked upon with animosity by the people, but merely that a majority of the corporation was unfriendly to them. It was soon shown that, though the wise city fathers could easily forbid the actors to perform their plays in London, they could not prevent the enthusiastic public from walking in crowds a mile out of town in order to see such performances, especially as people were quite accustomed to the journey. Burbage, who was a businesslike man, had chosen his ground quite close to the public places, where the Londoners practiced their open-air sports and amused themselves with tennis and football, stone-throwing, cockfights, and archery. Although Burbage called his new building the theater, the title was not intended to mean the theater par excellence, for the word theater was not then commonly used to denote a building in which dramatic representations were performed. It is more probable that he thought he had succeeded in choosing an elegant name with a certain suggestion of the old classics, which was euphonious and not quite common. The usual name for a theater was the playhouse, a house intended for all kinds of games and sport, such as fencing, bear fights, bullfights, jigs, morris dances, and pantomimes, as well as for dramatic performances. It cannot be sufficiently emphasized that the theatrical entertainments of those times were something more or less literary. Anyhow, something quite apart from the dramatic performances of the present day. They were meant to satisfy mixed desires in the nation, but besides satisfying its craving for beautiful picturesque language, fine spectacles, and merry jests, they also gratified its desire for the display of physical strength, for shallow rhyming tricks and competitions, graceful exercises of the body, indeed for all that might be included under the notion of sport and give opportunity for betting. Therefore the plays, properly so called, alternated with fights between animals, in which bears and bulls were baited by great bloodthirsty bulldogs, or with fencing matches fought by celebrated English and foreign fencing masters, with rope dancing, acrobatic tricks, and boxing. Even the serious performances ended with a more or less absurd jig in which the clown sang endless songs about the events of the day and danced interminable Morris dances. Shakespeare and his contemporaries, whose works are now reckoned among the first literature, so much so that they are scarcely read any longer, at the time of which we are speaking were nothing but practical playwrights, and Shakespeare was so far from dreaming that the time would come when his plays would be counted among the most precious treasures of posterity that, as we know, he did not even take the trouble to have a printed edition of his works published. The many fighting scenes in the plays of the time, in Shakespeare's among the rest, the wrestling match in As You Like It, the duel between Macduff and Macbeth, the fencing scene between Hamlet and Laertes, no doubt afforded opportunities for magnificent displays of skill in the use of arms and in physical exercises, and we may be sure that the spectators followed those scenes with an interest which was perhaps more of a sporting than of a literary nature. It was according to a well-calculated plan, therefore, that the elder Burbage erected his playhouse north of the city in Finsbury Fields, where from ancient times the people had been accustomed to see and practice military exercises and other sports, and where the soldiers were still in the habit of practicing archery and musketry. And it is with equally sound calculation that he gave the theater its particular form, which remained essentially the same in all the playhouses of the Shakespearean period. Before the establishment of the permanent theaters, there had long existed amphitheaters for the performance of fights between animals, the so-called rings. These rings, the auditorium as well as the arena, were open all round, and the seats, like those of the ancient Greek theater, were placed according to the natural formation of the ground. Burbage retained the circular amphitheatrical form, being a joiner as well as an actor and manager, he was no doubt his own architect in his new theatrical enterprise. But instead of the roofless open-air auditorium, he constructed a covered circular wooden building with stories or galleries, 
which was made so as to contain a number of boxes for this distinguished and well-paying public, and which entirely enclosed the open, uncovered arena, which, as it recalled the inn-yards, was called the yard, or afterward, perhaps on account of the high pit-like construction surrounding it, the pit, whence the poorest and humblest spectators enjoyed the performances. Finally, he built a covered tire-house, or tiring-house, as it was called in those times, for the actors, a place in which also all the requisites and the so-called properties were kept. This tiring house stood within the circle, and its roof towered up above the auditorium. From the tiring house, the stage, a simple wooden platform resting on rams, was pushed forward, and it might be removed when the arena was to be used for fights between animals, etc., instead of dramatic performances. By this reform of the building, a reform which became epic-making to the whole Shakespearean period, James Burbage obtained a threefold advantage, more comfortable seats for the more distinguished portion of the audience, where they were sheltered from wind and weather, the use of the house both for plays and the baiting of animals, and the power to oblige the public to pay their admission at certain doors of his building which spared him the unpleasant and unsafe collection of money from the spectators, who might not always be very willing to pay. But this result was not obtained without considerable expense. Though we are not so fortunate as to possess a drawing of the outside or inside of the theater, about the shape of which, therefore, we must partly draw our conclusions from analogy with other playhouses, we are comparatively well informed as to its outward history till it was pulled down in 1598-1599. Thus we know that the enterprise cost James Burbage 666 pounds, 13 shillings, 4 pence, a considerable sum in those days, which would be equal to about eightfold that amount in our own time. This money Burbage borrowed of his father-in-law, John Brains, to whom he had to pay high interest and it represented only the cost of the building itself, for he did not buy the ground on which it stood. This ground belonged to one Giles Allen, and in the contract between him and Burbage it was settled, among other points, that if, in the course of the first ten years after the drawing up of the lease, Burbage spent a sum of two hundred pounds or more on the building, he should have a right to remove it after the expiration of the lease. The lease was drawn up in the year 1576 for a period of 21 years, in spite of many pecuniary difficulties, which the heavy rent and high interest naturally entailed on Burbage, who for some time even seems to have been obliged to mortgage his entire property, and innumerable annoyances from the Puritans, Burbage succeeded in keeping his theater above water till the expiration of the lease and till his own death which occurred in 1597. But before this date, he had been negotiating with the proprietor, Giles Allen, about a prolongation of the lease. Allen, who was evidently as grasping as he was difficult to deal with, and who may not unjustly be suspected of having been an instrument in the hands of the Puritan authorities, had caused him a good deal of trouble in the course of years. On seeing how people crowded to the theater, he had tried, for one thing, to press Burbage for a higher rent, and partly for religious, partly for moral reasons, had threatened to forbid the running of a playhouse on his property. The negotiations about the new lease had not come to an end when the elder Burbage died and left his two sons, Cuthbert, who was a bookseller, and Richard, who was the leading actor of his time, not only burdened with a playhouse, the long lease of which had expired, but opposed by a proprietor with whom it was impossible to come to terms, and by a magistrate who was more eager than ever to deal a blow at the playhouses. In the same year, when the two brothers took on the theater, the Lord Mayor of London actually succeeded in inducing the Privy Council to issue an order of suppression against it and other playhouses. The order begins as follows. Her Majesty being informed that there are very great disorders committed in the common playhouses, both by lewd matters that are handled on the stages, and by resort and confluence of bad people, hath given direction 
that not only no plays shall be used within London or about the city or in any public place during this time of summer, but that all those playhouses that are erected and built only for such purposes shall be plucked down, namely the curtain and the theater near to Shoreditch or any other within that county. It is not known whether the order was withdrawn or whether the disregard of it was winked at. The court very likely was not particularly inclined to see the sentence or condemnation carried out. At all events, neither the curtain nor the theater was pulled down at the time. But the order shows how much power the Puritans possessed and what difficulties the brothers Burbage had to contend with. They seem, however, to have inherited their father's resolute character since it seemed quite impossible to come to terms with the grasping proprietor, Allen, the brothers were sensible enough to avail themselves of the clause in the now-expired lease, which permitted them to pull down and remove the buildings they had erected on the premises in case they had spent at least 200 pounds on them during the first 10 years. This sum had been much exceeded at the time, and one day, to the great consternation and anger of the astonished Giles Allen, they simply removed the theater. One of the paragraphs in the account of the subsequent lawsuit between Allen and the Burbages gives a very vivid idea of this remarkable removal. Allen accuses Cuthbert Burbage of unlawfully combining and confederating himself with the said Richard Burbage and one Peter Street, William Smith, and diverse other persons, to the number of twelve, to your subject unknown, did about the 8th and 20th day of December in the 1 and 40th year of your Highness reign, 1598, riotously assemble themselves together, and then and there armed themselves with diverse and many unlawful and offensive weapons, as namely swords, daggers, bills, axes, and such like, and so armed did then repair unto the said theater, and then and there armed as aforesaid, in very riotous, outrageous, and forcible manner, and contrary to the laws of your highness' realm, attempted to pull down the said theater, whereupon diverse of your subjects, servants, and farmers, there going about in peaceable manner to procure them to desist from that their unlawful enterprise, they the said riotous persons, aforesaid, notwithstanding, procured then therein with great violence, not only then and there forcibly and riotously resisting your subjects, servants, and farmers, but also then and there pulling, breaking, and throwing down the said theater in very outrageous, violent, and riotous sort, to the great disturbance and terrifying not only of your subjects, said servants and farmers, but of diverse others of your majesty's loving subjects there near inhabiting, and having so done, did then also in most forcible and riotous manner, take and carry away from thence all the wood and timber thereof, unto the bank side in the parish of St. Mary Overus, and there erected a new playhouse with the said timber and wood. Such was the end of the first short lived London playhouse. But the new house, which was built out of its materials on the bank side, was the celebrated Globe the name of which is inseparably connected with that of Shakespeare. As we said before, James Burbage, the creator of the theater, belonged to the company which played under the patronage of Lord Leicester and therefore went under the name of Lord Leicester's servants or men. The four other actors, who in 1574 received a royal license to act from Queen Elizabeth, were John Perkin, John Lanham, William Johnson, and Robert Wilson. While James Burbage was no doubt the leader of the company, Robert Wilson is supposed to have been its chief actor at all events of comic parts, and he was the only one among the five who was also a dramatic author. Under his name, but after his death, Cuthbert Burbage published in 1594 The Prophecy of the Cobbler, and among anonymous plays, the following are ascribed to him, Fair Eve, The Miller's Daughter from Manchester, the Three Ladies of London, etc. Most likely, some of Wilson's plays were acted in the theater. With this exception, the internal history of this playhouse is rather obscure, and very little is known of its repertoire. 
A few titles may be found in contemporary literature, such as The Blacksmith's Daughter, mentioned by the Puritan Gawson in his School of Abuse, as containing the treachery of Turks, the honorable bounty of a noble mind, the shining of virtue in distress. The Conspiracy of Catalina, Caesar and Pompey, and the play about the Fabians. All these must have belonged to the earliest repertoire of the theater, for Gawson's School of Abuse appeared in 1579. It is of more interest that Thomas Lodge mentions the original pre-Shakespearean Hamlet as having been acted in the theater. He speaks of one who looks as pale as the wizard of the ghost which cries so miserably at the theater, like an oyster wife, Hamlet Revenge. The same company, originally Lord Lester's servants, continued to act in the theater till it was pulled down. But the company several times changed its patron and consequently its name. In 1588, Lord Lester died, and after his death, Ferdinando Stanley, Lord Strange, became the patron of the company till 1592. Therefore, the actors were called Lord Strange's men. But in 1592, Lord Strange was created Earl of Derby. Consequently, the troop became for two years the Earl of Derby's men. In 1594, the Earl of Derby died, and Henry Carey, first Lord Hunsdon and Lord Chamberlain, undertook to become patron of the company, which therefore adopted the name of the Lord Chamberlain Servants. The son of Lord Hunsdon, George Carey, second Lord Hunsdon, after his father's death in 1596, also inherited the patronage of the actors, and for almost a year they had to content themselves with being called Lord Hunsdon's men, until Lord Hunsdon became Lord Chamberlain, like his father, and allowed the company to resume the title of the Lord Chamberlain's Servants, 1597. This name the actors retained until the accession of King James in 1603, after which they were promoted to the title of the King's Players. This title put them in the first rank, which indeed they had long held in reality, and which they kept till the suppression of the playhouses in 1642. It is no slight task for one who desires to study theatrical affairs in the time of Shakespeare to make himself acquainted with the varying names of the companies of actors. But without such knowledge, it would be very difficult to pursue the thread of the history even of the leading companies. About the year 1590, our company received an addition in the person of a young man, who was not only a skilled and useful actor, but who also possessed the accomplishment of being able to adapt older plays to the taste of the times, and even proved to have the gift of writing tolerably good plays himself, though older and jealous colleagues might hint at their not being altogether original. This young man, whose capacities became of no slight use to the company and the theater, was named William Shakespeare. At this time, the leading actors of the theater were the great tragedian Richard Burbage, who was then quite a young man, Henry Condell, and John Hemming, who continued to be the mainstays of the company. There was also the clown, Augustine Phillips, an excellent comic actor of the old school. These four became the most intimate friends of Shakespeare, and to Condell and Hemming, Posterity owes a special gratitude, since it was they who, after the death of Shakespeare, undertook the publication of the first printed collection of his plays. It is impossible to decide definitely which of Shakespeare's plays belong to the repertoire of the theater. It is probable that his first plays, Love's Labor Lost, The Comedy of Errors, The Two Gentlemen of Verona, and his first tragedy, Romeo and Juliet, saw the light on this stage between 1589 and 1591. Afterward, between 1594 and 1597, these were possibly increased by A Midsummer Night's Dream, Richard II, King John, The Merchant of Venice, and Henry IV. The repertoire of the theater also included the so-called jigs, merry afterplays, mostly consisting of songs and dances, with frequent allusions to the events of the day, sneering at the Puritans, the magistrates, and other enemies of the playhouses. It has been briefly mentioned above 
that not long after the establishment of the theater, at the latest in the following year, this playhouse gained a companion in the curtain, which thus became the second of its kind in London. The two playhouses were very close to each other, but for this very reason it seems natural to suppose that they were rather meant to support than to rival each other. They were like a kind of double-barreled gun directed against the corporation, and they seem indeed to an equal extent to have roused the anger of the Puritans, for they are generally mentioned together in the Puritan pamphlets directed against playhouses and all other wickedness. However, the history of the curtain is almost unknown to us. While we know a good deal about the outward circumstances of the theater on account of the constant troubles which the Burbage family had to endure from the proprietor of the ground and the municipal authorities, and of the subsequent lawsuit, the reports we find about the curtain are extremely meager. We know neither when nor by whom it was built, nor when it was pulled down. By a mistake which is natural enough, its name has been connected with the front curtain of the stage. We shall see later that no such curtain existed in the time of Shakespeare, and we do not know that the background draperies of that period had the fixed name of curtain. Anyhow, the possibility of this derivation is absolutely excluded by the fact that the spot on which the second London playhouse was built, for some unknown reason, bore the name of Curtain Close. So the playhouse was simply named after the spot on which it was built. As long as the theater stood close beside it, the two companies shared almost the same fate. We have seen that in 1597, an order was issued to pull down both playhouses. This order, however, was never carried out. But after the removal of the theater to Bankside, the curtain seems to have gone its own way. The actors, on the whole, were not afraid of pleading their cause from the stage and of retorting on the attacks of their assailants by lashing them with a whip of caricature, and it seems that those of the curtain had gone a little too far in their Aristophanic parodies of their worthy fellow citizens and chief magistrate. For in May 1601, the justices of the peace for the county of Middlesex received the following admonition from the Privy Council. We do understand that certain players that used to recite their plays at the Curtain and Moorfields do represent upon the stage in their interludes the persons of some gent of good desert and quality that are yet alive under obscure manner, but yet in such sort that all the hearers may take notice both of the matter and the persons that are meant thereby. This being a thing very unfit, offensive, and contrary to such direction as have been heretofore taken, that no plays should be openly showed but such as were first perused and allowed, and that minister no occasion of offense or scandal, we do hereby require you that you do forthwith forbid those players to whomsoever they appertain that do play at the curtain in Moorfields to represent any such play, and that you will examine them who made that play, and to show the same unto you, and as you in your discretions shall think the same unfit to be publicly showed, to forbid them from henceforth to play the same, either privately or publicly. And if upon view of the said play you shall find the subject so odious and inconvenient as is informed, we require you to take bond of the chiefest of them to answer their rash and indiscreet dealing before us. We know nothing of the result of this prosecution, but we may be allowed to assume that it did not result in very severe measures. We seem to read a certain concealed sympathy in the writ of the great lords, and we cannot help suspecting that it was the Puritan citizens who felt themselves hit and who brought the complaint. If the lords had been the butt of the mockery, no doubt the proceeding of the players would have appeared to them much worse than rash and indiscreet. Until the Globe Theatre was built, the Burbages most likely possessed a share in the curtain. At any rate, their company used that building alternately with their own, no doubt, for instance, during the period between the pulling down of the theater and the building of the globe. During this period, they played, as the Lord Chamberlain's men, among other things, no less famous a piece than Ben Jonson's Every Man in His Humor, 
which according to old tradition was accepted on the recommendation of Shakespeare after having been put aside contemptuously by the other leading actors. This splendid play had an enormous success. Of Shakespeare's plays, Much Ado About Nothing and the second part of King Henry IV were acted. There is scarcely any reason for assuming, with Hallowell Phillips and Ordish, that the first performance of Henry V took place at the Curtain. At the appearance of this play in 1599, the Globe Theater was built, and we cannot doubt that it was here that this popular play saw the light. So the frequently mentioned wooden O in the prologue does not allude to the Curtain, but to the Globe. The outward shape of the Curtain we must imagine to have been like that of the theater, circular and unroofed in the center. It is generally supposed to have been somewhat smaller than Burbage's first theater. The last period of the existence of the curtain is enveloped in obscurity, but there is no reason to suppose that it did not continue to exist till all playhouses were put down during the Civil War, 1642 to 1647. If the curtain was preserved as long as that, its life was longer than that of any other playhouse of the Shakespearean period. End of section 19. Section 20 of The Great Events by Famous Historians, Volume 10. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Great Events by Famous Historians, Volume 10, by Charles F. Horn, Rossiter Johnson, and John Rudd. Cossack Conquest of Siberia, A.D. 1581, by Nikolai M. Karamzin. Siberia, the northern home of the Tartars, was little known even to the Russians until the latter part of the 16th century. The Cossack conquest of the western portion of the region, now called Siberia, opened that vast territory to Muscovite occupation, and gradually it has become known to the world as part of the Russian Empire. Nothing certain is known of the origin of the Cossack tribes, and no final agreement has been reached as to the derivation of their name. According to later supposition, their nucleus was a body of refugees from the ancient Russian lands invaded by the Tartars in the 13th century. Some of those refugees settled between the embouchures of the Ural River, others near the mouth of the Don. Driven by invasion to form themselves into a military organization, the Cossacks of the Don became a formidable confederacy. Since 1549, they have been under the protection of Russia, and have rendered great service to the empire. Although they have always, since the time of Ivan IV, called the Terrible, furnished valorous soldiers to Russia, the Cossacks of the Don have often rebelled and disowned her authority. Russian troops have frequently been ordered to exterminate them. During the last years of Ivan IV, these Cossacks entered upon that eastern conquest which led to Russian expansion into Asia. Karamzin, the Russian historian, is the most eminent authority on this subject. Among the enterprising leaders of the Cossacks at this time were Yermak Timofeev, John Koltso, condemned to death by the Tsar, James Mikhailov, Nasitas Pan, and Matthew Meshertiak, all noted for their rare intrepidity. The Stroganovs, having heard of the terror inspired by their audacity among peaceful travelers, as well as amid the nomad tribes of the neighborhood, proposed an honorable service to these five brave men. On April 6, 1579, they sent them presents, accompanied by a letter in which they urged them to quit an occupation unworthy of Christian soldiers, to leave the class of brigands, and to become warriors of the White Tsar, the monarch of Muscovy, to seek, in fine, dangers exempt from dishonor, by making peace with God and Russia. We have, they added, lands and fortresses, but few soldiers. Come, and defend great perm and the Christian countries of the north. At these propositions, Yermak and his companions shed tears of emotion. The hope of effacing their disgrace by glorious deeds, by services rendered to the state, 
the idea of exchanging the title of audacious brigands for that of brave defenders of their country caused a keen sensibility in these men uncouth if you will but with hearts still susceptible of remorse unfurling their standard on the bank of the volga they made an appeal to their comrades and assembled five hundred fifty bold partisans at the head of whom they arrived burning with zeal in the presence of the stroganoffs who received them with joy as the analyst relates the desires of the former the promises of the latter were realized the cossack leaders became the bucklers of the christian country the infidels trembled at the aspect of death which met them wherever they dared to show themselves indeed on july twenty second fifteen eighty one the cossacks completely overthrew the mirza bigoli who at the head of seven hundred volgoliches and ostiaks had ravaged the colonies founded upon the silva and the chusovaya this success was the forerunner of more considerable advantages the stroganoffs had in view not merely the defence of their cities in calling the cossacks to their service when they had sufficiently tested the courage and fidelity of these warriors and had learned the talent and boldness of yermak timofiev their principal leader of obscure origin the annals say but illustrious by his greatness of soul they formed a troop especially composed of tartars subject to russia of lithuanians and of germans ransomed from captivity among the nogayas for the latter brought as a matter of custom in their encampments the prisoners whom they made in war as mercenaries of the czar in fine after having made provisions of arms and of food the stroganoffs openly announced an expedition which under the orders of yermak should have siberia for its objective point the number of fighting men amounted to eight hundred forty all animated with zeal and transported with joy some dreamed of honor others thought of the spoils the hope of meriting their pardon by the czar inflamed the cossacks and the german or polish captives who sighed for liberty considering siberia the road to their fatherland yermak began by organizing his little army he named the hetmans subaltern officers and appointed the brave john colzo as second in command longboats were laden with munitions of war and food light artillery and long arquebuses he procured guides interpreters priests had prayers said and received the final instructions of the stroganoffs the latter were conceived in the following terms quote, go in peace to scour the country of siberia and put to flight the impious kuchum after having taken the oath of valor and chastity yermak set out on september first fifteen eighty one at the sound of warlike trumpets on the chusavaya and directed his march toward the ural mountains preparing himself for great activity without counting upon any assistance this expedition was even made without the knowledge of the czar for the stroganoffs who had obtained the grant of the countries situated on the other side of the chain of rocky mountains thought themselves able to dispense with soliciting of the czar a new sanction for their important enterprise we shall see that ivan did not share this opinion at the moment when the states of kuchum were to become the conquest of the russian pizarro as redoubtable for the savages as he of spain but less terrible for humanity the prince of pelham with the vogeliches the ostiaks the siberian tartars and the bashkirs made a sudden eruption upon the borders of the kama he destroyed the russian colonies near churdin usoli as well as many other new fortresses of the stroganoffs and put to death or dragged into captivity a great number of christians who were deprived of defenders but at the news of the march of the cossacks against siberia he left our frontiers to fly to the defence of his own states the crime of these depredations was laid to the stroganoffs upon a report of basile pelipitsin governor of Cherton, ivan wrote him that he was either unable or unwilling to look after the frontiers 
"'You have taken it upon yourself,' he added, "'to recall proscribed Cossacks, true bandits, "'whom you have sent to make war upon Siberia. "'This enterprise, suited to irritate the Prince of Pelham "'and the Sultan of Kuchum, "'is a treason worthy of the last punishment. "'I command you to cause Yermak and his companions "'to start without delay for Perm and Usoli on the Kama, "'where they may be able to efface their faults.' by forcing the Ostiaks and the Vogeliches into submission. You may retain, at the most, one hundred Cossacks for the security of your little towns. In case you shall not execute my commands to the letter, if in the future Perm has still to suffer the attacks of the Prince of Pelham or the Sultan of Siberia, I shall overwhelm you with the weight of my disgrace, and I shall have all those traitors of Cossacks hanged this menacing dispatch made the stroganoffs tremble nevertheless a brilliant unexpected success justified their enterprise and changed into favor the wrath of their sovereign in the beginning of the story of the exploits of yermak we shall at first say that like everything that is extraordinary they have made a strong impression upon the imagination of the vulgar and have given birth to many fables which are confused in the tradition with the real facts under the title of annals they have led the historians themselves into error it is thus for instance that some hundreds of warriors led by yermak have been metamorphosed into an army and like the soldiers of cortez or pizarro have been counted as thousands the months became years a somewhat difficult navigation, appeared marvellous. Leaving at one side the fabulous assertions, we shall, for the principal facts, base our statements upon official documents and on the most truthful contemporaneous account of a conquest which was, indeed, of a most surprising character. In the first place, the Cossacks ascended, for four days, the course of the Chusovaya, rapid and sown with rocks, as far as the chain of the Ural Mountains. The two following days, in the shadow of the masses of stone with which the interior of these mountains is covered, they reached, by means of the river Serebrenia, the passage called the Route of Siberia. There they stopped, and, ignorant of what might next happen to them, they constructed, for their safety, a kind of redoubt to which they gave the name of Kokyu. They had so far found only deserts and a small number of inhabitants. Then they moved, towing their small crafts, as far as the river of Uralva. These places are, even to this day, marked by the monuments of Yermak. Rocks, caverns, remains of fortifications bear his name. It is asserted that the big boats abandoned by him between the Cerebrenia and the Barachka, are not, in our time, entirely decayed, and that lofty trees shade their ruins, half reduced to dust. By the Uralva and the Tagil, the Cossacks, reaching the Tura, which waters one of the provinces of the Empire of Siberia, for the first time drew the sword of conquerors. At the place where the city of Torinsk now stands, there then existed a little town, the domain of the prince Yapanchka. He commanded a large number of Tartars and Vogeliches, and received these audacious strangers with a hail of arrows shot from the banks of the river at the place where is seen the present village of Eusenia Novo. But, frightened by a discharge of artillery, he forthwith took flight. Yermak caused the town to be destroyed, of which the name alone remains for the residents still give to Turinsk the name Town of Yapanchka. The camps and villages situated along the Tura were devastated. The Cossack leaders have been taken, at the mouth of the Tavda, an officer of Kuchim's named Tausak. He, desirous of saving his life, communicated to them important information regarding the country. At the price of his frankness, his liberty was given him, and he hastened to announce to his master that the predictions of the soothsayers of Siberia 
were being realized, for, according to some accounts, these pretended sorcerers had for a long time proclaimed the near and inevitable downfall of this state by an invasion of Christians. Tausuk spoke of the Cossacks as wonderful men and invincible heroes, lancing fire and thunder which penetrate through the cuirasses. Nevertheless, Kuchum, though deprived of sight, had a strong soul. He made ready to defend his country and his faith with courage. He at once gathered all his subjects, made his nephew, Mametkul, enter the campaign at the head of a large force of cavalry, and he himself threw up fortifications on the bank of the Urtish, at the foot of the Tuvache mountain, thus closing to the Cossacks the road to Isker. The conquest of Siberia resembles, in more than one regard, that of Mexico and Peru. Here also it was a handful of men who, by means of firearms, put to flight thousands of soldiers armed with arrows or javelins. For the Mongols, like the Tartars of the north, were ignorant of the use of gunpowder, and, toward the end of the sixteenth century, they still used the arms employed at the time of Genghis. Each one of Yermak's warriors faced a crowd of the enemy. If his bullet only killed one of them, the frightful detonation of his gun put to flight twenty or thirty. In the first combat, held on the banks of the Tobol, at a place called Babasin, Yermak, under shelter of entrenchments, checked by some discharges of musketry, the impetuosity of ten thousand men of Mametkul's cavalry, who rushed forward to crush him. He at once attacks them himself, carries off a complete victory, and opened, as far as the mouth of the Tobol, a route whose perils were not yet all dissipated. Indeed, from the height of the steep banks of the river, called Dolajoyar, the natives poured a shower of arrows on the boats of the Cossacks. Another, less important affair took place sixteen versts from Urtish, in a country governed by a tribal chief named Karacha, situated on the shore of a lake which up to today bears the name of this intimate counsellor of the sovereign of Siberia. Yermak, having made himself master of the enemy's camp, found rich booty there, consisting of provisions of all kinds, as well as a large number of tons of honey intended for the consumption of the sovereign. The third combat, on the Urtish, was bloody and stubbornly fought. It cost some companions of Yermak their lives, and served to prove how dear, even to barbarians, is the independence of their fatherland. For the defenders of Siberia displayed resolution and intrepidity. Nevertheless, they yielded the victory to the Russians toward the end of the day, awaiting a new battle, and without losing either courage or hope. The blind Kuchum left the fortifications in order to camp upon the Chuvacha mountain. Mametkul was entrusted with the guard of entrenchments, and the Cossacks, who the same evening captured the little town of Atek Murza, dared not take repose for fear of an attack. Already the troops of Yermak were visibly diminished. Some Cossacks had been killed and many wounded, and amid the constant fatigues, a great number of them had no strength nor valor left. The leaders profited by this night of unrest to hold a council on the course to take, and in this consultation the voice of the weaklings was heard. We have satiated our vengeance, they said. It is time to turn back. New combats will be dangerous for us, since very soon we shall be unable to conquer any more for lack of fighters. Brothers, answered the leaders, there is left only one road for us, and that is the one in front of us. The rivers are already covered with ice. In turning our backs, we shall perish amid the snows and if we were fortunate enough to get home to Russia, we should arrive there with the tarnish of perjury, for we have pledged ourselves to conquer Kuchum, or to blot out our faults by a generous death. We have lived long with a dishonored reputation. Let us know how to die after having acquired a glorious one. It is God who awards the victory, and often to the weaker. Blessed be his name. Amen, responded the troop. 
At the first rays of the sun, the Cossacks hurled themselves on the entrenchments through a cloud of arrows, crying, God is for us. The enemy themselves threw down their palisades at three different points. The Siberians rushed out, saber or lance in hand, and engaged in a hand-to-hand -hand combat, which was disadvantageous for the warriors of Yermak, who were too inferior in numbers. Men fell on all sides, but the Cossacks, Germans and Poles, formed an unshakable wall, loaded their guns in good order, and, by a sustained attack, thinned the ranks of the enemy, whom they drove toward their entrenchments. Yermak and Kolzo, at the first line, accomplished prodigies of valor, repeating in a loud voice, God is for us, while the blind Kuchum, placed upon the mountain, in the midst of his imams and mullahs, invoked Mohammed for the salvation of his true believers. Happily for the Russians, Mamet Kul, being wounded, was obliged to quit the fight, and the Mirzas carried him in a skiff to the other bank of the Urtish. At this news, consternation spread throughout the hostile army. Deprived of its leader, it despaired of victory. The Ostiak princes take flight. They are followed by the Tartars. And Kuchum, learning that the Christian banners are already floating over the entrenchments, seeks his safety in the deserts of Isham, having hardly had time to remove a part of his treasure from his capital city. This general and bloody battle decided the domination of the Russians from the chain of the Ural Mountains to the shores of the Obi and the Tobol. It cost the Cossacks 107 of their bravest warriors, and up to the present day, prayers for the repose of their souls are offered in the Cathedral of Tobolsk. On October 27th, Yermak, already illustrious for history, after returning thanks to heaven, made his triumphant entry into the town of Isker, or Sibir, situated on an elevation on the bank of the Urtish. It was defended on one side by entrenchments and a deep moat, on the other by a triple rampart. According to the analyst, the conquerors found immense riches in gold, silver, Asiatic cloth of gold, precious stones, furs, and so forth, which they shared among themselves like brothers. The town was entirely deserted. These warriors, who had just conquered a kingdom, did not see a single inhabitant here. They glutted themselves with gold and sables, and lacked for food. Nevertheless, three days later, they saw the Ostiaks arrive, led by their prince, Bobar, who came to bring them presents and provisions, to take the oath of fidelity, and to ask for mercy and protection. Soon there also appeared a great number of Tartars, with their women and children. They were accorded a gracious reception by Yermak. He quieted them, and let them return to their camps, after demanding from them a small tribute. This man, recently the leader of a band of brigands, who had just showed himself to be an intrepid hero and a skillful captain, likewise employed his extraordinary genius in matters relating to administration and to military discipline. He inspired rude and savage peoples with an extreme confidence in a new power. He succeeded by a just severity in curbing his turbulent companions in arms, so that they dared not practice any vexations in a country conquered by their boldness, and through a thousand dangers, at the extremity of the world. It is related that the inflexible Yermak, managing the Christian warriors in the combats, treated them with rigor for the least fault, and that he punished disobedience and fornication equally with death. He not only extracted complete submission from his whole troop, but also purity of soul, in order to render himself agreeable to the master of the earth and to the master of heaven, persuaded that God would accord him the victory with a small number of virtuous warriors, rather than with a large number of hardened sinners. His Cossacks, says the analyst of Tobolsk, led a chaste life on the march as well as during their stay in the capital of Siberia. Their battles were followed by prayer. But they were not yet at the end of their dangers. Some time passed without news of Kuchum, and the Cossack leaders, with no inquietude, 
gave themselves up to the pleasures of the chase in the neighborhood of the town. But Kutchum had drawn near, in spite of his wound. Mametkul had already remounted his horse, and on December 5th he unexpectedly fell on twenty Russians fishing in the lake of Abalak, and massacred them all. As soon as Yermak heard of this surprise, he rushed in pursuit of the enemy, overtook them near Abalak, at the place where the borough town of Chamakan now stands, attacked and dispersed them. Then, having removed the bodies of his companions in arms, he buried them, with military honors, on the Cope of Sauskin, near Isker, in the old cemetery of the Khans. The intensity of the cold, the dangerous snowstorms, the short winter days of these northern countries, did not permit him to think of new enterprises of any importance before the return of spring. While waiting, the peaceful submission of two princes of the Vogeliches, Ikberdi and Suklum, served soon to expand the possessions of the Cossacks. The first had his domains beyond the marsh of Eskalbin, on the banks of the Kuda or the Tavda. The second lived in the vicinity of Tobolsk. Both voluntarily offered to pay the Yasak, or tribute in sable skins, and took the oath of allegiance to Russia. Ikberdi was able to secure the special friendship of the Cossacks, to whom he gave his services as counselor and guide in the unknown places. So the affairs of internal administration, the collecting of tribute, hunting and fishing, the returns from which were indispensable in a country without architecture, occupied Yermak until the month of April. Then Amurza informed him that the bold Mehmetkul had again approached the Urtish and encamped near Vagai with a small band. The occasion was favorable, but in order to exterminate this indefatigable enemy, secrecy and celerity were more necessary than force. Consequently, the Cossack leaders, having chosen sixty of their braves, furtively approached the camp of the Tartars, cut the throats of many in their sleep, took Mametkul prisoner, and led him in triumph to Isker. This capture caused Yermak great joy, for he was rid of an enemy full of audacity and courage, whom he might consider as an important hostage in his relations with the fugitive Kuchum. Although Mametkul was covered with the blood of Yermak's brothers-in-arms, the latter, abjuring all idea of personal vengeance, treated him with flattering consideration, while yet holding him under close watch. As Yermak already had his spies in the distant sections of Isker, he learned that Kuchum, struck with the reverses of Mametkul, was wandering in the deserts beyond Isham. The usurper was about to be attacked by Sidek, son of Bekpulat, prince of Siberia, one of his victims, who was marching against him with numerous bands of Uzbeks. Upon another side, he found himself weakened by the defection of the Mirza, Karachka, who, abandoning him in his misfortune, had drawn away a great part of his troops and was getting ready to encamp in the country of Lim, near a large lake above the junction of the Tara with the Irtish. The news was of the nature to cause a lively satisfaction to the leader of the Cossacks, whose new enterprises were to be favored by the weakness of the principal enemy of Russia, as well as by the approach of spring. Yermak, leaving a part of his troop at Isker, embarked with the other part on the Irtish, which he descended, navigating toward the north. The tribes of the neighborhood already recognized his power, so that he advanced without obstacles as far as the mouth of the Armid Zianka, where he was stopped by Tartars who were still independent, and who, ensconced in a fortress, refused to surrender. The fortress was taken by assault, and the Cossack leaders shot or hanged the principal authors of an obstinacy dangerous for the Russians. Terrified, the rest of the inhabitants swore submission and fidelity to Russia, kissing a saber dipped in blood. The present cantons of Ratzin, Karbin, and Trutas dared oppose no resistance. Farther on began the encampments of the Ostiaks and the Voguls of the Kuda. There, on the steep bank of the Irtish, their prince, Damien, who had taken refuge 
in a fort with two thousand warriors ready to fight rejected all yermak's propositions according to the report of the analyst quote, this little town possessed within its walls a golden idol which was supposed to have been brought from ancient russia at the epoch when she embraced christianity the ostiaks kept it in a vase filled with water which they drank to revive their courage the cossack leaders having driven away the besieged forces with their artillery entered the town but they could not discover this precious idol the conquerors now continued their navigation they perceived a crowd of soothsayers who were offering a sacrifice to their famous idol of rachka conjuring it to save them from these terrible strangers the idol remained mute the russians advanced with their thunder and the frightened soothsayers ran to hide themselves in the thickness of the forests it is there that the colony of racha is found to-day above the demyansk farther on in the canton of chagall at the place where the urtish contracted by the mountains precipitates its rapid course a multitude of armed men awaited the cossacks but a discharge of musketry put them to flight and the Cossacks took the little town of Nazim, where they found only women and children, stricken with terror and awaiting death. Yermak treated them with so much kindness that their fathers and husbands did not delay in coming to find him with a tribute. After reducing the cantons of Tarkum to submission, the Cossacks entered the country of the most considerable of the Ostiak princes, named Samar allied with eight hundred other little princes he was waiting for the russians with firmness in order to decide by a battle the lot of all the ancient country of yugori samar boasted of his courage and of his strength but he forgot prudence for he his army and his guards when at the hour of dawn the cossacks attacked his camp awakened by the tumult he rose seized his arms and fell shot to death at the first volley in an instant his troops dispersed and the inhabitants agreed to pay tribute to russia already yermak had reached the shore of the obi an important river concerning the course of which the ancient novgorodians had some notions but whose source and mouth according to the muscovite travellers of fifteen sixty seven were hidden in unknown regions master of nazim principal town of the ostiaks and of many other fortresses having in his power the prince of siberia yermak had to deplore the loss of one of his brave companions in arms the hetman nasitas pan killed in an assault with some of the most intrepid cossacks he did not desire to penetrate farther into a country which only presented frozen deserts to him places of desolation where during the summer the burning rays of the sun hardly warmed the surface of immense marshes covered with moss and where bogs hardened by the frost and strewed with the bones of mammoths presented the aspect of a vast cemetery yermak appointed alachka an ostiak prince as chief of the tribes of the obi then he again took the road of the capital of siberia treated as a conqueror and a sovereign by his tributaries he was received everywhere with demonstrations of absolute submission as a redoubtable warrior endowed with a supernatural strength of soul to the sound of warlike music the cossacks ascended the rivers they disembarked clad in their finest raiment in order to astonish the inhabitants by their riches having thus assured the domination of russia from Beretskov to tobol Yermak, satisfied and tranquil, arrived safely at Isker. Then, only, he announced to the Stroganovs that, with the aid of God, he had been able to conquer the Sultan, had taken his capital, his states, his nephew, and had made his people take the oath of allegiance to Russia. At the same time, he wrote to the Tsar that his poor Cossacks, proscribed, troubled in conscience, and given up to repentance had braved death to reunite a vast state to russia in the name of christ and of their great monarch 
for ages upon ages, and for as long a time as it might please God to prolong the existence of the universe. They awaited, he added, the orders of the Russian Waywoods, to whom they were ready to deliver over the kingdom of Siberia, without any sort of condition, disposed to die for glory, or upon a scaffold, according as it should please God and their master. Charged with this missive, the second of the leaders, John Colzo, first companion of Yermak in the combats and in the councils, departed for Moscow, where he had been condemned to severe punishment as a state criminal, without fearing the solemn decree which threatened his life. Here we anticipate a question which seems natural enough. In announcing so late his successes to the Stroganovs, did not Yermak, influenced by the easy conquest of Siberia, think, as some historians suppose, of reigning independently over that country? Although conqueror, his forces were diminishing every day, and was not the need of aid the only and true motive for his bearing towards Ivan? But how can it be imagined that this prudent leader should not have foreseen, at the beginning of his expedition, that a handful of rash men, abandoned by Russia, would in three or four years have been annihilated by battles or diseases, that in a rigorous climate they would succumb amid deserts and thick forests, impenetrable refuges of a savage and fierce population, who firearms only could force to pay tribute to strangers. It is more probable that, not having been an eye-witness of the facts, the analyst established upon hypothesis the order in which they succeeded each other. Perhaps Yermak feared to boast too soon of his success, desiring, above all, to achieve the conquest of Siberia, which he thought he had done, in driving Kuchum into the deserts, and in establishing the limits of the Muscovite Empire on the banks of the Obi. Transported with joy at the news they had just received from the Hetmans, the Stroganovs set out at once for Moscow, eager to communicate to the Tsar all the details of this glorious enterprise. They urged him to finish the reduction of Siberia. Simple private citizens like themselves, not possessing the means to preserve so vast a conquest. The envoys of Yermak, John Colzo, and his companions also appeared before the prince to offer him the realm of Siberia, as well as the precious furs of sables, black foxes, and castors. These were, since a long time, the first transports of joy in gloomy Moscow. The Tsar and the nation seemed to wake up. At court, on the great square, was repeated with intoxication. God has sent a new empire to Russia. Bells were rung. Solemn thanks were returned to heaven. As at the epoch of Kazan and Astrakhan, the happy time of the Tsar's youth. Rumor exaggerated the glory of this conquest. There was no talk but of huge armies destroyed by the Cossacks, of a great number of peoples subjected by their valor, of the immense riches which they had found. In a word, Siberia seemed to have fallen from the sky for the Russians, and, to set off still further Yermak's success, it was forgotten that from time immemorial this country had been known to the Russians. The disgrace of the Cossacks gave place to honors. John Colzo, bowing his head in humility before the Tsar and the boyars, heard nothing but expressions of goodwill and of praise for his conduct and the name of valiant warrior. Greatly moved, he kissed the hand of the Tsar, who caused to be given to him as well as to the other envoys of Siberia, silver, cloth, and stuffs of value. Ivan immediately sent to Yermak Prince Simeon Bolkovsky and the officer John Glukov with five hundred strelitz infantry. He authorized John Colzo to raise volunteers to go and establish himself in the new countries of Tobol and ordered the bishop of Vologda to send ten priests thither for the purpose of celebrating divine service. Prince Bolkovsky was ordered to take, in the spring, the boats of the Stroganovs, and embark on the Chutsovaya River 
to follow the traces of the hero of Siberia. These illustrious citizens, the real authors of this important acquisition to Russia, yielded it to the state. But in recompense, and as a reward for their services and their zeal, Ivan made to Simeon Bolkovsky a concession of two borough towns, the great and little Seoul, on the Volga. Maxim and Esitas obtained the privilege of carrying on commerce in all their cities without paying any tax or duty. While awaiting good news from Russia, the conquerors of Siberia did not give themselves up to sterile repose. They advanced by the Tavda, as far as the country of the Vogeliches, and near the mouth of that river where the Tartar princes, Labutan and Pechenieg, held sway. In a bloody engagement, Yermak put them to flight on the shores of a lake, and the analyst reports that at his time many human bones were still to be seen there. But the timid inhabitants of the cantons of Koshuts and of Tabarin paid the tribute demanded by the Cossack leader without a murmur. These peaceful savages lived in an absolute independence, having neither princes nor chiefs. They only gave their respect to certain rich men, whose wisdom was generally recognized, and took them as judges in their quarrels. They yielded an equal esteem to some pretended soothsayers. One of these, gazing upon Yermak with a holy terror, predicted long glory for him, but kept silence about his approaching death. Here fable creates new giants among the dwarfs of Oguli, who are scarcely two Arshins in height. According to one of these stories, the Russians saw with surprise, near the town of Tabarin, a giant two fathoms tall, who seized a dozen men at a time and smothered them in his arms. Not being able to take him alive, they killed him with gunshots. On the whole, the relation of this latter expedition is not very authentic, and is only found in a supplement to the Chronicles of Siberia. One may also read there that, after having reached the marshes and forests of Pelham, dispersed the Vogeliches, and made numerous prisoners, Yermak sought to gather from the latter certain information regarding the roads which lead from the banks of the upper Tavda to Perm across a chain of rocky mountains, in order to discover a less dangerous and less difficult communication with Russia, but that it was impossible to open a road in deserts swampy in the summer and buried under deep snows in the winter. Yermak succeeded in increasing the number of his tributaries and in extending his domains as far as the shore of Sosva in the ancient country of Yugori. He had enclosed in their limits the country of Kondini, little known up to that time, although long placed among the titles of the Muscovite sovereigns. He then returned to the capital of Siberia, where he awaited the recompense of his glorious works. John Colso had arrived at Isker, charged with the bounties of the Tsar, followed by Prince Bolkovsky with his warriors. The former gave rich presents to the leaders as well as to the soldiers. He was the bearer, for Yermak, of two cuirasses, a cup of silver, and a cloak which the Tsar had worn himself. In a letter full of goodness, Ivan announced to the Cossacks his entire forgetfulness of their faults and the eternal recognition of Russia for their important services. He affirmed that he appointed Yermak Prince of Siberia, commanding him to administer and govern that country, as he had already done up to that time, to establish order there, and, in fine, to consolidate there the supreme power of the Tsar. On their side, the Cossacks rendered honors to the waywoods of Ivan, as well as to all the strelits. They made them presents of sables, and treated them with all the luxury which their position permitted, preparing together for new enterprises. However, this happiness of Yermak and his companions was not of long duration. We touch upon the beginning of their reverses. In the first place, a fearful scurvy showed itself among the troops, a disease common to those who arrive in cold and damp climates in savage 
and almost uninhabited countries. The Strelitz were attacked first. Soon it was communicated to the Cossacks, many of whom lost their strength and their life. Next, winter brought a great dearth of food. The excessive cold, tempests, snowstorms, hindered the hunting and fishing, as well as the arrival of grain from the neighboring encampments, some inhabitants of which occupied themselves with a poorly productive agriculture. Famine began to be felt. Disease made progress, and continually took off many victims, among whom was Prince Bolkovsky. They gave him an honorable funeral at Isker. The general weakness seized the heart of Yermak also. He feared not death, long accustomed to brave it, but he was afflicted with the idea of losing his conquest, of betraying the hopes of the Tsar and of Russia. Happily, this calamity ceased with spring. The atmospheric heat helped the cure of the diseases, and convoys of provisions restored plenty among the Russians. Then Yermak made Prince Mametkul start for Moscow, announcing to the Tsar that, while all was going on well in Siberia, yet he asked immediately for more considerable aids than the first, in order to preserve his conquests and to be able to make new ones. Mametkul, faithful observer of the law of Mohammed, served afterward in the Russian armies. Yermak resolved to intimidate his enemies and to guarantee his safety for the future. To this effect, although he had but a feeble troop left, he undertook to pursue Karachka, ascending the Urtish, in order to extend the possessions of Russia toward the east. He overthrew Prince Bakhetcha and captured his city, of which the ruins may still be seen on the shores of a sinuous lake near the mouth of the Vogai. He made himself master of all the country which stretches as far as the Isham, terrifying by his vengeance those who dared resist him, and sparing those who lay down their arms. In the country of Sargeti there lived an illustrious old man, a former Tartar chief, a hereditary judge of all the tribes since the first Khan of Siberia. He made the act of submission, as well as Prince Itichai, who governed the city of Tehend. The latter, bearing tribute to Yermak, presented his young daughter, betrothed to the son of Kuchum. But the hetman, a rigid observer of the laws of chastity, sent the young girl home. Near the mouth of the Isham, a bloody quarrel arose between the soldiers of Yermak and the wild inhabitants of that wretched country, in which five brave Cossacks lost their lives. Their memory is still celebrated in the melancholy songs of Siberia. The little town of Tchatkan also fell into the power of the Russians. Their chief did not judge it advisable to attack a more important place, founded by Kuchum, on the banks of the lake Asaklu. He penetrated as far as the shore of Chiska, where the deserts begin, imposed tributes on this new conquest, and returned to take to Isker the spoils which were to be his last trophies. End of section 20「Section 21 of the Great Events by Famous Historians」Volume 10 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Great Events by Famous Historians Volume 10 By Charles F. Horn Rossiter Johnson, and John Rudd. First Colony of England Beyond Seas A.D. 1583 by Moses Harvey In the Elizabethan era, when maritime discovery was being actively pursued by England's adventurous spirits, Sir Humphrey Gilbert, half-brother of Sir Walter Raleigh, the founder of Virginia, 
took possession of Newfoundland with feudal ceremony in the name of the Virgin Queen. Sir Humphrey's expedition was barren of results in the way of colonization and even in the way of discovery on the island, while it proved fatal to its leader and those who sailed with him on the squirrel, for on the return voyage to England the vessel foundered at sea, and the only companionship, the Golden Hind, reached the port of Falmouth, Devon. But the formal occupation of Newfoundland at that early period makes it the most ancient colony of the British crown. English settlement beginning shortly after Sir Humphrey Gilbert's visit, though interrupted between the years 1692 and 1713 by French attempts at conquest. Up to this time, no attempt had been made to colonize Newfoundland or any of the neighboring lands. The hardy fishermen of various nationalities, among whom Englishmen were now much more numerous than formerly, were in the habit of frequenting the shores of the island during the summer and using the harbors and coves for the cure of their fish, returning home with the products of their toil on the approach of winter. Eighty-six years had passed away since Cabot's discovery and we now arrive at the year 1583, a memorable date in the history of Newfoundland. On August 5th of that year, there were lying in the harbor of St. John's 36 vessels belonging to various nations, Portuguese, Spanish, French, and English, all employed in fishing. In addition to these, there were four English warships which had arrived the day before. They were the Delight, the Golden Hind, the Swallow, and the Squirrel. Early on this morning, boats were lowered from the English ships, and the commanders and officers went on shore. Soon a goodly company had assembled on the beach, then lined by a few rough wooden huts and flakes or stages for drying cod. The rude inmates of these huts gathered round the company that landed from the English ships, and the captains and officers of the other vessels were there by special summons. A very curious and motley group was that which then stood on the beach of St. John's Harbor, swarthy bronzed sailors and fishermen of spain portugal and france in the costumes of the sixteenth century soon a circle formed round one commanding figure a man of noble presence wearing the richly slashed and laced doublet velvet cloak trunk hose and gay hat and feather which constituted the dress of gentlemen in the days of Queen Elizabeth. This was none other than Sir Humphrey Gilbert, one of the gallant knights of Devonshire. He unrolled a parchment scroll and proceeded to read the royal patent authorizing him to take possession of Newfoundland on behalf of his royal mistress and exercise jurisdiction over it and all other possessions of the crown in the same quarter. Twig and sod were presented to him in feudal fashion, and in the name of Queen Elizabeth he solemnly annexed the island to the British Empire. The banner of England was then twisted on a flagstaff. The royal arms, cut in lead, were affixed to a wooden pillar near the water's edge and the ceremony was complete. The grant gave Sir Humphrey Gilbert jurisdiction for two hundred leagues in every direction, so that the limits included Nova Scotia, New Brunswick, part of Labrador, as well as the islands of Newfoundland, Cape Britain, and Prince Edward Island, a right royal principality. 
This Sir Humphrey Gilbert, the first settler in Newfoundland, who, with some 250 followers from Devonshire, had arrived with a view of making the western wilderness a home for Englishmen, was a son of Sir Otho Gilbert of Compton Castle, Torbay. His mother was a champernoun of purest Norman descent and could probably boast of having in her veins the blood of Courtenays, emperors of Byzant. Sir Otho had three sons by this lady, John, Humphrey, and Adrian, who all proved to be men of superior abilities. They were all three knighted by Elizabeth, a distinction which, coming from the hands of the great queen, marked its recipient as a gentleman and a brave warrior. Sir Otho died, and his widow married Walter Raleigh, a gentleman of ancient blood, but impoverished, and at the time living at Hayes, Devon. To her second husband, the fair Champernoun bore a son, whose fame was destined to be worldwide, and who, in a period more prolific of great men and great events than any before or since, played a gallant part, and was also knighted as Sir Walter Raleigh by Queen Bess. Thus Sir Humphrey Gilbert and Sir Walter Raleigh were half-brothers, each being trained in the simple and manly yet high-bred ways of English gentlemen. When Humphrey Gilbert grew up, he embraced the profession of arms, and won high distinction in continental and Irish wars. At length, in his mature manhood, he and his distinguished half-brother, Raleigh, performed the design of first colonizing Newfoundland, and then the neighboring islands and continent. Hence we find him on August 5, 1583, standing on the beach in the harbor of St. John's. Sir Walter Raleigh had embarked on the same expedition, but a contagious disease broke out on board his ship, which compelled his return. The enterprise of Sir Humphrey Gilbert was worthy of a heroic and patriotic nobleman. It was, nevertheless, doomed to end in disaster and death. In prosecuting further explorations, one of Sir Humphrey's vessels was wrecked and the whole crew perished. The little fleet had struggled with contrary winds for many days. Eventually, the delight, the largest vessel, drifted into the breakers on a lee shore and struck upon a rock. She went rapidly to pieces. Seventeen of the crew got into the longboat, and after seven days, fifteen of them reached port. But the captain, Morris Brown, refused to leave the ship. Mounting upon the highest deck, says the ancient chronicler, he attained imminent death so inevitable. The other vessels stood out to sea and saved themselves. As winter was approaching and provisions getting low, Sir Humphrey deemed it wise to steer for England. He had planted his flag on board the squirrel, a little cockle shell of ten tons, and though earnestly entreated to go on board the larger vessel, the Golden Hind, he refused to abandon his brave comrades. A great storm overtook them near the Azores. The Golden Hind kept as near the squirrel as possible, and when, in the midst of the tempest, the crew saw the gallant knight sitting calmly on deck with a book before him, they heard him cry to his companions, Cheer up, lads! We are as near heaven at sea as on land. When the curtain of night shrouded the little bark, she and her gallant crew disappeared beneath the dark billows of the Atlantic. 
Thus perished Sir Humphrey Gilbert, scholar, soldier, colonizer, philosopher, one of the noblest of those brave hearts that sought to extend the dominion of England in the New World. To Newfoundland this sad loss was irreparable. Had Sir Humphrey lived to reach home, no doubt he and Sir Walter Raleigh would have renewed their efforts at colonization, and, profiting by past errors, would have settled in the island men of the right stamp. Sir Humphrey Gilbert's failure was the result of a succession of uncontrollable disasters. Fully appreciating the immense value of the fisheries of Newfoundland, he seems to have been thoroughly impressed with the idea that the right way of prosecuting those fisheries was to colonize the country and conduct them on the spot whereby he would have established a resident population who would have combined fishing with the cultivation of the soil. It was a departure from this policy and a determination at the behest of selfish monopolists to make the island a mere fishing station that postponed for many weary years the prosperity of the colony, blighting the national enterprise and paralyzing the energies of the people. End of section 21. Read by Carrie Adams, your book voice, at Mesa, Arizona, on the 19th of July, 2022. Section 22 of The Great Events by Famous Historians, Volume 10. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Caveat. The Great Events by Famous Historians, Volume 10 by Charles F. Horne, Rossiter Johnson, and John Rudd. Section 22. Assassination of William of Orange, Division of the Netherlands. A.D. 1584. John Lothrop Motley. Throughout the earlier period of the heroic age of the Netherlands, William of Orange, the natural leader of his people, displayed qualities of foresight, prudence, and courage worthy of the position which he held. Without great generalship, he knew how to wait and turn his reverses to account. His life was constantly in danger and was repeatedly attempted but his resolution was never disturbed by fear. While meriting the surname of the Silent, he expressed himself effectively in the decisive speech of action. The pacification of Ghent, 1576, the union of the seventeen Netherland provinces of which William was at the head, was of short duration. The northern provinces were Protestant, the southern mostly Catholic. Diverse trade interests also prevented perfect union. Compromise was attempted without avail. The southern provinces acknowledged Philip II, while the seven northern provinces, Holland, Zeeland, Utrecht, Gelderland, Overyssel, Friesland and Groningen, formed themselves, 1579, into the Union of Utrecht, a federal republic with William of Orange as stadtholder. A little later, the Spanish government published a ban against the prince and set a price upon his head. Many attempts against his life were made by assassins eager for the promised reward. How the treacherous end was finally compassed is told by Motley with all the dramatic realism necessary for a faithful description of the scene. In March 1583, one Pietro Dodogno was executed in Antwerp for endeavouring to assassinate the prince. Before his death, he confessed that he had come from Spain solely for the purpose, and that he had conferred with Lamotte, governor of Gravelines, as the best means of accomplishing his design. In April 1584, Hans Hanzoon, a merchant of Flushing, had been executed for attempting to destroy the prince by means of gunpowder concealed under his house in that city and under his seat in the church. He confessed that he had deliberately formed the intention of performing the deed, that he had discussed the details of the enterprise with the Spanish ambassador in Paris. At about the same time, one Le Goth, a captive French officer, had been applied to by the Marquis de Richebourg on the part of Alexander of Parma to attempt the murder of the prince. Le Goth had consented, saying that nothing could be more easily done, 
and that he would undertake to poison him in a dish of eels, of which he knew him to be particularly fond. The Frenchman was liberated with this understanding, but, being very much the friend of Orange, straightway told the whole story and remained ever afterwards a faithful servant of the States. It is to be presumed that he excused the treachery to which he owed his escape from prison on the ground that faith was no more to be kept with murderers than with heretics. Within two years there had been five distinct attempts to assassinate the prince, all of them with the privity of the Spanish government. A sixth was soon to follow. In the summer of 1584, William of Orange was residing at Delft, where his wife, Louisa de Clarny, had given birth in the preceding winter to a son, afterward the celebrated stadtholder Frederick Henry. The child had received these names from his two godfathers, the kings of Denmark and of Navarre, and his baptism had been celebrated with much rejoicing on June 12th in, in the place of his birth. It was a quiet, cheerful, yet somewhat drowsy little city, that ancient burg of Delft. The placid canals by which it was intersected in every direction were all planted with whispering umbrages, rows of limes and poplars, and along these watery highways the traffic of the place glided so noiselessly that the town seemed the abode of silence and tranquillity. The streets were clean and airy, the houses well built, the whole aspect of the place thriving. One of the principal thoroughfares was called the Old Delft Street. It was shaded on both sides by lime trees, which in the midsummer season covered the surface of the canal, which flowed between them with their light and fragrant blossoms. On one side of the street was the Old Kirk, a plain antique structure of brick with lancet windows, and with a tall, slender tower which inclined at a very considerable angle towards a house upon the other side of the canal. That house was the mansion of William the Silent. It stood directly opposite the church, being separated by a spacious courtyard from the street, while the stables and other offices in the rear extended to the city wall. A narrow lane, opening out of Delft Street, ran along the side of the house and caught in the direction of the ramparts. The house was a plain, two-storied edifice of brick, with red-tiled roof, and formerly been a cloister dedicated to St. Agatha, the last prior of which had been hanged by the furious Louis de la Marque. The news of Anjou's death had been brought to Delft by a special messenger from the French court, on Sunday morning, July the 8th, 1584, the Prince of Orange, having read the dispatches before leaving his bed, caused the man who had brought them to be summoned, that he might give some particular details by word of mouth concerning the last illness of the Duke. The courier was accordingly admitted to the Prince's bedchamber, and proved to be one Francis Guillon, as he called himself. This man had, early in the spring, claimed and received the protection of Orange on the ground of being the son of a Protestant, at Pesacon, who had suffered death for his religious, for his religion and his own ardent attachment to the reformed faith. A pious, psalm-singing, thoroughly Calvinistic youth, he seemed to be, having a Bible and or hymn-book under his arm whenever he walked the street, and most exemplary in his attendance at sermon and lecture. For the rest, a singly unobtrusive personage, twenty-seven years of age, low of stature, meagre, mean-visaged, muddy-complexioned, and altogether a man of no account. There was one opinion, in which the few who had taken the trouble to think of the puny, somewhat shambling stranger from Burgundy at all, coincided it was that he was inoffensive, but quite incapable of any important business. He seemed well educated, claimed to be of respectable parentage, and had considerable facility of speech when any person could be found who thought it worth while to listen to him. But on the whole, he attracted little attention. Nevertheless, this insignificant frame locked up a desperate and daring character. His mild and inoffensive nature had been pregnant seven years with a terrible crime, whose birth could not longer be retarded. Francis Guillon, the Calvinist, son of a martyred Calvinist, was in reality Balthazar Gerard, a fanatical Catholic, whose father and mother were still living at Villefranche in Burgundy. Before reaching man's estate, he had formed the design of murdering the Prince of Orange who, so long as he lived, seemed like to remain a rebel against the Catholic king, and to make every effort to disturb the repose of the Roman Catholic apostolic religion. When, but twenty years of age, he struck his dagger with all his might into a door, exclaiming as he did, Would that the blow had been in the heart of Orange! For this he was rebuked by a bystander, who told him it was not for him to kill princes, and that it was not desirable to destroy so good a captain as the prince, who, after all, might one day reconcile himself with the king.
The inveterate deliberation thus thoroughly matured, Gerard now proceeded to carry into effect. He came to Delft, obtaining a hearing of Villiers, clergyman and intimate friend of Orange, and was somewhat against his will sent to France, to Marshal Baron, who it was thought was soon to be appointed governor of Cambrai. Through Orange's recommendation of the Burgundian, was received into the suite of Noël de Caron, Seigneur de Chenechal, then setting forth on a special mission to the Duke of Anjou. While in France, Gerard could not rest neither by day nor night, so tormented was he by the desire of accomplishing his project, and at length he obtained permission, upon the death of the Duke, to carry this important intelligence to the Prince of Orange. The dispatches having been entrusted to him, he travelled post-haste to Delft, and to his astonishment, the letters had hardly been delivered before he was summoned in person to the chamber of the Prince. Here was an opportunity, such as he had never dared to hope for. The arch-enemy to the church, and to the human race, whose death would confer upon his destroyer wealth and nobility in this world, besides a crown of glory in the next, lay unarmed, alone, in bed, before the man who had thirsted seven long years for his blood. Balthazar could scarcely control his emotions sufficiently to answer the questions which the prince addressed to him concerning the death of Anjou, but Orange, deeply engaged with the dispatches and with the reflections which their deeply important contents suggested, did not observe the countenance of the humble Calvinist exile, who had been recently recommended to his patronage by Villiers. Gerard, moreover, had made no preparation for an interview so entirely unexpected had come unarmed, and had no plan for escape. He was obliged to forgo his prey when most within his reach, and after communicating all the information which the prince required, he was dismissed from the chamber. It was Sunday morning, and the bells were tolling for church. Upon leaving the house, he loitered about the courtyard, furtively examining the premises, so a sergeant of halberdiers asked him why he was waiting there. Balthazar meekly replied that he was desirous of attending divine worship in the church opposite, but added, pointing to his shabby and travel-stained attire, that without at least a new pair of shoes and stockings, he was unfit to join the congregation. Insignificant as ever, the small, pious, dusty stranger excited no suspicion in the mind of the good-natured sergeant. He forthwith spoke of the wants of Girard to an officer, by whom they communicated to Orange himself, and the prince instantly ordered a sum of money to be given to him. Thus Balthazar obtained from William's charity what Palmer's thrift had denied, a fund for carrying out his purpose. Next morning, with the money thus procured, he purchased a pair of pistols or small carabines from a soldier. Chaffering long about the price, because the vendor could not supply a particular kind of chopped bullets or slugs which he desired. For the fall of the sunset of the following day, that soldier had stabbed himself to into the heart, and died despairing on hearing for what purpose the pistols had been bought. On Tuesday, July the 10th, 1584, at about half-past twelve, the prince, with his wife on his arm, followed by the ladies and gentlemen of his family, was going to the dining-room. William the Silence was dressed upon that day, according to his usual custom, in very plain fashion. He wore a wide-leaved, loosely-shaped hat of dark felt, with a silken cord around the crown, such as had been worn by the beggars in the early days of the revolt. A high ruff circled his neck, from which also depended one of the beggars' medals, with the motto, Videlis o Roy Juesca la Bessé, while a loose surcoat of grey frieze cloth over a tawny leather doublet, with wide slashed underclothes, completed his costume. Girard presented himself at the doorway and demanded a passport. The princess, struck with the pale and agitated countenance of the man, anxiously questioned her husband concerning the stranger. The prince carelessly observed that it was merely a person who came for a passport, ordering at the same time a secretary forthwith to prepare one. The princess, still not relieved, observed in an undertone that she had never seen so villainous a countenance. Orange, however, not at all impressed with the appearance of Girard, conducted himself at table with his usual cheerfulness, conversing much with the burgomaster of Lee Warden, the only guest present at the family dinner, concerning the political and religious aspects of Friesland. At two o'clock, the company rose from the table. The prince led the way, intending to pass to his private apartments above. The dining room, which was on the ground floor, opened to a little square vestibule, which communicated through an arched passageway with the main entrance into the courtyard. This vestibule was also directly at the foot of the wooden staircase leading to the next floor, and was scarcely six feet in width. Upon its left side, 
as one approached the stairway was an obscure arch sunk deep in the wall and completely in the shadow of the door. Behind this arch, a portal opened to the narrow lane at the side of the house. The stairs themselves were completely lighted by a large window, halfway up the flight. The prince came from the dining room and began leisurely to ascend. He had only reached the second stair when a man emerged from the sunken arch and standing within a foot or two of him, discharged a pistol ball full at his heart. Three balls entered his body, one of which, passing th quite through him, struck with violence against the wall beyond. The prince exclaimed in French as he felt the wound, Oh my God, have mercy upon my soul! Oh my God, have mercy upon this poor people! These were the last words he ever spoke, save that when his sister, Catherine of Schwarzburg, immediately afterwards asked him if he commended his soul to Jesus Christ, he faintly answered, Yes. His master of the horse, Jacob of Mardir, had caught him in his arms as the fatal shot was fired. The prince was then placed on the stairs for an instant, when he immediately began to swoon. He was afterwards laid out upon a couch in the dining room, where in a few minutes he breathed his last in the arms of his wife and sister. The murderer succeeded in making his escape through the side door, and sped swiftly up the narrow lane. He had almost reached the ramparts, from which he intended to spring into the moat, when he stumbled over a heap of rubbish. As he rose, he was seized by several pages and halberdiers, who had pursued him from the house. He had dropped his pistols upon the spot where he had committed the crime, and upon his person were found a couple of bladders provided with a piece of pipe, with which he intended to assist himself across the moat, beyond which a horse was waiting for him. He made no effort to deny his identity, but boldly avowed himself and the deed. He was brought back to the house, where he immediately underwent a preliminary examination before the city magistrates. He was afterwards subjected to excruciating tortures, for the fury against the wretch who had destroyed the father of the country was uncontrollable, and William the Silent was no longer alive to intercede, as he had often done before, on behalf of those who had assailed his life. The sentence pronounced against the assassin was execrable, a crime against the memory of the great man whom it professed to avenge. It was decreed that the right hand of Gerard should be burned off with a red-hot iron, that his flesh should be torn from his bones with pincers in six places, that he should be quartered and disemboweled alive that his heart should be torn from his bosom and flung in his face, and that finally his head should be taken off. Not even his horrible crime with its endless consequences, not the natural frenzy of indignation which it had excited, could justify this savage decree, to rebuke which the murdered hero might have almost risen from the sleep of death. The sentence was literally executed on July the 14th, criminals supporting its honours with the same astonishing fortitude. So calm were his nerves, crippled, and half roasted as he was ere he mounted the scaffold, that when one of the executions was slightly injured in the ear by the flying from the handle of the hammer with which he was breaking the fatal pistol in pieces as the first step in the execution, a circumstance which produced a general laugh in the crowd, a smile was observed upon Balthazar's face in sympathy with the general hilarity. His lips were seen to move up to the moment when his heart was thrown in his face. Then, said a looker-on, he gave up the ghost. The reward promised by Philip to the man who should murder Orange was paid to the heirs of Girard. Farmer informed his sovereign that the poor man had been executed, but that his father and mother were still living, to whom he recommended the payment that nursed which the laudable and generous deed had so well deserved. This was accordingly done, and the excellent parents, ennobled and enriched by the crime of their son, received, instead of the 25,000 crowns promised in the ban, the three signatories of Lemont, Hostel and Dan Martin in the French Comte, and took their place at once among the landed aristocracy. Thus the bounty of the prince had furnished the weapon by which his life was destroyed, and his estate supplied the fund out of which the assassin's family received the price of blood. At a later day, when the unfortunate eldest son of Orange returned from Spain, after twenty-seven years' absence, a changeling and a Spaniard, the restoration of those various estates was offered to him by Philip II, provided he would continue to pay a fixed proportion of their rents to the family of his father's murderer. The education which Prince William had received under the king's auspices had, however, had not entirely destroyed all his human feelings, and he rejected the proposal with scorn. The estates remained with the Girard family, and the patents of nobility which they had received were used to justify their exemption from certain taxes, until the union of French comp with France, when a French governor tore the documents in pieces and trampled them underfoot. 
The life and labours of Orange had established the emancipated Commonwealth upon a secure foundation, but his death rendered the union of all the Netherlands into one republic hopeless. The efforts of the malcontent nobles, the religious discord, the consummate ability, both political and military, of Parma, all combined with the lamentable loss of William the Silent, to separate forever the southern and Catholic provinces from the northern confederacy. So long as the prince remained alive, he was the father of the whole country, the Netherlands, saving only two Walloon provinces, constituting a whole. Notwithstanding the spirit of faction and the blight of the long civil war, there was at least one country, or the hope of a country, one strong heart, one guiding head for the patriotic party throughout the land. Philip and Granvella were right in their estimates of the advantage to be derived from the prince's death, in believing that an assassin's hand could achieve more than all the wiles which Spanish or Italian statesmanship could teach, or all the armies which Spain or Italy could muster. The pistol of the insignificant Gerard destroyed the possibility of a united Netherlands state, while during the life of William there was union in the policy, unity in the history of the country. End of section 22 Section 23 of The Great Events by Famous Historians, Volume 10. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by T.R. Love of Pleasant Hill, California. The Great Events by Famous Historians, Volume 10, by Charles F. Horn, Rossiter Johnson, and John Rudd. The Naming of Virginia, First Description of the Indians, The Lost Colony, A.D. 1584, Arthur Barlow, R.R. R. Howison. At the age of 32, Sir Walter Raleigh had already been connected with navigating and colonizing expeditions to North America. He was associated with the enterprise of his elder half-brother, Sir Humphrey Gilbert, who, in 1583, established at St. John's, Newfoundland, the first English colony beyond seas. Upon the death of Gilbert in that year, Raleigh succeeded to his enterprise and obtained from Queen Elizabeth, whose favorite he was, a charter of colonization. When next year he sent out his first expedition to find some suitable spot for a colony on the North American coast, Raleigh took warning from the unfortunate experiences of Gilbert in the northern latitudes and directed his two commanders, Philip Amidas and Arthur Barlow, to take another route. They accordingly took the old way by the Canary Islands. History is fortunate in possessing Barlow's account of this voyage. It has, as one writer says, all the freshness and gaiety of an idyll. His description of the sweet smell wafted to the voyagers from the American shore as from some delicate garden abounding with all kinds of odoriferous flowers was noticed by Bacon and utilized by Dryden to flatter one of his patrons. Howison's story of the ill-starred colony and the conjectural refuge of its remnants among the Croatan Indians of Virginia, as Raleigh named the whole region, including the present North Carolina, fittingly completes the history of Sir Walter's American enterprise. The failure of the colony has been freely charged to his own neglect, occasioned by the turning of his mind to more brilliant prospects presented in the illusory El Dorado, whereby so many other adventurers were misled. Arthur Barlow the 27th day of April, in the year of our redemption, 1584, we departed the west of England with two barks well furnished with men and victuals, having received our last and perfect directions by your letters, confirming the former instructions and commandments delivered by yourself at our leaving the River of Thames. And I think it a matter both unnecessary for the manifest discovery of the country as also for tediousness's sake, to remember unto you the diurnal of our course, sailing thither and returning, only I have presumed to present unto you this brief discourse, by which you may judge how profitable this land is likely to succeed, as well to yourself, 
by whose direction and charge, and by whose servants, this our discovery hath been performed, as also to Her Highness and the Commonwealth, in which we hope your wisdom will be satisfied, considering that as much by us hath been brought to light, as by those small means and number of men we had, could any way have been expected or hoped for. The 10th of May in this present year we arrived at the Canaries, and the 10th of June we were fallen with the islands of the West Indies, keeping a more southwesterly course than was needful, because we doubted about the current of the Bay of Mexico. Disboggoing between the Cape of Florida and Havana had been of greater force than afterward we found it to be, at which islands we found the air very unwholesome, and our men grew for the most part ill-disposed, so that having refreshed ourselves with sweet water and fresh victual, we departed the twelfth day of our arrival here. These islands, with the rest adjoining, are so well known to yourself and to many others that I will not trouble you with the remembrance of them. The 2nd of July we found shoal water where we smelt so sweet and so strong a smell as if we had been in the midst of some delicate garden abounding with all kind of odoriferous flowers by which we were assured that the land could not be far distant and keeping good watch and bearing but slack sail the fourth of the same month we arrived upon the coast which we supposed to be a continent and firm land and we sailed along the same one hundred twenty english miles before we could find any entrance or river issuing into the sea the first that appeared unto us we entered though not without some difficulty and cast anchor about three arquebus shot within the haven's mouth on the left hand of the same and after thanks given to god for our safe arrival thither we manned our boats and went to view the land next adjoining and to take possession of the same in the right of the queen's most excellent majesty as rightful queen and princess of the same and delivered the same over to your use according to her majesty's grant and letters patent under her highness's great seal which being performed according to the ceremonies used in such enterprises we viewed the land about us being whereas we first landed very sandy and low toward the water's side but so full of grapes as the very beating and surge of the sea overflowed them of which we found such plenty, as well there as in all places else, both on the sand and on the green soil on the hills, as in the plains, as well as on every little shrub, as also climbing toward the tops of high cedars, that I think in all the world the like abundance is not to be found, and myself, having seen those parts of Europe that most abound, find such differences as were incredible to be written. We passed from the seaside toward the tops of those hills next adjoining, being but of mean height, and from thence we beheld the sea on both sides, to the north and to the south, finding no end any of both ways. This land lay stretching itself to the west, which after we found to be but an island of twenty miles long and not above six miles broad. Under the bank or hill whereon we stood, we beheld the valleys replenished with goodly cedar trees, and having discharged our arquebus shot, such a flock of cranes, the most part white, arose under us, with such a cry redoubled by many echoes, as if an army of men had shouted all together. This island had many goodly woods full of deer, conies, hare, and fowl, even in the midst of summer, in incredible abundance. The woods were not such as you find in Bohemia, Muscovia, or Hercynia, barren and fruitless, but the highest and reddest cedars of the world, far bettering the cedars of the Azores, of the Indies, or Libanus, pines, cypress, sassafras, the lentisk, or the tree that beareth the mastic, the tree that beareth the rind of black cinnamon, of which master winter brought from the straits of magellan and many other of excellent smell and quality we remained by the side of this island two whole days before we saw any people of the country 
The third day we espied one small boat rowing toward us, having in it three persons. This boat came to the island side, four arquebus shot from our ships, and there two of the people remaining. The third came along the shore side toward us, and we being then all within board, he walked up and down upon the point of the land next unto us. Then the master and the pilot of the admiral, Simon Ferdinando, and the captain, Philip Amidas, myself, and others, rode to the land, whose coming this fellow attended, never making any shew of fear or doubt. And after he had spoken of many things not understood by us, we brought him, with his own good liking, aboard the ships, and gave him a shirt, a hat, and some other things, and made him taste our wine and our meat, which he liked very well. And after having viewed both barks, he departed and went to his own boat again, which he had left in a little cove or creek adjoining. As soon as he was too bowshot into the water, he fell to fishing, and in less than half an hour he had laden his boat as deep as it could swim, with which he came again to the point of the land, and there he divided his fish into two parts, pointing one part to the ship and the other to the pinnace, which, after he had, as much as he might, requited the former benefits received, departed out of our sight. The next day there came unto us divers boats, and in one of them the king's brother, accompanied by forty or fifty men, very handsome and goodly people, and in their behavior as mannerly and civil as any of Europe. His name was Gran Ganimio, and the king is called Wingina, the country Wingandicoa, and now by Her Majesty Virginia. The manner of his coming was in this sort. He left his boats altogether as the first man did, a little from the ships by the shore, and came along to the place over against the ships, followed with forty men. When he came to the place, his servants spread out a long mat upon the ground, on which he sat down, and at the other end of the mat four others of his company did the like. The rest of his men stood round him somewhat afar off. When we came to the shore to him with our weapons, he never moved from his place, nor any of the other four, nor never mistrusted any harm to be offered from us. But sitting still, he beckoned us to come and sit by him, which we performed, and being set, he made all signs of joy and welcome, striking on his head and his breast, and afterward on ours, to shew we were all one, smiling and making shew the best he could of all love and familiarity. After he made a long speech unto us, we presented him with diverse things, which he received very joyfully and thankfully. None of the company durst speak one word all the time. Only the four, which were at the other end, spake one in the other's ear very softly. The king was greatly obeyed, and his brothers and children reverenced. The king himself, in person, was at our being there, sore wounded in a fight, which he had with the king of the next country, called Piamacum, and was shot in two places through the body, and one clean through the thigh. But yet he recovered, by reason whereof, and for that he lay at the chief town of the country, being six days' journey off, we saw him not at all. After we had presented this, his brother, with such things as we thought he liked, we likewise gave somewhat to the other that sat with him on the mat. But presently he arose and took all from them, and put it into his own basket, making signs and tokens that all things ought to be delivered unto him, and the rest were but his servants and followers. A day or two after this we fell to trading with them, exchanging some things that we had for chamois, buff, and deer skins. When we shewed him all our packet of merchandise, of all things that he saw, a bright tin dish most pleased him, which he presently took up and clapped it before his breast, and after making a hole in the brim thereof and hung it about his neck, 
making signs that it would defend him against his enemy's arrows. For those people maintain a deadly and terrible war with the people and king adjoining. We exchanged our tin dish for twenty skins worth twenty crowns or twenty nobles, and a copper kettle for fifty skins worth fifty crowns. They offered us good exchange for our hatchets and axes and for knives, and would have given anything for swords, but we would not depart with any. After two or three days, the king's brother came aboard the ships and drank wine, and eat of our meat and of our bread, and liked exceedingly thereof. And after a few days overpassed, he brought his wife with him to the ships, his daughter, and two or three children. His wife was very well favored, of mean stature, and very bashful. She had on her back a long cloak of leather, with the fur side next to her body, and before her a piece of the same. About her forehead she had a band of white coral, and so had her husband many times. In her ears she had bracelets of pearls hanging down to her middle, whereof we delivered your worship a little bracelet, and those were of the bigness of good peas. The rest of her women, of the better sort, had pendants of copper hanging in either ear, and some of the children of the king's brother and other noblemen have five or six in either ear. He himself had upon his head a broad plate of gold or copper, for being unpolished we knew not what metal it should be, neither would he by any means suffer us to take it off his head. But feeling it, it would bow very easily. His apparel was as his wife's, only the women wear their hair long on both sides, and the men but on one. They are of color yellowish, and their hair black for the most part, and yet we saw children that had very fine auburn and chestnut colored hair. After that these women had been there, there came down from all parts great store of people, bringing with them leather, coral, diverse kinds of dye, very excellent, and exchanged with us. But when Gran Ganimio, the king's brother, was present, none durst trade but himself, except such as wear red pieces of copper on their head like himself. For that is the difference between the noblemen and the governors of countries, and the meaner sort. And we both noted there, and you have understood since, by these men which we brought home, that no people in the world carry more respect to their king, nobility, and governors than these do. The king's brother's wife, when she came to us, as she did many times, was followed with forty or fifty women always. And when she came into the ship, she left them all on land, saving her two daughters, her nurse, and one or two more. The king's brother always kept this order. As many boats as he would come withal to the ships, so many fires would he make on the shore afar off. To the end we might understand with what strength and company he approached. Their boats are made of one tree, either of pine or of pitch trees, a wood not commonly known to our people, nor found growing in England. They have no edge tools to make them withal. If they have any, they are very few, and those, it seems, they had twenty years since, which, as those two men declared, was out of a wreck, which happened upon their coast of some Christian ship, being beaten that way by some storm and outrageous weather, whereof none of the people were saved, but only the ship, or some part of her, being cast upon the sand, out of whose sides they drew the nails and the spikes, and with those they made their best instruments. The manner of making their boats is thus. They burn down some great tree, or take such as are wind fallen, and putting gum and resin upon one side thereof, they set fire into it. And when it hath burned it hollow, they cut out the coal with their shells, and everywhere they would burn it deeper or wider, they lay on gums, which burn away the timber, and by this means they fashion very fine boats, and such as will transport twenty men. Their oars are like scoops, and many times they set with long poles as the depth serveth. 
The king's brother had great liking of our armor, a sword, and diverse other things which we had, and offered to lay a great box of pearl and gauge for them. But we refused it for this time, because we would not make them know that we esteemed thereof, until we had understood in what places of the country the pearl grew, which now your worship doth very well understand. He was very just of his promise, for many times we delivered him merchandise upon his word, but ever he came within the day and performed his promise. He sent us every day a brace or two of fat bucks, conies, hares, fish, the best of the world. He sent us diverse kinds of fruits, melons, walnuts, cucumbers, gourds, peas, and diverse roots, and fruits very excellent good, and of their country corn, which is very white, fair, and well tasted, and groweth three times in five months. In May they sow, in July they reap, in June they sow, in August they reap, in July they sow, in September they reap. Only they cast the corn into the ground, breaking a little of the soft turf with a wooden mattock or pickaxe. Ourselves proved the soil and put some of our peas in the ground, and in ten days they were of fourteen inches high. They have also beans very fair, of diverse colors, and wonderful plenty, some growing naturally and some in their gardens, and so have they both wheat and oats. The soil is the most plentiful, sweet, fruitful, and wholesome of all the world. There are above fourteen several sweet-smelling timber trees, and the most part of their underwoods are bays and such like. They have those oaks that we have, but far greater and better. After they had been diverse times aboard our ships, myself with seven more went twenty mile into the river that runneth toward the city of Skycoke, which river they all call Ockham. And the evening following we came to an island which they call Roanoke, distant from the harbor by which we entered seven leagues, and at the north end thereof was a village of nine houses, built of cedar and fortified round about with sharp trees to keep out their enemies, and the entrance into it made like a turnpike very artificially. When we came toward it, standing near unto the water's side, the wife of Gran Ganimio, the king's brother, came running out to meet us very cheerfully and friendly. Her husband was not then in the village. Some of her people she commanded to draw our boat on shore for the beating of the billow. Others she appointed to carry us on their backs to the dry ground, and others to bring our oars into the house for fear of stealing. When we were come into the utter room, having five rooms in her house, she caused us to sit down by a great fire, and after took off our clothes and washed them and dried them again. Some of the women plucked off our stockings and washed them, some washed our feet in warm water, and she herself took great pains to see all things ordered in the best manner she could, making great haste to dress some meat for us to eat. After we had thus dried ourselves, she brought us into the inner room, where she set on the board, standing along the house, some wheat like frumenti, sodden venison and roasted, fish sodden, boiled and roasted, melons raw and sodden, roots of diverse kinds and diverse fruits. Their drink is commonly water, but while the grape lasteth, they drank wine, and for want of cask to keep it, all the year after they drink water, but it is sodden with ginger in it, and black cinnamon, and sometimes sassafras, and diverse other wholesome and medicinable herbs and trees. We were entertained with all love and kindness, and with as much bounty after their manner as they could possibly devise. We found the people most gentle, loving, and faithful, void of all guile and treason and such, as live after the manner of the golden age. The people only care how to defend themselves from the cold in their short winter, and to feed themselves with such meat as the soil affordeth. 
Their meat is very well sodden, and they make broth very sweet and savory. Their vessels are earthen pots, very large, white, and sweet. Their dishes are wooden platters of sweet timber. Within the place where they feed was their lodging, and within that their idol, which they worship, of whom they speak incredible things. While we were at meat, there came in at the gates two or three men with their bows and arrows from hunting, whom, when we espied, we began to look one toward another and offered to reach our weapons. But as soon as she espied our mistrust, she was very much moved and caused some of her men to run out and take away their bows and arrows and break them, and withal beat the poor fellows out of the gate again. When we departed in the evening and would not tarry all night, she was very sorry and gave us unto our boat our supper half-dressed, pots and all, and brought us to our boat side, in which we lay all night, removing the same a pretty distance from the shore. She perceived our jealousy, was much grieved, and sent divers men and thirty women to sit all night on the bank side by us, and sent us into our boats fine mats to cover us from the rain, using very many words to entreat us to rest in their houses. But because we were few men, and if we had miscarried, the voyage had been in very great danger, we durst not adventure anything, although there was no cause of doubt, for a more kind and loving people there cannot be found in the world, as far as we had hitherto had trial. Beyond this island there is the mainland, and over against this island falleth into this spacious water the great river called Ockham, by its inhabitants, on which standeth a town called Pomioc, and six days' journey from the same is situate their greatest city, called Skykawak, which this people affirm to be very great, but the savages were never at it, only they speak of it by the report of their fathers and other men, whom they have heard affirm it to be above one hour's journey about. Into this river falleth another great river called Sipo, in which there is found great store of mussels, in which there are pearls. Likewise, there descendeth into this Ockham another river called Nomopana, on the one side whereof standeth a great town called Chawanuk, and the lord of that town is called Puneno. This Puneno is not subject to the king of Wingandakoa, but is a free lord. Beyond this country there is another king, whom they call Menatonon, and these three kings are in league with each other. Toward the southwest, four days' journey, is situate a town called Sekotan, which is the southernmost town of Wingandakoa, near unto which six and twenty years past there was a ship cast away, whereof some of the people were saved, and those were white people, whom the country people preserved. And after ten days remaining in an out-island uninhabited called Wokokan, they, with the help of some of the dwellers of Sekotan, fastened two boats of the country together, and made masts unto them, and sails of their shirts, and having taken into them such victuals as the country yielded, they departed, after they had remained in this out-island three weeks. But shortly after, it seemed, they were cast away, for the boats were found upon the coast, cast a land in another island adjoining. Other than these, there was never any people apparelled or white of color, either seen or heard of among these people, and these, aforesaid, were seen only of the inhabitants of Sekotan, which appeared to be very true, for they wondered marvelously when we were among them at the whiteness of our skins, ever coveting to touch our breasts and to view the same. Besides, they had our ships in marvelous admiration, and all things else were so strange unto them as it appeared that none of them had ever seen the like. When we discharged any piece, were it but an arquebus, they would tremble through it for very fear and for the strangeness of the same, for the weapons which themselves use are bows and arrows. The arrows are but of small canes, 
headed with a sharp shell or tooth of a fish, sufficient enough to kill a naked man. Their swords be of wood hardened. Likewise, they use wooden breastplates for their defense. They have beside a kind of club, in the end whereof they fasten the sharp horns of a stag or other beast. When they go to wars, they carry about with them their idol, of whom they ask counsel, as the Romans were wont of the oracle of Apollo. They sing songs as they march toward the battle, instead of drums and trumpets. Their wars are very cruel and bloody, by reason whereof, and of their civil dissensions, which have happened of late years among them, the people are marvelously wasted, and in some places the country left desolate. Adjoining to this country aforesaid, called Sacotan, beginneth country called Pomovic, belonging to another king, whom they call Pimacum. And this king is in league with the next king, adjoining toward the setting of the sun, and the country, Nusioch, situate upon a goodly river called Nuis. These kings have mortal war with Wingina, king of Wingandicoa, but about two years past there was a peace made between the king Pimacum and the lord of Secotan, as these men which we have brought with us to England have given us to understand. But there remaineth a mortal malice in the Secotans for many injuries and slaughters done upon them by this Pimacum. They invited diverse men and thirty women of the best of his country to their town to a feast, and when they were all together merry and praying before their idol, which is nothing else but a mere delusion of the devil, the captain or lord of the town came suddenly upon them and slew them every one, reserving the women and children, and these two have oftentimes since persuaded us to surprise Pimacum in his town, having promised and assured us that there will be found in it great store of commodities. But whether their persuasion may be to the end they may be revenged of their enemies, or for the love they bear to us, we leave that to the trial hereafter. Beyond this island called Roanoke are many islands very plentiful of fruits and other natural increases, together with many towns and villages along the side of the continent, some bounding upon the islands and some stretching up farther into the land. When we first had sight of this country, some thought the first land we saw to be the continent. But after we entered into the haven, we saw before us another mighty long sea. For there lieth along the coast a track of islands two hundred miles in length, adjoining to the ocean sea, and between the islands two or three entrances. When you are entered between them, these islands being very narrow for the most part, as in some places six miles broad, in some places less. In few more, then there appeareth another great sea, containing in breadth, in some places forty, in some fifty, in some twenty miles over, before you come unto the continent. And in this enclosed sea there are above one hundred islands of diverse bignesses, whereof one is sixteen miles long, at which we were, finding it a most pleasant and fertile ground, replenished with goodly cedars and diverse other sweet woods, full of currants, of flax, and many other notable commodities, which we at that time had no leisure to view. Besides this island there are many, as I have said, some of two, of three, of four, of five miles, some more, some less, most beautiful and pleasant to behold, replenished with deer, conies, hares, and diverse beasts, and about them the goodliest and best fish in the world, and in greatest abundance. Thus, sir, we have acquainted you with the particulars of our discovery made this present voyage, as far forth as the shortness of the time we there continued would afford us to take view of, and so contenting ourselves with this service at this time, which we hope hereafter to enlarge, as occasion and assistance shall be given, we resolve to leave the country, and to apply ourselves to return for England, which we did accordingly, and arrived safely in the west of England about the midst of September. 
And whereas we have above certified you of the country taken in possession by us to Her Majesty's use, and so to yours by Her Majesty's grant, we thought good for the better assurance thereof to record some of the particular gentlemen and men of account who then were present as witnesses of the same, that thereby all occasion of cavil to the title of the country in Her Majesty's behalf may be prevented, which otherwise such as like not the action may use and pretend, whose names are Master Philip Amidas, Master Arthur Barlow, Captains William Greenville, John Wood, James Bromwich, Henry Green, Benjamin Wood, Simon Ferdinando, Nicholas Petman, John Hughes of the company. We brought home also two of the savages, being lusty men, whose names were Wanchesa and Manteo. End of section 23. Section 24 of The Great Events by Famous Historians, Volume 10. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by T.R. Love of Pleasant Hill, California. The Great Events by Famous Historians, Volume 10. By Charles F. Horn, Rossiter Johnson, and John Rudd. The Naming of Virginia, the First Description of the Indians, The Lost Colony, A.D. 1584, by R. R. Howison. Arrived in England, Barlow and Amidas immediately sought the Queen, and laid before her an account of their voyage and of its results. There was much of truth as a basis for their wondrous descriptions, but the sober observer will not fail to mark in this narrative the impress of imaginations heated by the novelty of their performance and the encouraging hope of their royal mistress. They spake of the land they had visited as an earthly paradise. Its seas were tranquil and gemmed with green islands, on which the eye delighted to rest. Its trees were lofty, and many of them would rival the odoriferous products of tropical soil, its fruits were so lavishly supplied by nature that art needed to do little more than gather them in summer and autumn for the wants of the winter. Its people were children of another age when virtue triumphed and vice was yet unknown. The court and the queen were alike enlisted and looked to this discovery as one of the brightest spots in her lustrous reign. For a land so distinguished in natural charms, and to which England designed to devote the expanding energies of her people, a name was to be found worthy of future love. The Queen selected Virginia, and none can deplore the graceful choice. She remembered her own unmarried state, and connecting, it may be, with this the virgin purity which yet seemed to linger amid this favored region— she bestowed a name which has since interwoven itself with the most sensitive chords of a million hearts. Raleigh had now obtained the honor of knighthood and a seat in Parliament, and deriving from this lucrative monopoly means for further effort. He made diligent preparation for dispatching another fleet to Virginia. The second expedition consisted of seven vessels, large and small, and that gallant spirit, Sir Richard Grenville himself, was at its head. The war with Spain was now in progress, and the richly laden vessel from South America and the West Indies offered tempting prizes to English bravery. Sir Richard sailed from Plymouth April 9, passed the Canaries and West Indies, captured two Spanish ships, ran imminent hazard of being wrecked on the dangerous headland now known as Cape Fear, and reached Wapkin on June 26th. Manteo was brought back to his native land and proved an invaluable guide and interpreter to his newly made friends. But their amicable relations with the natives were now to receive a rude shock, from which they never recovered. At Aquascagoc, an Indian stole from the adventurers a silver cup, 
and on being detected, he did not return it as speedily as desired. July 16. For this enormous offense, the English burned the town and barbarously destroyed the growing corn. The affrighted inhabitants fled to the woods, and thus a poison arrow was planted in their bosoms, which rankled unto the end. A silver cup, in the eyes of European avarice, was a loss which could only be atoned by ruin and devastation. And had the unhappy savage stolen only the child of the boldest settler, a more furious vengeance could not have followed. To such conduct does America owe the undying hatred of the aboriginal tenants of her land, and the burden of infamy that she must bear when weighed in the scales of immaculate justice. A serious attempt was now made to found a colony. 108 men were left on the island of Roanoke, comprising in their number some of the boldest hearts and many of the best cultivated minds that had left the mother country. Among them was Thomas Harriet, whom Raleigh had sent out with a full knowledge of his scientific acquirements, his love of investigation, and his moral worth. Sir Richard Granville returned to England, where he arrived in September, bringing with him a rich Spanish prize. The settlers, thus left to their own resources, seemed to have done little in the all-important task of clearing the country and planting corn for future necessities. Ralph Lane had been appointed governor, a man uniting military knowledge with experience in the sea. He undertook several voyages of exploration, penetrated north as far as Elizabeth River and a town on Chesapeake Bay, and south to Secotan, 80 leagues from Roanoke. But his most famous expedition was up Albemarle Sound and the Chowan River, of his adventures in which he has himself given a description in a letter preserved by Captain Smith. The king of the Chowanooks was known by the title of Menatonin, he was lame in one of his lower limbs, but his spirit seems to have been one of uncommon activity and shrewdness. He told the credulous English of a country four days' journey beyond them, where they might hope for abundant riches. This country lay on the sea, and its king, from the waters around his island retreat, drew magnificent pearls in such numbers that they were commonly used in his garments and household conveniences. Instantly, the fancies of the eager listeners were fired with the hope of attaining this wealth, and notwithstanding the scarcity of food and the danger of an assault by two or three thousand savages, they continued to toil up the river. They labored on until they had nothing for sustenance except two dogs of the mastiff species and the sassafras leaves which grew in great abundance around them. Upon this inviting fare they were fain to nourish their bodies while their souls were fed upon the hope of finally entering this region of pearls. But at length, in a state near to starvation, they returned to Roanoke, having made no discovery even so valuable as a copper spring high up the Chowan River, concerning which the Indians had excited their hopes. Thomas Harriet employed his time in researches more rational than those which sought for pearls amid the wilderness of America. He intermingled freely with the Indian tribes, studied their habits, their manners, their language, and origin. He sought to teach them a theology more exalted than the fancies of their singular superstition, and to expand their minds by a display of the instruments of European science. He acquired a vast fund of information as to the state of the original country, its people, and its products, and to his labors we may yet be indebted in the progress of this narrative. But we have reason to believe that a great part of the colonists contributed nothing to the success of the scheme, and did much to render it fruitless. The natives, who had received the first adventurers with unsuspecting hospitality, were now estranged by the certain prospect of seeing their provisions taken away and their homes wrested from them by civilized pretenders. 
When Gina, the king of the country, had never been cordial, and he now became their implacable foe. Nothing but a superstitious reverence of the Bible, the firearms, and the medicinal remedies of the colonists restrained his earthly enmity. But at length, upon the death of his father, Ensenor, who had been the steady friend of the whites, he prepared for vengeance. In accordance with a custom common among the Indians, he had changed his name to Pemisipan, and now drew around him followers to aid in his scheme of death. Twenty or more were to surround the hut of Lane, drive him forth with fire, and slay him while thus defenseless. The leader destroyed, the rest of the colonists were to be gradually exhausted by starving, until they should fall an easy prey to the savages. But this well-concerted plan was betrayed to the English. A rencontre occurred, and several Indians were slain. The settlers considered themselves justifiable in meeting the treachery of the foe by a stratagem, which drew Pemisipan and eight of his principal men within their reach, and they were all shot down in the skirmish, 1586. But this success did not assuage the hunger of the famished colonists. They were reduced to extremity when a seasonable relief appeared on their coasts, June 8th. While despair was taking possession of their bosoms, the white sails of a distant fleet were seen, and Sir Francis Drake, with 23 ships, was soon in their waters. He had been cruising in search of the Spaniards in the West Indies and had been directed by the Queen to visit the Virginia colony. His quick perception instantly discerned the wants of the settlers, and he provided for them a ship well stored with provisions and furnished with boats to serve in emergency. But a violent storm drove his fleet to the sea and reduced to wreck the vessel intended to sustain the settlers. Their resolution gave way. It seemed as though divine and human power were against them, and, in utter despondency, they entreated Drake to receive them in his fleet and carry them to England. He yielded to their wishes. They embarked June 18th, and July 27th they landed once more on the shores of their motherland. Thus, after a residence of nearly twelve months in Virginia, the first colonists deserted the country which had been offered as containing all that the heart of man could desire. Little was gained by their abortive attempt beyond an increased knowledge of the new world and another lesson in the great book of depraved human nature. It would be pleasing to the lover of Virginia to be able to record the final good fortune of Walter Raleigh, but nothing resulted from his patent except successive disaster and an appalling consummation. The determined knight had sent a ship to seek the colony, and this arrived after the disheartened settlers had sailed with Sir Francis Drake, and, thus finding the island deserted, it returned to England. Two weeks afterward, Sir Richard Grenville arrived with two ships well appointed, but no flourishing settlement greeted his eager eyes. Unwilling to abandon the semblance of hope, he left fifteen men on the island, well provided with all things essential to their comfort, and then spread his sails for England, 1587. In the succeeding year, Raleigh prepared for another attempt. Convinced that the Bay of Chesapeake, which had been discovered by Lane, afforded greater advantages for a colony, he directed his adventurers to seek its shores and gave them a character of corporation for the city of Raleigh, a name that North Carolina has since, with merited gratitude, bestowed upon her most favored town. John White assumed command of this expedition, and they were soon in the waters of Virginia, July 22nd. The Cape, to which maritime terrors have given an expressive name, threatened them with shipwreck, but at length they arrived in safety at Hatteras, and immediately dispatched a party to Roanoke to seek the settlers left by Sir Richard Grenville. A melancholy silence pervaded the spot. The huts were yet standing, but rank weeds and vines had overspread them, 
and striven to reclaim to the wilderness the abortive efforts of human labor. Not one man could be found, but the bones of one unhappy victim told in gloomy eloquence of conflict and of death. From the reluctant statements of the natives, they gathered the belief that these men had either all perished under the attacks of overwhelming numbers or had gradually wasted away under the approaches of disease and famine. A discovery so mournful held out no cheering prospects to the new adventurers, yet they determined to renew the attempt upon the island adjoining Hatteras. About 115 persons were landed and prepared for their novel life. The Indians were no longer pacific. The spirit of Wingina had diffused itself through every bosom, and the unfortunate mistake, which caused the death of a friendly savage, contributed much to the general hostility. But amid so much that was unpropitious, two events occurred to shed a faint light upon their days, August 13th. Manteo, the faithful friend of the early visitors, was baptized with the simple though solemn rites of the Christian faith, and upon him was bestowed the sounding title of Lord of De Salmon Peak, and a few days after, the first child of European parentage was born upon the soil of America. Eleanor, daughter of Governor White, had married Ananias Dare, and on August 18th she gave birth to a female, upon whom was immediately bestowed the sweet name of Virginia. It is sad to reflect that the gentle infant of an English mother, and the first whose eyes were opened upon the new world, should have been destined to a life of privation and to a death of early oblivion. But the colonists needed many things from the motherland and determined to send the governor to procure them. He was unwilling to leave them under circumstances so strongly appealing to his paternal heart, but yielded to the general wish and sailed on August 27th. But many causes now opposed his success in the mother country. Spain was threatening a descent with her formidable armada, and England was alive with preparations to meet the shock. Raleigh and Grenville entered with enthusiasm into the interests of their country and were no longer in a state to furnish aid for a distant colony. Not until April 22, 1588, could they prepare two small barks for a voyage to Virginia, and these, drawn away by their eager thirst for Spanish prizes laden with Mexican gold, wandered from their route and were driven back by superior enemies to their original ports. Yielding to his disappointment and mortification at these repeated disasters, and exhausted in money by his enormous outlays, Raleigh no longer hoped for success from his own exertions. Forty thousand pounds had been expended, and no return had been made. On March 7, 1589, he assigned his patent to Thomas Smith, Richard Hacklut, and others, who had the means and the experience of merchants, or, rather, he extended to them the rights enjoyed under his patent and exercised by him in giving the charter for the city of Raleigh. With this assignment, he gave 100 pounds for the propagation of Christian principles among the savages of Virginia. But the energetic soul of Raleigh no longer ruled, and doubtful zeal impelled the assignees. Not until March 1590 could Governor White obtain three ships for his purposes, and though their names might have incited him by the motives both of earthly hope and religious trust, yet he preferred an avaricious cruise among the West India Isles to a speed which might, peradventure, have preserved the life of his daughter. He arrived at Hatteras August 15th, and sought the settlers left there three years before. The curling smoke of grass and trees in flame gave them encouragement, but they sought in vain their long-neglected friends. On the bark of a tree was found the word Croatan, legibly inscribed and white-hoped from the absence of the cross, which he himself had suggested as a sign of distress, that the settlers were still in being. 
but as they proceeded to Croatan, a furious storm arose and drove them from the coast, and their dismayed spirits could find no relief except in a return to England. No lingering trace has ever marked the fate of this unhappy colony. The generous Raleigh, in vain, sent five successive messengers to seek and save. They were gone, and whither no tongue was left to tell. Modern ingenuity may be indulged in the forlorn suggestion that they were amalgamated among their savage neighbors, but sober thought will rather fear that they perished under the mingled weight of famine, of disappointed hope, and of Indian barbarity. End of section 24《Section 25 of the Great Events by Famous Historians, Volume 10. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Caveat. The Great Events by Famous Historians, Volume 10, by Charles F. Horne, Rossiter Johnson, and John Rudd. Section 25. Drake Captures Cartagena. He singes the king of Spain's beard at Cadiz, A.D. 1586 to 1587. Julian Corbett Sir Francis Drake, born in Devonshire about 1540, died in 1596, greatest of the Elizabethan seamen, has been the subject of perhaps equal praise and blame at the hands of the world's historians. So famous were his exploits, and so scanty the actual knowledge of them in his own time, that he was not dead before his life became a fairy tale. But history has distinguished fact from legend in the life of this naval hero, whose undisputed achievements have kept his name conspicuous among his country's foremost sea fighters. He began his career in the coasting trade, sailed with Sir John Hawkins in 1567, and three years later began privateering operations against the Spaniards in the New World, by way of making good the losses which they had inflicted upon him. These depredations on Spanish possessions were continued through many years, with occasional attacks upon the coast of Spain itself. By Spanish historians, says an English writer, these hostilities are represented as unprovoked in their origin, and as barbarous in their execution, and candour must allow that there is but too much justice in the complaint. Whether justifiable or not, these aggressive acts of Drake had much to do with the desire for revenge upon England, which led Philip II to prepare for a great invasion of that country. Drake, on his return in 1580, from the first English circumnavigation of the globe, was knighted by Queen Elizabeth. She now gave him important commands, and from this period, at least, his career may be regarded in connection with the regular service of his sovereign. In the autumn of 1585, Drake sailed with 25 ships against the Spanish main, harrying the coasts of the West Indies and of northern South America. Cartagena, which he captured in 1586, was the chief port and stronghold of New Granada, now Colombia. By this feat, as also by his singeing of the beard of the Spanish king at Cadiz next year, he assailed with telling effect the power with which England was at once to be brought into more serious conflict. The mill of Philip's purpose went grinding on relentlessly. He invited a large fleet of English corn ships to the relief of his famine-stricken provinces, and then, as they lay unsuspecting in his ports, he seized them, every one. Never once was the growing armada out of his mind. This atrocious outrage was but to feed his monster, and swift and sharp was the retribution it earned. It was in the last days of May, and ere June was out, far and near the seas were swarming with English privateers, and the dragon was unchained. Fortified with the letters of Mark to release the embargoed vessels, Drake hoisted his flag at Plymouth on the Elizabeth Bonaventura, and there, by the end of July, in all jollity and with all help and furtherance himself could wish, a formidable fleet gathered around him. Frobisher was his vice-admiral, Francis Knollys, his rear admiral, and Thomas Fenner, his flag captain. Christopher Carlyle was there too as lieutenant general with a full staff and ten companies under him. No such privateering squadron had ever been seen before. It consisted of two battleships and eighteen cruisers, with a complement of storeships and pinnaces. It was manned with a force of soldiers and sailors to the number of 2,300, and it is not surprising that constant difficulties delayed its departure. Yet delay was dangerous in the extreme. The Spanish party had again taken heart and were whispering caution in the Queen's ear. Even Burley grew nervous 
that she would repent, but at last he got sailing orders sent off, and with a sigh of relief entered in his diary that Drake had gone. To his horror came back a letter from the Admiral, still dated from Plymouth, instead of from Finisterre, as he had hoped, and he set down a warning to urge the immediate departure of the fleet. August wore away, and the equipment was still incomplete, when Drake, who was now in constant dread of a countermand, was alarmed by Sir Philip Sidney suddenly appearing at Plymouth, and announced his intention of accompanying the expedition. Determined to have no more to do with courtiers and amateur soldiers, he secretly sent off a courier to betray the truant's escapade to the court. He must even be suspected in his desperation, of having set men in wait to intercept and destroy any orders that were not to his liking. The precaution was not necessary. Sidney was peremptorily stopped, and ere any letter came to stay Drake too, the wind had shifted northerly, and all unready as he was, he cleared for Finisterre. There he arrived on September the 26th. He was clear away, but that was all. He was short both of water and victuals. There had not even been time to distribute the stores he had, or to issue his general orders to the fleet. He smelt foul weather too, and determined to complete somewhere what he had left undone at Plymouth, he boldly ran in under the lee of the Bayana Islands and Vigo Bay. The old Queen's officers were aghast. Entirely dominated by the prestige of Spain, they believed that nothing could be done against her except by surprise, and they trembled to see their admiral thus recklessly fling his cards upon the table. But he knew what he was doing. As with sagacious bravado he had sprung ashore at Santa Marta and had mocked the Spanish fleet in the Cartagenian harbour, so now before he struck he exulted that his unfleshed host should hear him shout, En garde to the King of Spain, that they should listen while he cried that England cared not for spying traitors, for he had done nothing to conceal, that her fleets meant to sail when and where they would, and Philip might do his worst. It was a stroke of that divine instinct which marked out a hero from among able captains the magic touch of a great leader of men, under which the dead fabric of an army springs into life and feels every fibre tingling with the strong purpose of its heart. Two leagues from the town of Bayona, the fleet anchored and resolved at once to display his whole strength and exercise his men in their duties. Drake ordered out his pinnaces and boats for a reconnaissance in force. His boldness bore immediate fruit. The governor sent off to treat, and by nightfall it was arranged that troops should land and in the morning be allowed to water and collect what victuals they could. But at midnight, a threatened storm rolled up. The troops were hurriedly re-embarked, and barely in time to escape disaster, the flotilla regained the ships. For three days the gale continued, threatening the whole fleet with destruction, till it could be got safely up above Vigo. There the whole of the boats in which the panic-stricken inhabitants had embarked, their property, were captured, and, though by this time the governor of Bayona had arrived with a considerable force, he was compelled to permit Drake to carry out his purpose in peace. By October 8th he was out in the Bayona Road again, waiting for the wind to waft him on his way, and it was reported at the Spanish court that he had gone toward the Indies, and consternation was universal. The Marquis of Santa Cruz, High Admiral of Spain, and the most renowned naval officer in Europe, declared that not only the African islands but the whole Pacific coast, the Spanish main and the West Indies, were at the Corsair's mercy, and told his master that a fleet of 40 must sail instantly equipped for the purpose. But though for another fortnight Drake rode defiantly at the Bayona anchorage, not a limb of Philip's inert machinery could be moved against him, and while the chivalry of Spain chafed under their sovereign's deliberation, the second blow was struck. Madeira was passed by, and the Canaries spared, for Palmer, which Drake intended should revittle him, showed so bold a front that he would not waste time in trying to reduce it. It was on another point that his implacable glance was fixed. Five years ago at Santiago, the chief town of the Cape Verde Islands, young William Hawkins, a personal adherent of Drake's, had been made the victim of some such treachery as his father and captain had suffered together at Veracruz. From that hour it was doomed. In the middle of November the fleet arrived in the road, and the troops landed. Threatened by Carlisle from the heights above the valley where it lies, and from the sea by Drake, without a blow the town was abandoned to its fate. For ten days the island was scoured for plunder and provisions, and ere the month was out, Anchorage was desolate, and Santiago a heap of ashes. Drake's vengeance was complete, and exulting like Gideon in the devastation that marks his course, he led his ships across the Atlantic. Is there a moment in history more tragic than that? For the first time since the ages began, a hostile fleet was passing the ocean, the pioneer of how many more that have gone and are yet to go, the forerunner of how much glory, shame, and misery. What wonder if the curse of God seemed upon it? 
hardly had it lost sight of land when it was stricken with sickness. In a few days some three hundred men were dead, and the numbers of others prostrate and useless, but in unshakable faith and with reverent wonder at the inscrutable will of heaven, Drake never flinched or paused. His only thought was how to check the evil. At Dominica he got fresh provisions from the natives, and refreshed his sick with a few days on shore. At St. Christopher he again halted to spend Christmas and elaborate the details of his next move. The point where Philip was now to feel the weight of his arm was the fair city of Santa Domingo in Hispaniola. It was by far the most serious operation Drake had yet undertaken. Hitherto his exploits had been against places that were little more than struggling settlements, but Santa Domingo was indeed a city, stone-built and walled and flanked with formidable batteries. It was held by a powerful garrison, as Drake learned from a captured frigate, and a naval force had been concentrated in the harbour for its defence. As the oldest town in the Indies, its renown had hitherto secured it from attack, and in Spain it was held at the queen city of the colonial empire. The moral effect of his capture would be profound, and, besides, from Virginia, the governor of Raleigh's new colony, had sent a fabulous report of its wealth. Drake was fully alive to the gravity of the task before him, his dispositions had never been so elaborate, and they evince at least of a touch of that military genius which the strategists of the next century denied him. While the sick were recruiting, he sent forward a squadron to reconnoitre, and if possible to open communications with the maroons who infested the hills. For three days the garrison was thus exhausted with constant alarms, and then on January the 1st, 1586, the whole fleet appeared in the bay. Night fell and as darkness closed the eyes of the harassed garrison, with the fleet all was activity. In boats and pinnaces the troops were being rapidly embarked, and soon Drake in person was piloting the flotilla for the surf-beaten shore. At a point within the bay, but some ten miles from the town, a practical landing-place had been found. Watch houses overlooked it. But watchmen there were none. Drake had got in touch with the Maroons. By his directions a party of them had stolen down from the hills, and as the sentries came out from the city in the evening, swiftly and silently, they had been every one dispatched. Thus, unseen and unmolested, the troops were successfully landed, and then, with pious and cheery farewells to Carlisle, Drake returned to the fleet to prepare the ground for the surprise. In the morning he anchored in the road, ran out his guns, and proceeded to threaten a landing at a point close to that side of the town upon which Carlisle was stealthily approaching in two parallel columns. As the Spaniards saw the fleet preparing the advance of the boats and pinnaces, the whole of the horse and a large force of foot marched out of the town to oppose the threatened attack, and took up the position fronting the sea, with their left resting on the town and the other flank exposed in the line of Carlisle's advance. It was exactly what had been foreseen, and ere the Spaniards had discovered that the movement from the fleet was a, merely a feint, the horse which were covering their exposed flank were flying before Carlisle's musketeers. The surprise was complete. Taken in the flank by Carlisle and threatened by the rear, by his second column under Powell, the chief of staff, the infantry could make no real resistance, and so rapidly was the English advance pushed home that the struggling mass of friend and foe entered pell-mell through the open gates of the town. For an hour, alarms of drums and trumpet winging confusedly with the sounds of street fighting reached the listening fleet as the two columns forced their way to meet upon the plaza. But how they fared none could tell, till, on a tower, a white staff suddenly appeared, and in another moment the cross of St. George fluttered gaily out upon the breeze. With a roar of triumphs, the ship's guns saluted the signal of victory. The town was won. Though the garrison fled panic-stricken across the river on the far side of the city, and the citadel was evacuated in the night, the place was far too large to be occupied by the force at Drake's command. Following, therefore, the same tactics that had been successful in Nombre de Dios, he ordered the troops to entrench themselves in the plaza, and to occupy the principal batteries. In this way he held the city for a month. The plunder was disappointing. The city was already a hundred years old, and its day was done, for the reckless native policy of the colonists had almost ruined the island. It remained but to treat for a ransom. The governor at once declared himself unable to meet the extravagant demands of the English admiral. And in order to bring him to terms, Drake began to burn the town piecemeal. But so well was it built that little harm could be done and every day his impatience increased. Once, in the course of negotiations, he sent a boy with a flag of truce to the Spanish camp. A Spaniard, meeting the lad, so ill-treated him that he could barely crawl back to die at the Admiral's feet. Then all the fury of Drake's nature burst forth. 
two friars who were among the prisoners were immediately sent ashore and hanged by the provost marshal on the scene of the crime. Another was dispatched to the Spanish camp to declare that two more would be executed every morning until the offender was brought down and hanged on the spot by his own authorities. In hasty alarm, the demand was complied with, and then the international dinners and the negotiations went more smoothly. Convinced at last of the poverty of the colony, Drake accepted a ransom of 25,000 ducats, the sum which is equal to about 50,000 pounds of our money, though little enough to satisfy the shareholders, was very serious for the enemy. For besides this loss, the town had been stripped of everything worth carrying away by the troops and seamen. 240 guns were taken on board the English ships, and not only were they thoroughly refurnished from the Spanish stores, but for a month the whole expedition had lived in free quarters at the enemy's expense. The entire fleet which lay in the harbour fell into Drake's hands, and with the exception of four of the finest galleons was given to the flames. Besides the vessels which the Spaniards themselves had scuttled, two galleys with their tenders, fifteen frigates, and a galleon were thus destroyed, and hundreds of galley slaves set free. It was such a cooling to King Philip, said one in Europe, as the news leaked out, as never happened to him since he was King of Spain. But as yet, Drake was far from done. In the middle of February, with his force recruited by the English prisoners he had freed, and with a troop of attendant prizes laden with his spoil, in undiminished strength he appeared before Cartagena. No city in America was more difficult of approach, but the memories of the old hard days were still green, when storm-beaten, drenched and chilled without food or shelter, he had ridden in the harbour day after day, in spite of all the Spaniards could do, and he knew it all like a pilot. The city was built close to the shore, fronting west, and directly from its southern face an inlet of the sea stretched many leagues southward along the coast, forming a large lagoon. The long spit of land which separated this sheet of water from the sea was pierced by two natural channels. At the far end was the dangerous Boca Chica, and some three miles from the city was a larger entrance known as the Boca Grande. Between this entrance and the town a tongue of land ran out at right angles from the spit to the opposite shore, forming an inner harbour, and barring all approach to a city from the outer part of the lagoon, except by a narrow channel which lay under the guns of a powerful fort on the mainland. On its northern and eastern faces the city was encircled by a broad creek, which ran round it, from the inner harbour to the sea, in such a way as to form a wide natural moat, rendering the city unapproachable from the mainland, except by a bridge. This bridge was also commanded by the harbour fort, nor were land operations possible at any other point except from that part of the spit, which lay between the city and the Boca Grande. So finally, however, did this narrow down before the city, could be reached, that between the inner harbour and the sea it was but fifty paces wide. And here the Spaniards had time to prepare defences that looked impregnable. From shore to shore a formidable entrenchment completely barred the way, and not only was its front so staked and encumbered as to render a night attack impossible, but its approaches were swept by the guns and small arms of a great galleys, and two galleys which lay in the inner harbour. To a man so tender as Drake ever was, for the lives of his men and the safety of his ships, to attack such a place might well have appeared a plus. But the originality of the amphibious corsair had once decried a hole which had escaped all the science of the Spanish martialists. Instead of entering by the Boca Grande, with consummate skill and daring, he piloted the whole fleet through the dangerous channel at the extreme end of the lagoon. The only impression which so hazardous a movement could create in the minds of the Spaniards was that he was about to repeat his Santo Domingo operations and land his troops there to attack from the mainland. Such an impression must have been confirmed as, moving up the lagoon, he anchored opposite the Boca Grande and threatened the harbour fort with his boats. But Drake's project was far different. Instead of being landed on the mainland, Carlyle with his eight companies were quietly slipped ashore in the Boca Grande with instructions to make his way diagonally through the woods that covered the spit till he reached the seashore and then, instead of advancing on the front of the entrenchments, to wade along the wash of the surf till he was within striking distance of the Spanish position. Meanwhile, Frobisher advanced with the flotilla against the harbour fort, and as soon as Carlyle was heard in contact with the enemy's pickets, he opened fire. The boat attack was repulsed. Indeed, it may only have been intended as what soldiers then called a hot alarm. But Carlyle was completely successful. By the march of the surf, he had not only evaded the obstacle which the enemy had so carefully prepared, but he had been then covered from the fire of the galleys in the harbour and had never so much as entered the fire area of the heavily armed entrenchments. After a desperate struggle, at push of pike, the position was carried by assault, 
and once more so hotly was the advantage pursued that in one rush the whole town was captured. The garrison fled across the bridge to the hills, and the next day, when Drake brought up a fleet to bear upon the fort, that also was evacuated. No success was ever better earned and few more richly rewarded. Cartagena was the capital of the Spanish main, and though much younger than Santo Domingo, it was far wealthier. It yielded rich loot for the men and for his shareholders. Drake, after a long negotiation, succeeded in exacting a ransom of a 110,000 ducats, besides what he got from an adjacent monastery. Though to all this plunder Drake could add the consolation that he had destroyed the galleys and shipping which crowded the port, and blown up the harbour fort which the Spaniards had forgotten to include in the convention. He was still unsatisfied. Well knowing that by an advance up the Chagres River in his boats, Panama lay at his mercy, he was resolved with its capture to crown the campaign, but as he lay in Cartagena, the sickness, which had never really ceased, broke out again with new virulence and made such havoc with its force that he had reluctantly to confess that Panama must wait. To capture it with the crippled means at his command was impossible, and the only question was whether Cartagena should be held till he could return with reinforcements. The soldiers declared themselves ready to undertake the task, but in a full council of war it was finally decided that no strategical advantage could be gained at all proportional to the risk that would be run in further weakening the fleet. And on the last day of March the signal to make sail home was flying from the Elizabeth Bonaventure. So severely, however, did they suffer from the weather and want of water that it was nearly two months before they reached the coast of Florida. Still, Drake found time and energy to destroy and plunder the Spanish settlement of St. Augustine and relieve Raleigh's exhausted colony in Virginia. With the remnants of the settlers on board, he weighed for England, and on the 28th of July, 1586, he was writing from Plymouth to Lord Burley, laconically reporting his return, and apologising for having missed the plate fleet by only twelve hours' sail. The reason best known to God, he declared that all his fleet were ready at once to strike again in any direction the Queen might be pleased to indicate. There is a very great gap opened, said Drake in his letter to Burley, very little to the liking of the King of Spain. That, with the calm request for orders, was his comment on a feat which changed the destinies of Europe. At its fullest flood, he had stemmed the tide of the Spanish Empire. It was no less a thing than that. A few months ago, all Europe had been cowering in confused alarm before the shadow of a new Roman Empire. Ever since the first triumph of Luther, the cause of Reformation had been steadily losing ground on England, and the Low Countries hung its only hope. And with the fall of Antwerp, Europe saw itself on the eve of the last great battle in the West, which must decide its fate for centuries. In despair of the result, each trembling power was trying to hide behind the other. Each was thrusting its neighbour forward to break the coming blow, and Philip led the cheating till his hour did, should come. He was bent on crushing Elizabeth, and then, with one foot on the ruins of her kingdom, he meant to step down his rebellious Netherlands into the gloomy Catholicism in which his own dark soul was sunk. As the fruit of his splendid deliberation ripened, he strove to cheat Elizabeth into inactivity by hope that the peace might yet be purchased by the betrayal of the Netherlands. Then in laughing gusts came over the Atlantic the rumours of his exploits, till the full gale they heralded swept over Europe, whirling into oblivion a hundred intrigues and bending the prestige of Spain like a reed. The limitless possibilities of the newborn naval warfare had been demonstrated, and the lesson startled Europe like a revelation. An unmeasured force was added to statecraft, and a new power had arisen. The effect was immediate. Men saw the fountain of Spanish trade at England's mercy. They knew how narrowly the plate fleet had escaped, and a panic palsied Philip's finance. The Bank of Seville broke. That of Venice was in despair. And the King of Spain, pointed at as a bankrupt, failed to raise a loan of half a million ducats. Palmer was appalled. With his brilliant capture of Antwerp, he had seen himself on the brink of that great exploit with which he hoped to crown his career, and now, instead of a host armed at all points for the invasion of England, he saw around him a broken army. It was impossible to supply. In Germany, the Protestant princes raised their heads, and seeing dawn at last, began to shake off the lethargy into which despair had plunged them. England was wild with joy. Burley himself was almost startled from his caution, and cried out with half a shudder that Drake was a fearful man to the King of Spain. End of section 25Section 26 of The Great Events by Famous Historians, Volume 10. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org.
LibriVox.org. Read by Caveat. The Great Events by Famous Historians, Volume 10, by Charles F. Horn, Rossiter Johnson, and John Rudd. Section 26. Drake captures Cartagena. He singes the King of Spain's beard at Cadiz, A.D. 1586 to 1587. Julian Corbett. Part 2. For two years Philip had been at work upon his armada. His ports were crowded with its details, his storehouses were bursting with its furniture, and Walsingham at last was able to convince the Queen, by a paper stolen from the very closet of the Pope, that it was upon her head the great engine was to crash. Her eyes were opened, and infected for a moment with the warlike spirit into which her people and her Parliament had lashed themselves. She ordered Drake in 1587 to the coast of Spain. It was no longer as a privateer that he was to act. He held the rank of Her Majesty's Admiral at the Seas, and William Burra, the Comptroller of the Navy, was his Vice Admiral. Four of the Queen's largest battleships and two of her pinnaces were under his command, and the London merchants committed to his flag ten fine cruisers, with the famous Merchant Royal at their head. Besides these, he had six hundred tons of his own shipping, as well as some of the Lord Admirals. In all exclusive of tenders, there were twenty-three sail, five battleships, two first-class cruisers, seven of the second class, and nine gunboats, large and small. With this fine force, he was instructed to proceed to Cape St. Vincent, and by every means in his power to prevent the concentration of the several divisions of the Armada by cutting off their victuallers, and even destroying them in the ports where they lay. If the enemy sailed for England or Ireland, he was to hang on their skirts, cut off stragglers, and prevent a landing, and finally he was given a free hand to act against the East and West India convoys. Elizabeth was in a resolute mood. Drake's ideas of naval warfare were developing a step further, and the Queen for a moment listened. He was beginning dimly to grasp that the command of the sea was the first object for a naval power to aim at. It was because he had not command of the seas that he had been unable to retain his hold of Cartagena, for the troops which should have normally formed its garrison were wanted to defend his fleet. Wiser for the lesson, his aim was now to crush the Spanish navy, and then, in undisputed control of the sea, to gather in his harvest. The opposition were thoroughly alarmed, and, while Drake in hot haste was driving on his preparations, they left no stone unturned to get his orders modified. They tampered with his men, they whispered slanders into his mistress's ear, they frightened her with threats from abroad, they tempted her with offers of peace from Palmer on the old disgraceful terms. For Walsingham, though, through thick and thin, was always at Drake's back. It was an unequal fight, the staunches of his party in disgrace for Mary's premature execution, he was single-handed against a host, and at last the friends of Spain prevailed. Early in April the messengers sped down to Plymouth, with orders that operations were to be confined to the high seas. As Philip's ships were all snug in port, and could well remain there, as long as Drake's stores allowed him to keep to sea, it was a complete triumph for Spain. When the messenger dashed into Plymouth with the fatal packet, he found the roadstead empty. Drake was gone. In vain, at the last moment, a number of his sailors had been induced to desert. He had filled their places with soldiers. In vain, a swift pinnace was dispatched in pursuit. Drake had taken care no orders should catch him, and with his squadron increased by two warships from Lyme, was already off Finisterre, battling with a gale which drove the pinnace home. For seven days it raged and forced the fleet far out to sea. Still Drake held on in its teeth, and so well had his ships in hand that on the 16th, within twenty-four hours after the gain had blown itself out, the whole fleet, in perfect order, was sailing gaily eastward, past Cape St. Vincent. Eastward, for he had intelligence that Cadiz Harbour was full of transports and storeships, and on the afternoon of the 19th, as he entered the bay, he saw a forest of masts in the road behind the city. A council of war was summoned at once, and without asking their opinion, he quietly told them he was going to attack. It was his usual manner of holding a council, but it took Burra's breath away. It shocked the old Queen's officer, an outrageous sense of what was due to his own reputation and experience, and the time-honoured customs of war. He wanted to talk about it, and think about it, and find out first whether it was too dangerous. And there was certainly some excuse for his caution. Cadiz stands on a precipitous rock at the end of a low and narrow neck of land some five miles in length, running parallel to the coast. Within this natural breakwater are enclosed an outer and inner port, and so cumbered with shoals and rocks was the entrance from the sea that no ship could get in without passing under the guns of the town's batteries, while access from the outer to the inner port was only to be gained by the Puntal Passage, half a mile wide. 
Opposite Cadiz, on the other side of the outer harbour, was Port St Mary, and within the Puntal Channel, at the extreme end of the inlet, stood Port Royal. Both places, however, were so protected by shoals as to be unapproachable, except to the port pilots. It was an ideal scene of action for galleys to develop their full capabilities. Two had already appeared to reconnoitre, and how many more there were no one could tell. Galleys, it must be remembered, were then considered the most formidable warships afloat, and quite invincible in confined waters or calms. By all the rules of war, on which Burrow was the first authority in the service, to attack was suicide. But Drake had spent his life in breaking rules. He did not care. The enemy was there, his authority was in his pocket, the wind was fair, his officers believed in him, and as the sun sank low behind them, the fleet went in. A scene of terror and confusion followed. Every ship in the harbour cut its cables and sought safety in flight, some to sea, some across the bay to St Mary's, some through the Pontal Passage, the inner harbour and Port Royal. To cover the stampede, ten galleys came confidently out from under the Cadiz batteries. All was useless. While the chartered cruisers swooped on the fugitives, the Queen's ships stood in, to head off the advancing galleys, as coolly as though they had fought them a hundred times before. In a few minutes, the English Admiral had taught the world a new lesson in tactics. Galleys could only fire straight ahead, and as they came on line abreast, Drake, passing with the Queen's four battleships athwart their course, poured in his heavy broadsides. Never before had such gunnery been seen. Ere the galleys were within effective a range of their own ordnance, they were raked and riddled and confounded, and to the consternation of the Spaniards, they broke for the cover of the batteries. Two had to be hauled up to prevent them sinking. The rest were shambles, and nothing now thought of but how to protect the city from the assault, which seemed inevitable. Hardly any troops were there. A panic seized the population, and Drake was left alone to do the work for which he had come. Beyond the batteries, the fleet anchored with its prizes, plundering and scuttling with all its might, till the flood came in again. Then all that remained were fired, and by the flare of the blazing hulks, as they drifted clear with the tide, Drake moved the fleet into the mouth of the Puntal Channel, out of the range of the batteries. He himself took a position seaward of the new anchorage to engage the guns which the Spaniards were bringing down from the town and to keep off the galleys, for as yet the work was but half done. In the inner harbour lay the splendid galleon of the Marquesa de Santa Cruz, and a crowd of great ships too big to seek the refuge of the shoals about Port Royal. And at daylight, the Merchant Royal went boldly in with all the tenders in company. Then, in spite of the labours of the past night, the plundering, scuttling and burning began again. Outside, the galleys were making half-hearted demonstrations against the English anchorage, but they were easily kept at bay. By noon, it was all over, and Drake attempted to make sail, in the past thirty-six hours he had entirely revittled his fleet with wine, oil, biscuit and dried fruits. He had destroyed some twelve thousand tons of shipping, including some of the finest vessels afloat, and four ships laden with provisions were in possession of his prize crews. It was enough, and more than enough, but the wind would not serve, and all day long he lay where he was in sight of the troops that were now pouring along the isthmus into Cadiz. Again and again the galleys attempted to approach, and every time Drake's broadside swept them back before they reached their effective range. Vainly, too, the Spaniards strove to post guns near enough to annoy the fleet. Nor did the struggle cease till at midnight. A land wind sprang up, and, and brushing away his path, the galleys that sought to block the way. Drake made sail. By two o'clock he had cleared the batteries, and was safe outside without losing a single man. Boldly enough, then the galleys gave chase, but unfortunately the wind suddenly shifted completely round, Drake at once went about, and the galleys fled in most undignified haste, leaving the English fleet to complete its triumph by anchoring unmolested in full view of the town. Such an exploit was without precedent. The chivalry of Spain was as enthusiastic in its admiration of Drake's feat of arms as it was disgusted at the cumbrous organisation which condemned it to inactivity. A whole day Drake waited where he was to try and exchange his prisoners for English galley slaves, but getting nothing but high compliments and dilatory answers for his pains, on the morrow he sailed. There was no time to lose. By his captures, he had discovered the whole of Philip's plan. Out of the Mediterranean, the divisions of Italy, Sicily and Andalusia were to come and join the headquarters at Lisbon, where the Grand Admiral of Spain, the Marquesa de Santa Cruz, was busy with the bulk of the Armada. At Cape St. Vincent was the road where ships coming out of the Straits waited for a wind to carry them north and there he had resolved to take his stand, 
and fight everything that attempted to join Santa Cruz's flag in the Tagus. Such light airs prevailed that it was not until the end of the month that the fleet reached the road. By that time, its water was exhausted and every headland was crowned with works commanding the anchorage and the watering places. Drake at once saw he must take them. In his usual offhand way, he summoned his council and told them over the dinner table what he was going to do. It was more than the Vice Admiralty's dignity and caution could endure. In high dudgeon, he returned to his ship and in the midst of a gale which suddenly arose and drove the fleet to the north of the Cape, he indicted a long, solemn protest, not only against the contemplated operation, but against the unprecedented despotism with which Drake was conducting the whole expedition. Burra, though no doubt jealous of Drake, certainly believed he was doing nothing beyond his right and duty. He felt he had been attached to the expedition as the most complete sailor in the kingdom, and he valued and deserved his reputation. In the scientific knowledge of his art, he was unrivaled, and he was the only officer in the service who had fought and won a purely naval action. No one, therefore, can fairly blame him for resenting the revolutionary manner in which his commander was ignoring him in contempt of the time-honoured privileges of the Council of War. Drake, in his hot self-confidence, thought otherwise. As he rolled out the gale under the lee of St. Vincent, and the tempest howled through his rigging, once more there fell upon him the shadow of the tragedy which would never cease to darken his judgment. Already in Cadiz Harbour, he had thought his vice admiral too careful of his ship when the shot were flying, and now he saw him in another doughty sent by the friends of Spain to hang on his arm. In persisting, he told Lord Burley, he committed a double offence, not only against me, but it touches further. To his embittered sense, the querulous protest was a treasonable attack on his own authority, and in his fury he brutally dismissed the old admiral from his command and placed him under arrest on his flagship. In vain, the astonished veteran protested his innocence, apologised and made submission. Drake would not listen. The ring of the headsman's sword upon the desolate shores of Patagonia had deafened his ears to such entreaties forever. Two days later, he was back in Lagos Bay, landing a thousand men for an attempt upon the town. But in the evening, after vainly endeavouring to induce the bodies of cavalry which hovered on their line of march to come within reach, the troops re-embarked, reporting the place to be too strong to be taken by assault. Such reports were not to Drake's liking. It was no mere cross-raiding on which he was bent, but a sagacious stroke that was essential to the development of his new ideas. To get the command of the seas, it was necessary he should be able to keep the seas, and for this a safe anchorage and watering places were necessary. In default of Lagos, strategy and convenience both indicated St. Vincent Road for his purpose. It was commanded by forts, but that did not deter him, and he resolved to have his way, the next day landed in person near Cape Sagres. On the summit of the headland was a castle, accessible on two sides only. The English military officers declared that a hundred determined men could hold it against the hold of Drake's force. But he would not listen. It commanded the watering place, and he meant to have it. Detaching part of his force against a neighbouring fort, which was at once evacuated, he advanced against the castle, and at the summit of the cliff found himself confronted with walls thirty feet high, bristling with brass guns and crowded with soldiers. Garrison had just been reinforced by that of the evacuated fort, and to everyone but the Admiral the affair was hopeless. He attacked with his musketeers, and, when they had exhausted their ammunition, in the name of his queen and mistress he summoned the place to surrender. In the name of his lord and master the Spanish captain laughed at him, whereupon Drake, more obstinate than ever, sent down to the fleet for faggots, and began piling them against the outer gate to fire it. So desperate was the resistance that time and again the attempt failed. For two hours the struggle lasted. As fast as the defenders threw down the fire, the English piled it up again, and in the midst of the smoke and the bullets, the Admiral toiled like a common seaman, with his arm full of fragments, his face black with soot. How long his obstinacy would have continued it is impossible to say, but at the end of the two hours the Spanish commandant sank under his wounds, and the garrison surrendered. Daunted by a feat which everyone regarded as little short of a miracle, the castle and the monastery of St. Vincent together with another fort near it, capitulated at the magician's first summons, and left him in complete possession of the anchorage to water the fleet undisturbed. Having fired the captured strongholds and tumbled their guns over the cliffs into the sea, Drake returned to the fleet to find that the sailors had not been idle. Between St. Vincent and a village some nine miles to the eastward, which they had been ordered to burn, they had taken forty-seven barks and caravels, laden with stores for the armada and destroyed between fifty and sixty fishing boats with miles of nets. The tunny fishery, on which the whole of the adjacent country chiefly depended for its subsistence, 
was annihilated. For the time, Drake's work on the Algarve coast was done, and having watered the fleet and fished up the captured guns, he sailed for Lisbon. His own idea had been to land there and smite Philip's preparations at its heart, but this the government had expressly forbidden, still he hoped that the havoc he had made and the insults he had put on the Spanish coasts might go to Santa Cruz to come out and fight him. For the three days he lay off Cascais in sight of Lisbon, threatening an attack and sending polished taunts to the Spanish admiral. He offered to convey them to England if his course lay that way. He took prizes under his very nose with his fleet in loose order. He sailed up to the very entrance of the harbour, but, though seven galleys lay on their oars watching him from the mouth of the Tagus, Santa Cruz would not move, and Drake learned at last how deep was the wound he had inflicted. Philip's organisation was now completely dislocated. The fleet at Lisbon was unmanned. Its crews had been shattered in Cadiz Harbour, and the troops that were intended for it had been thrown into the defenceless city under the Duke of Medina Sedona, with orders that while Drake was on the coast not a man was to be moved. All thought of an attack on England was given up. It was even doubted whether by straining every nerve it would be possible to save the homeward-bound fleets from the Indies. The Italian squadrons were ordered to land their troops at Cartagena, and Philip hoped that by forced marches across the peninsula they might possibly arrive in time for Santa Cruz to sail before it was too late. Everyone else looked on the convoys as doomed, but Drake, having assured himself that Santa Cruz could not stir, and that England was safe for a year at least, resolved to make for the Azores and wait for the prey that had so narrowly escaped him the year before. On the third day of his stay off the Tagus, he took advantage of a northerly gale to run for the anchorage at St Vincent, which he had made his own, and where he intended to water and refresh for the voyage. There, huddled under the lee of the Cape, was found a fresh crowd of store ships which he seized. For nine days he lay there, rummaging the ships, taking in water, sending the men ashore in batches to shake off the sickness with which, as usual, the fleet was attacked. Every day new prizes fell into his hands, and ere he sailed he had taken and destroyed forty more vessels and a hundred small craft. On May the 22nd he put to sea, and as the news spread a panic seized every commercial centre in the Spanish dominions. Half the merchants in Philip's empire saw ruin before them. The whole year's produce, both of the East and West India trade, was at Drake's mercy, and no one knew how Spain, with its resources already strained to the utmost, would survive the shock. Whatever might have been the result of these fears had been realised. Destiny seemed to have decided that in the Channel should be played the last great scene. Drake had not been two days out when a storm struck his fleet and scattered it over the face of the sea. For three days it raged with extraordinary fury. Drake's own flagship was in dire peril, and when the heavens cleared, only three of the battleships and half a dozen smaller craft were together. Not a single merchant ship was to be seen, and the Lion, Burroughs' flagship on which he was still a prisoner, was missing too. Before leaving St Vincent, Drake had told Walsingham that he ought to have had at least six more cruisers to do his work properly, and now two-thirds of what he had had before were gone. Still he held on, hoping to find some of the missing ships at the rendezvous in the Azores. On the morning of June the 8th, St Michael's was sighted, but not a sail had rejoined the flag except the spy, one of the Queen's gunboats, with the captain and master of the Lion on board, and they reported that the crew of the borough ship had mutinied and carried him home. Then, in the depth of his disappointment, Drake's fury blazed out anew. His fierce self-reliance and fanatic patriotism had taught him to see a traitor in every man that opposed him, and the bitter experience of his lifelong struggle against the enemies of his country and his creed could bring him but to one conclusion. Borough was the traitor who had ruined the greatest chance of his career. A jury was impanelled. The deserter tried for his life, found guilty and condemned to death. It was little good except to relieve the Admiral's anger. The splendid opportunity was gone. The fruit of his brilliant exploit was snatched from his lips. For even had the remnant of the fleet been less shattered than it was, the great convoys were beyond its strength. The only hope was to hurry back to England and beg for reinforcements to fight Santa Cruz for the lifeblood of Spain. But ere he sailed there was a consolation at hand. As he lay waiting for his shattered squadron to close up, fuming at traitors and marvelling at the inscrutable will of heaven, the dawn of June the ninth lit up the grey sea and showed him a huge carrack in the offing. On a smart breeze he gave chase. The carrack kept her course, but as Drake drew near, began displaying her colours nervously. Drake made not a sign in reply, but held on till he was within range. Then on a sudden, with a blaze of her ensigns and her broadside, the Elizabeth Bonaventura told the stranger what she was. 
Two of Drake's squadron threw themselves resolutely athwart hawes of the enemy, and the rest, plying her hard with shot, prepared to run aboard her towering hull. But ere they closed, her flag fluttered sadly down, and the famous San Felipe, the king of Spain's own East Indiaman, the largest merchantman afloat, was a prize in Drake's hands. Well might he wonder at God's providence as with lightened heart he sailed homeward with his prize. For not only was it the richest ever seen in England before or since, not only was its cargo valued at over a million of our money, but in it were papers which disclosed to our merchants all the mysteries and richness of the East India trade. It was a revelation to English commerce. It intoxicated the soberest capitalists, and they knew no rest they had formed the great East India Company to widen the gap which Drake had opened and to lay the foundation of our Indian Empire. End of section 26「Section 27 of the Great Events by Famous Historians, Volume 10. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Great Events by Famous Historians, Volume 10, by Charles F. Horn, Rossiter Johnson, and John Rudd. Defeat of the Spanish Armada, A.D. 1588, by Sir Edward Shepherd Creasy, Part 1. Two years after the accession of Queen Elizabeth to the throne of England, the Geneva Confession of Faith, Calvinistic, was adopted by the Scottish nation, which thus formally became Protestant. The aim of Mary, Queen of Scots, to restore the Catholic religion in that kingdom added many complications to her royal task, as well as to her personal fortunes. Her final condemnation and execution, 1587, for conspiracy against Elizabeth occurred at a time when the shadow of Spanish supremacy was being cast broadly over Europe. The Spanish power was still attempting the subjugation of the Netherlands, and it was the ambition of Philip II to bring England also under his own sway and that of Rome. Elizabeth had given aid to Philip's rebellious subjects in the Netherlands, and Sir Francis Drake had committed many depredations upon Spain and her colonies. For the purpose of avenging these acts, as well as the death of Mary Stuart, and of overthrowing the Reformation in Great Britain, Philip gathered up all his strength and prepared to hurl a mighty naval force, the, quote, invincible armada against England. Creasy's masterly survey of the European situation at this period unfolds the Anglo-Spanish complications. His exhaustive account of the Armada and its ill-fated enterprise makes clear everything important in this famous passage of history. On the afternoon of July 19, 1588, a group of English captains was collected at the Bowling Green on the Hoe at Plymouth, whose equals have never before or since been brought together, even at that famous mustering place of the heroes of the British Navy. There was Sir Francis Drake, the first English circumnavigator of the globe, the terror of every Spanish coast in the old world and the new. There was Sir John Hawkins, a rough veteran of many a daring voyage on the African and American seas, and of many a desperate battle. There was Sir Martin Frobisher, one of the earliest explorers of the Arctic seas in search of the Northwest Passage. There was the High Admiral of England, Lord Howard of Effingham, prodigal of many things in his country's cause, and who had recently had the noble daring to refuse to dismantle part of the fleet, though the Queen had sent him orders to do so in consequence of an exaggerated report that the enemy had been driven back and shattered by a storm. Lord Howard, whom contemporary writers describe as being of a wise and noble courage, skillful in sea matters, wary and provident, and of great esteem among the sailors, resolved to risk his sovereign's anger and to keep the ships afloat at his own charge, rather than that England should run the peril of losing their protection. Another of our Elizabethan sea kings, Sir Walter Raleigh, was at that time commissioned to raise and equip the land forces of Cornwall. 
but we may well believe that he must have availed himself of the opportunity of consulting with the Lord Admiral and the other high officers which was offered by the English fleet putting into Plymouth, and we may look on Raleigh as one of the group that was assembled at the Bowling Green on the Hoe. Many other brave men and skillful mariners, besides the chiefs whose names have been mentioned, were there, enjoying, with true sailor-like merriment, their temporary relaxation from duty. In the harbor lay the English fleet, with which they had just returned from a cruise to Karuna, in search of information respecting the real condition and movements of the hostile armada. Lord Howard had ascertained that our enemies, though tempest-tossed, were still formidably strong, and fearing that part of their fleet might make for England in his absence, he had hurried back to the Devonshire coast. He resumed his station at Plymouth and waited there for certain tidings of the Spaniards' approach. A match at Bowles was being played, in which Drake and other high officers of the fleet were engaged, when a small armed vessel was seen running before the wind into Plymouth Harbor with all sails set. Her commander landed in haste and eagerly sought the place where the English Lord Admiral and his captains were standing. His name was Fleming. He was the master of a Scotch privateer, and he told the English officers that he had that morning seen the Spanish Armada off the Cornish coast. At this exciting information, the captains began to hurry down to the water, and there was a shouting for the ship's boats. But Drake coolly checked his comrades and insisted that the match should be played out. He said that there was plenty of time both to win the game and beat the Spaniards. The best and bravest match that ever was scored was resumed accordingly. Drake and his friends aimed their last bowls with the same steady, calculating coolness with which they were about to point their guns. The winning cast was made, and then they went on board and prepared for action. With their hearts as light and their nerves as firm as they had been on the hoe bowling green. Meanwhile, the messengers and signals had been dispatched fast and far through England to warn each town and village that the enemy had come at last. In every seaport there was an instant making ready by land and by sea. In every shire and every city there was instant mustering of horse and man. But England's best defense then, as ever, was in her fleet, and after warping laboriously out of Plymouth Harbor against the wind, the Lord Admiral stood westward under easy sail, keeping an anxious lookout for the Armada, the approach of which was soon announced by Cornish fisher boats and signals from the Cornish cliffs. It is not easy, without some reflection and care, to comprehend the full extent of the peril which England then ran from the power and the ambition of Spain, and to appreciate the importance of that crisis in the history of the world. Queen Elizabeth had found at her accession an encumbered revenue, a divided people, and an unsuccessful foreign war, in which the last remnant of our possessions in France had been lost. She had also a formidable pretender to her crown, whose interests were favored by all the Roman Catholic powers. It is true that during the years of her reign, which had passed away before the attempted invasion of 1588, she had revived the commercial prosperity, the national spirit, and the national loyalty of England. But her resources to cope with the colossal power of Philip II still seemed most scanty, and she had not a single foreign ally, except for the Dutch, who were themselves struggling hard, and, as it seemed hopelessly, to maintain their revolt against Spain. On the other hand, Philip II was absolute master of an empire so superior to the other states of the world in extent, in resources, and especially in military and naval forces, as to make the project of enlarging that empire into a universal monarchy seem a perfectly feasible scheme. And Philip had both the ambition to perform that project and the resolution to devote all his energies and all his means to its realization. The chief European kingdoms were slowly molding themselves out of the feudal chaos, 
and though the wars with each other were numerous and desperate, and several of their respective kings figured for a time as mighty conquerors, none of them in those times acquired the consistency and perfect organization which are requisite for a long-sustained career of aggrandizement. After the consolidation of the great kingdoms, they for some time kept each other in mutual check. During the first half of the 16th century, the balancing system was successfully practiced by European statesmen. But when Philip II reigned, France had become so miserably weak through her civil wars that he had nothing to dread from the rival state, which had so long curbed his father, the Emperor Charles V. In Germany, Italy, and Poland, he had either zealous friends and dependents, or weak and divided enemies. Against the Turks, he had gained great and glorious successes, and he might look round the continent of Europe without discerning a single antagonist of whom he could stand in awe. Spain, when he acceded to the throne, was at the zenith of her power. The hardihood and spirit which the Aragonese, the Castilians, and the other nations of the peninsula had acquired during centuries of free institutions and successful war against the Moors, had not yet become obliterated. Charles V had, indeed, destroyed the liberties of Spain, but that had been done too recently for its full evil to be felt in Philip's time. A people cannot be debased in a single generation and the Spaniards, under Charles V and Philip II, proved the truth of the remark that no nation is ever so formidable to its neighbors, for a time, as a nation which, after being trained up in self-government, passes suddenly under a despotic ruler. The energy of democratic institutions survives for a few generations, and to it are superadded the decision and certainty which are the attributes of government when all its powers are directed by a single mind. It is true that this preternatural vigor is short-lived. National corruption and debasement gradually follow the loss of the national liberties, but there is an interval before their workings are felt, and in that interval the most ambitious schemes of foreign conquest are often successfully undertaken. Philip had also the advantage of finding himself at the head of a large standing army, in a perfect state of discipline and equipment, in an age when, except for some few insignificant corps, standing armies were unknown in Christendom. The renown of the Spanish troops was justly high, and the infantry in particular was considered the best in the world. His fleet, also, was far more numerous and better appointed than that of any other European power, and both his soldiers and his sailors had the confidence in themselves and their commanders which a long career of successful warfare alone can create. Besides the Spanish crown, Philip succeeded to the Kingdom of Naples and Sicily, the Duchy of Milan, Franche Comte, and the Netherlands. In Africa, he possessed Tunis, Oran, the Cape Verde, and the Canary Islands, and in Asia, the Philippine and Sunda Islands and a part of the Moluccas. Beyond the Atlantic, he was lord of the most splendid portions of the New World, which Columbus found, quote, for Castile and Leon, end quote. The empires of Peru and Mexico, New Spain and Chile, with their abundant mines of the precious metals, Española and Cuba, and many other of the American islands were provinces of the sovereign of Spain. Whatever diminution the Spanish Empire might have sustained in the Netherlands seemed to be more than compensated by the acquisition of Portugal, which Philip had completely conquered in 1580. Not only that ancient kingdom itself, but all the fruits of the maritime enterprises of the Portuguese had fallen into Philip's hands. All the Portuguese colonies in America, Africa, and the East Indies acknowledged the sovereignty of the King of Spain, who thus not only united the whole Iberian Peninsula under his single scepter, but had acquired a transmarine empire little inferior in wealth and extent to that which he had inherited 
at his accession. The splendid victory which his fleet, in conjunction with the papal and Venetian galleys, had gained at Lepanto over the Turks, had deservedly exalted the fame of the Spanish marine throughout Christendom, and when Philip had reigned thirty-five years, the vigor of his empire seemed unbroken, and the glory of the Spanish arms had increased, and was increasing, throughout the world. One nation only had been his active, his persevering, and his successful foe. England had encouraged his revolted subjects in Flanders against him, and given them the aid in men and money, without which they must soon have been humbled in the dust. English ships had plundered his colonies, had defied his supremacy in the new world, as well as the old. They had inflicted ignominious defeats on his squadrons. They had captured his cities and burned his arsenals on the very coasts of Spain. The English had made Philip himself the object of personal insult. He was held up to ridicule in their stage plays and masks, and these scoffs at the man had, as is not unusual in such cases, excited the anger of the absolute king even more vehemently than the injuries inflicted on his power. Personal as well as political revenge urged him to attack England. Were she once subdued, the Dutch must submit. France could not cope with him, the empire would not oppose him, and universal dominion seemed sure to be the result of the conquest of that malignant island. There was yet another and a stronger feeling which armed King Philip against England. He was one of the sincerest and one of the sternest bigots of his age. He looked on himself, and was looked on by others, as the appointed champion to extirpate heresy and re-establish the papal power throughout Europe. A powerful reaction against Protestantism had taken place since the commencement of the second half of the 16th century, and he looked on himself as destined to complete it. The Reformed doctrines had been thoroughly rooted out from Italy and Spain. Belgium, which had previously been half-Protestant, had been reconquered both in allegiance and creed by Philip, and had become one of the most Catholic countries in the world. Half Germany had been won back to the old faith. In Savoy, in Switzerland, and many other countries, the progress of the counter-revolution had been rapid and decisive. The Catholic League seemed victorious in France. The papal court itself had shaken off the supineness of recent centuries, and, at the head of the Jesuits and the other new ecclesiastical orders, was displaying a vigor and a boldness worthy of the days of Hildebrand or Innocent III. Throughout continental Europe, the Protestants, discomfited and dismayed, looked to England as their protector and refuge. England was the acknowledged central point of Protestant power and policy. And to conquer England was to stab Protestantism to the very heart. Sixtus V, the then reigning pope, earnestly exhorted Philip to this enterprise. And when the tidings reached Italy and Spain that the Protestant Queen of England had put to death her Catholic prisoner, Mary, Queen of Scots, the fury of the Vatican and Escurial knew no bounds. Elizabeth was denounced as the murderous heretic whose destruction was an instant duty. A formal treaty was concluded in June 1587, by which the Pope bound himself to contribute a million of scudi to the expenses of the war, the money to be paid as soon as the king had actual possession of an English port. Philip, on his part, strained the resources of his vast empire to the utmost. The French Catholic chiefs eagerly cooperated with him, in the seaports of the Mediterranean and along almost the whole coast, from Gibraltar to Jutland, the preparations for the great armament were urged forward with all the earnestness of religious zeal as well as of angry ambition. Quote, Thus, said Ranke, the German historian of the popes, quote, Thus did the united powers of Italy and Spain, from which such mighty influences had gone forth over the whole world, now rouse themselves for an attack upon England. 
the king had already compiled from the archives of Symmachus a statement of the claims which he had to the throne of that country on the extinction of the Stuart line. The most brilliant prospects, especially that of a universal dominion of the seas, were associated in his mind with this enterprise. Everything seemed to conspire to such an end. The predominancy of Catholicism in Germany, the renewed attack upon the Huguenots in France, the attempt upon Geneva, and the enterprise against England. At the same moment, a thoroughly Catholic prince, Sigismund III, ascended the throne of Poland, with the prospect also of future succession to the throne of Sweden. But whatever any principle or power, be it what it may, aims at unlimited supremacy in Europe, some vigorous resistance to it, having its origin in the deepest springs of human nature, invariably arises. Philip II had to encounter newly awakened powers, braced by the vigor of youth and elevated by a sense of their future destiny. The intrepid corsairs who had rendered every sea insecure now clustered round the coasts of their native island. The Protestants, in a body, even the Puritans, although they had been subjected to as severe oppression as the Catholics, rallied round their queen who now gave admirable proof of her masculine courage and her princely talents of winning the affections and leading the minds and preserving the allegiance of men. End quote. Ranke should have added that the English Catholics at this crisis proved themselves as loyal to their queen and true to their country as were the most vehement anti-Catholic zealots in the island. Some few traitors there were, but as a body, the Englishmen who held the ancient faith stood the trial of their patriotism nobly. The Lord Admiral himself was a Catholic, and, to adopt the words of Hallam, quote, Then it was that the Catholics in every country repaired to the standard of the Lord Lieutenant, imploring that they might not be suspected of bartering the national independence for their religion itself, end quote. The Spaniard found no partisans in the country which he assailed, nor did England, self-wounded, quote, lie at the proud foot of her enemy, end quote. For upward of a year, the Spanish preparations had been actively and unremittingly urged forward. Negotiations were, during this time, carried on at Ostend in which various pretexts were assigned by the Spanish commissioners for the gathering together of such huge masses of shipping and such equipments of troops in all the seaports which their master ruled. But Philip himself took little care to disguise his intentions. Nor could Elizabeth and her able ministers doubt but that this island was the real object of the Spanish armament. The peril that was wisely foreseen was resolutely provided for. Circular letters from the Queen were sent round to the Lord Lieutenants of the several counties requiring them to, quote, call together the best sort of gentlemen under their lieutenancy and to declare unto them these great preparations and arrogant threatenings now burst forth in action upon the seas, wherein every man's particular state in the highest degree could be touched in respect of country, liberty, wives, children, lands, lives, and, which was specially to be regarded, the profession of the true and sincere religion of Christ, and to lay before them the infinite and unspeakable miseries that would fall out upon any such change, which miseries were evidently seen by the fruits of that hard and cruel government holden in countries not far distant. Quote, we do look, close quote, said the queen, quote, that the most part of them should have, upon this instant extraordinary occasion, a larger proportion of furniture, both for horsemen and footmen, but especially horsemen, than hath been certified thereby to be in their best strength against any attempt, or to be employed about our own person or otherwise. Hereunto, as we doubt not, but by your good endeavors they will be the rather conformable, 
so also we assure ourselves that Almighty God will so bless these, their loyal hearts, born towards us, their loving sovereign, and their natural country, that all the attempts of any enemy whatsoever shall be made void and frustrate, to their confusion, your comfort, and to God's high glory. End quote. Letters of a similar kind were also sent by the council to each of the nobility and to the great cities. The primate called on the clergy for their contributions, and by every class of the community the appeal was responded to with liberal zeal, that offered more even than the queen required. The boasting threats of the Spaniards had roused the spirit of the nation, and the whole people, quote, were thoroughly irritated to stir up their whole forces for their defense against such prognosticated conquests, so that, in a very short time, all her whole realm and every corner were furnished with armed men on horseback and on foot, and those continually trained, exercised, and put into bands in warlike manner, as in no age ever was before in this realm." There was no sparing of money to provide horse, armor, weapons, powder, and all necessaries. No, nor want of provision of pioneers, carriages, and victuals in every county of the realm, without exception, to attend upon the armies. And to this general furniture every man voluntarily offered, very many their services personally, without wages, others money for armor and weapons, and to wage soldiers. A matter strange, and never the like heard of in this realm or elsewhere. And this general reason moved all men to large contributions, that when a conquest was to be withstood wherein all should be lost, it was no time to spare a portion. Our lion-hearted queen showed herself worthy of such a people. A camp was formed at Tilbury, and there Elizabeth rode through the ranks, encouraging her captains and her soldiers by her presence and her words. One of the speeches which she addressed to them during this crisis has been preserved, and, though often quoted, it must not be omitted here. Quote, My loving people, end quote, she said, quote, We have been persuaded by some that are careful of our safety, to take heed how we commit ourselves to armed multitudes, for fear of treachery. But I assure you, I do not desire to live to distrust my faithful and loving people. Let tyrants fear. I have always so behaved myself that, under God, I have placed my chiefest strength and safeguard in the loyal hearts and good will of my subjects. And therefore, I am come among you, as you see, at this time, not for my recreation and disport, but being resolved in the midst and heat of the battle to live or die among you all, to lay down for my God, for my kingdom, and for my people, my honor and my blood even in the dust. I know I have the body, but of a weak and feeble woman, but I have the heart and stomach of a king, and of a king of England, too, and I think it foul scorn that Parma, of Spain, or any prince of Europe, should dare to invade the borders of my realm, to which, rather than any dishonor shall grow by me, I myself will take up arms." I myself will be your general, judge, and rewarder of every one of your virtues in the field. I know already, for your forwardness, you have deserved rewards and crowns, and we do assure you, on the word of a prince, they shall be duly paid you. In the meantime, my lieutenant general shall be in my stead, than whom never prince commanded a more noble or worthy subject, not doubting, but by your obedience to my general, by your concord in the camp, and your valor in the field, we shall shortly have a famous victory over those enemies of my God, of my kingdom, and of my people. End quote. 
some of Elizabeth's advisors recommended that the whole care and resources of the government should be devoted to the equipment of the armies, and that the enemy, when he attempted to land, should be welcomed with a battle on the shore. But the wiser counsels of Raleigh and others prevailed, who urged the importance of fitting out a fleet that should encounter the Spaniards at sea, and, if possible, prevent them from approaching the land at all. In Raleigh's great work, The History of the World, he takes occasion, when discussing some of the events of the First Punic War, to give his reasonings on the proper policy of England when menaced with invasion. Without doubt, we have there the substance of the advice which he gave to Elizabeth's council, and the remarks of such a man on such a subject have a general and enduring interest beyond the immediate crisis which called them forth. Raleigh says, quote, Surely I hold that the best way is to keep our enemies from treading upon our ground, wherein if we fail, then must we seek to make him wish that he had stayed at his own home. In such a case, if it should happen, our judgments are to weigh many particular circumstances that belong not unto this discourse, but making the question general, the positive, whether England, without the help of her fleet, be able to debar an enemy from landing, I hold that it is unable to do so, and therefore I think it most dangerous to make the adventure, for the encouragement of a first victory to an enemy and the discouragement of being beaten to the invaded may draw after it a most perilous consequence. Great difference I know there is, and a diverse consideration to be had between such a country as France is, strengthened with many fortified places, and this of ours, where our ramparts are but the bodies of men. But I say that an army to be transported over sea and to be landed again in an enemy's country, and the place left to the choice of the invader, cannot be resisted on the coast of England without a fleet to impeach it. No, nor on the coast of France or any other country, except every creek, port, or sandy bay had a powerful army in each of them to make opposition. For let the supposition be granted that Kent, is able to furnish 12,000 foot, and that those 12,000 be laid in the three best landing places within that country, to wit, 3,000 at Margat, 3,000 at the Ness, and 6,000 at Folkestone, that is, somewhat equally distant from them both, as also that two of these troops, unless some other order be thought more fit, be directed to strengthen the third, when they shall see the enemy's fleet to head toward it. I say that notwithstanding this provision, if the enemy, setting sail from the Isle of Wight in the first watch of the night, and towing their longboats at their stems, shall arrive by dawn of day at the Ness, and thrust their army on shore there, it will be hard for those three thousand that are at Margat, twenty and four long miles from thence, to come time enough to reinforce their fellows at the Ness. Nay, how shall they at Folkestone be able to do it, who are nearer by more than half the way? Seeing that the enemy, at his first arrival, will either make his entrance by force, with three or four shot of great artillery, and quickly put the first three thousand that are entrenched at the Ness to run, or else give them so much to do that they shall be glad to send for help to Folkestone, and perhaps Margat, whereby those places will be left bare. Now, let us suppose that all the twelve thousand Kentish soldiers arrived at the Ness, ere the enemy can be ready to disembark his army, so that he will find it unsafe to land, in the face of so many prepared to withstand him. Yet must we believe that he will play the best of his own game, having liberty to go which way he list, and, under covert of the night, set sail toward the east, where what shall hinder him to take ground either at Margat, the Downs, or elsewhere, before they at the Ness 
can be well aware of his departure. Certainly, there is nothing more easy than to do it. Yea, the like may be said of Weymouth, Purbeck, Poole, and of all landing places on the southwest, for there is no man ignorant that ships, without putting themselves out of breath, will easily outrun the soldiers that coast them. Les armées ne volent point en poste. Armies neither fly nor run post, saith a marshal of France. And I know it to be true that a fleet of ships may be seen at sunset and after it at the lizard, yet by the next morning they may recover Portland, whereas an army of foot shall not be able to march it in six days. Again, when those troops lodged on the seashores shall be forced to run from place to place in vain after a fleet of ships, they will at length sit down in the midway and leave all at adventure. But say it were otherwise, that the invading enemy will offer to land in some such place where there shall be an army of ours ready to receive him, yet it cannot be doubted but that when the choice of all our trained bands and the choice of our commanders and captains shall be drawn together, as they were at Tilbury in the year 1588, to attend the person of the prince and for the defense of the city of London, they that remain to guard the coast can be of no such force as to encounter an army like unto that wherewith it was intended that the prince of Parma should have landed in England. For end of this digression, I hope that this question shall never come to trial. His Majesty's many movable forts will forbid the experience. And although the English will no less disdain than any nation under heaven can do to be beaten upon their own ground or elsewhere by a foreign enemy, yet to entertain those that shall assail us with their own beef in their bellies, and before they eat of our Kentish capons, I take it to be the wisest way to do which his majesty, after God, will employ his good ships on the sea, and not trust in any entrenchment upon the shore. End, quote. End of section 27. Read by Will Caffey. Section 28 of The Great Events by Famous Historians, Volume 10. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Great Events by Famous Historians, Volume 10, by Charles F. Horn, Rossiter Johnson, and John Rudd. Defeat of the Spanish Armada, A.D. 1588 by Sir Edward Shepherd Creasy, Part 2. The introduction of steam as a propelling power at sea has added tenfold weight to these arguments of Raleigh. On the other hand, a well-constructed system of railways, especially of coastlines, aided by the operation of the electric telegraph, would give facilities for concentrating a defensive army to oppose an army on landing, and for moving troops from place to place in observation of the movements of the hostile fleet, such as would have astonished Sir Walter even more than the sight of vessels passing rapidly to and fro without the aid of wind or tide. The observation of the French marshal, whom he quotes, is now no longer correct. Armies can be made to pass from place to place almost with the speed of wings, and far more rapidly than any post-traveling that was known in the Elizabethan or any other age. Still, the presence of a sufficient armed force at the right spot, at the right time, can never be made a matter of certainty, and, even after the changes that have taken place, no one can doubt but that the policy of Raleigh is that which England should ever seek to follow in defensive war. At the time of the Armada, that policy certainly saved the country, if not from conquest, at least from deplorable calamities. If indeed the enemy had landed, we may be sure that he would have been heroically opposed. 
but history shows us so many examples of the superiority of veteran troops over new levies, however numerous and brave, that, without disparaging our countrymen's soldierly merits, we may well be thankful that no trial of them was then made on English land. Especially must we feel this when we contrast the high military genius of the Prince of Parma, who would have headed the Spaniards with the imbecility of the Earl of Leicester, to whom the deplorable spirit of favoritism, which formed the great blemish on Elizabeth's character, had then committed the chief command of the English armies. The ships of the Royal Navy at this time amounted to no more than thirty-six, but the most serviceable merchant vessels were collected from all the ports of the country, and the citizens of London, Bristol, and the other great seats of commerce showed as liberal a zeal in equipping and manning vessels as the nobility and gentry displayed in mustering forces by land. The seafaring population of the coast, of every rank and station, was animated by the same ready spirit, and the whole number of seamen who came forward to man the English fleet was 17,472. The number of the ships that were collected was 191, and the total amount of their tonnage, 31,985. There was one ship of the fleet, the Triumph, of 1,100 tons, one of 1,000 tons, one of 900, two of 800 each, three of 600, five of 500, five of 400, six of 300, six of 250, 20 of 200, and the residue of inferior burden. Application was made to the Dutch for assistance, and, as Stowe expressed it, quote, the Hollanders came roundly in with three score sail, brave ships of war, fierce and full of spleen, not so much for England's aid as in just occasion for their own defense. These men, foreseeing the greatness of the danger, that might ensue if the Spaniard should chance to win the day and get the mastery over them, in due regard whereof their manly courage was inferior to none. End quote. We have more minute information of the number and equipment of the hostile forces than we have of our own. In the first volume of Hakluyt's Voyages, dedicated to Lord Effingham, who commanded against the Armada, there is given from the contemporary foreign writer Metteron, a more complete and detailed catalogue than has perhaps ever appeared of a similar armament. Quote, a very large and particular description of this navy was put in print and published by the Spaniards, wherein were set down the number, names, and burthens of the ships. The number of mariners and soldiers throughout the whole fleet, likewise the quantity of their ordnance, of their armor, of bullets, of match, and of gunpowder, of victuals, and of all their naval furniture, was in the said description particularized. Unto all these were added the names of the governors, captains, noblemen, and the gentlemen voluntaries, of whom there was so great a multitude that scarce was there any family of a Comte or any one principal man throughout all Spain that had not a brother, son, or kinsman in that fleet who all of them were in good hope to purchase unto themselves in that navy, as they termed it, invincible, endless glory and renown, and to possess themselves of great seigniories and riches in England and in the Low Countries. But because the said description was translated and published out of Spanish into diverse other languages, we will here only make an abridgment, or brief rehearsal thereof. Portugal furnished and set forth under the conduct of the Duke of Medina Sidonia, general of the fleet, ten galleons, two zebris, thirteen hundred mariners, three thousand three hundred soldiers, three hundred great pieces, with all requisite furniture. Biscay, under the conduct of John Martins de Ricald, admiral of the whole fleet, set forth ten galleons, four patachas, seven hundred mariners, two thousand soldiers, 250 great pieces, etc. Gipusco, under the conduct of Miquel de Oquendo, 10 galleons, 4 patachas, 700 mariners, 2,000 soldiers, 310 great pieces. Italy, with the Levant Islands, under Matein de Vertendona, 
10 galleons, 800 mariners, 2,000 soldiers, 310 great pieces, etc. Castile, under Diego Flores de Valdez, 14 galleons, 2 petaches, 1,700 mariners, 2,400 soldiers, and 380 great pieces, etc. Andalusia, under the conduct of Petro de Valdez, 10 galleons, 1 patach, 800 mariners, 2,400 soldiers, 280 great pieces, etc. Item, under the conduct of John Lopez de Medina, 23 great Flemish hulks with 700 mariners, 3,200 soldiers, and 400 great pieces. Item, under Hugo de Moncada, four galeses containing 1,200 galley slaves, 460 mariners, 870 soldiers, 200 great pieces, etc. Item, under Diego de Mandrama, four galleys of Portugal, with 888 galley slaves, 360 mariners, 20 great pieces, and other requisite furniture. Item, under Anthony de Mendoza, 22 petaches and zebras, with 574 mariners, 488 soldiers, and 193 great pieces. Besides the ships aforementioned, there were 20 caravels rowed with oars, being appointed to perform necessary services under the greater ships, insomuch that all the ships appertaining to this navy amounted unto the sum of 150, each one being sufficiently provided of furniture and victuals. The number of mariners in the said fleet were above 8,000, of slaves 2,088, of soldiers 20,000, besides noblemen and gentlemen voluntaries, of great cast pieces, 2,600. The aforesaid ships were of an huge and incredible capacity and receipt, for the whole fleet was large enough to contain the burthen of 60,000 tons. The galleons were 64 in number, being of a huge bigness and very flatly built, being of marvelous force also, and so high that they resembled great castles, most fit to defend themselves and to withstand any assault, but in giving any other ships the encounter fair inferior unto the English and Dutch ships, which can, with great dexterity, wield and turn themselves at all assays. The upper work of the said galleons was of thickness and strength sufficient to bear off musket shot. The lower work and the timbers thereof were out of measure strong, being framed of planks and ribs four or five foot in thickness, insomuch that no bullets could pierce them, but such as were discharged hard at hand, which afterward proved true, for a great number of bullets were found to stick fast within the massy substance of those thick planks. Great and well-pitched cables were twined about the masts of their ships to strengthen them against the battery of shot. The galleases were of such bigness that they contained within them chambers, chapels, turrets, pulpits, and other commodities of great houses. The galleases were rowed with great oars, there being in each one of them three hundred slaves for the same purpose, and were able to do great service with the force of their ordnance. All these together with the residue aforenamed, were furnished and beautified with trumpets, streamers, banners, warlike ensigns, and other such like ornaments. Their pieces of brazen ordnance were 1,600, and of iron, 1,000. The bullets thereto belonging were 120,000. Item of gunpowder, 5,600 quintals of match, 1,200 quintals of muskets and calivers, 7,000 of halibuts and partisans, 10,000. Moreover, they had great stores of cannons, double cannons, culverings, and field pieces for land services. Likewise, they were provided of all instruments necessary on land to convey and transport their furniture from place to place, as namely of carts, wheels, wagons, etc., also, they had spades, mattocks, and baskets to set pioneers on work. 
They had in like sort great store of mules and horses, and whatsoever else was requisite for a land army. They were so well stored of biscuit that for the space of half a year they might allow each person in the whole fleet half a quintal every month, whereof the whole sum amounteth to a hundred thousand quintals. Likewise of wine they had a hundred and forty-seven thousand pipes, sufficient also for half a year's expedition. Of bacon, six thousand five hundred quintals. Of cheese, three thousand quintals. Besides fish, rice, beans, peas, oil, vinegar, etc. Moreover, they had twelve thousand pipes of fresh water and all other necessary provision, as namely candles, lanterns, lamps, sails, hemp, oxen hides, and lead to stop holes that should be made with the battery of gunshot. To be short, they brought all things expedient, either for a fleet by sea or for an army by land. This navy, as Diego Pimentelli afterward confessed, was esteemed by the king himself to contain 32,000 persons and to cost him every day 30,000 ducats. There were in the said navy five terzas of Spaniards, which terzas the Frenchmen call regiments, under the command of five governors, termed by the Spaniards masters of the field, and among the rest there were many old and expert soldiers chosen out of the garrisons of Sicily, Naples, and Tercera. Their captains, or colonels, were Diego Pimentelli, Don Francisco de Toledo, Don Alonso de Luzon, Don Nicolas de Ila, Don Augustin de Mejia, who had each of them thirty-two companies under their conduct. Besides the witch companies, there were many bands also of Castilians and Portugals, every one of which had their peculiar governors, captains, officers, colors, and weapons. End quote. While this huge armament was making ready in the southern ports of the Spanish dominions, the Duke of Parma, with almost incredible toil and skill, collected a squadron of warships at Dunkirk, and a large flotilla of other ships and of flat-bottomed boats, for the transport to England of the picked troops which were designed to be the main instruments in subduing England. The design of the Spaniards was that the Armada should give them, at least for a time, the command of the sea, and that it should join the squadron that Parma had collected off Calais. Then, escorted by an overpowering naval force, Parma and his army were to embark in their flotilla and cross the sea to England, where they were to be landed together with the troops which the Armada brought from the ports of Spain. The scheme was not dissimilar to one formed against England a little more than two centuries afterwards, as Napoleon, in 1805, waited with his army and flotilla at Bologna, looking for Villanueva to drive away the English cruisers and secure him a passage across the Channel, so Parma, in 1588, waited for Medina Sidonia to drive away the Dutch and English squadrons that watched his flotilla, and to enable his veterans to cross the sea to the land that they were to conquer. Thanks to Providence, in each case England's enemy waited in vain. Although the numbers of sail which the Queen's government and the patriotic zeal of volunteers had collected for the defense of England, exceeded the number of sail in the Spanish fleet, the English ships were, collectively, far inferior in size to their adversaries, their aggregate tonnage being less by half than that of the enemy. In the number of guns and weight of metal, the disproportion was still greater. The English admiral was also obliged to subdivide his force, and Lord Henry Seymour, with forty of the best Dutch and English ships, was employed in blockading the hostile ports in Flanders and in preventing the Duke of Parma from coming out of Dunkirk. The Invincible Armada, as the Spaniards in the pride of their hearts named it, set sail from the Tagus on May 29th, but near Corona met with a tempest that drove it into port with severe loss. It was the rapport of the damage done to the enemy by this storm which had caused the English court to suppose that there would be no invasion that year. But as already mentioned, the English admiral had sailed to Corona 
and learned the real state of the case whence he had returned with his ships to Plymouth. The Armada sailed again from Corona on July 12th. The orders of King Philip to the Duke of Medina Sidonia were that he should, on entering the Channel, keep near the French coast, and, if attacked by the English ships, avoid an action and steer on to Calais Roads, where the Prince of Parma's squadron was to join him. The hope of surprising and destroying the English fleet in Plymouth led the Spanish admiral to deviate from these orders and to stand across to the English shore. But, on finding that Lord Howard was coming out to meet him, he resumed the original plan and determined to bend his way steadily toward Calais and Dunkirk and to keep merely on the defensive against such squadrons of the English as might come up with him. It was on Saturday, July 20th, that Lord Effingham came in sight of his formidable adversaries. The armada was drawn up in form of a crescent, which from horn to horn measured some seven miles. There was a southwest wind, and before it the vast vessels sailed slowly on. The English let them pass by, and then, following in the rear, commenced an attack on them. A running fight now took place, in which some of the best ships of the Spaniards were captured, many more received heavy damage, while the English vessels, which took care not to close with their huge antagonists, but availed themselves of their superior celerity in tacking and maneuvering, suffered little comparative loss. Each day added not only to the spirit, but to the number of Effingham's force. Raleigh, Oxford, Cumberland, and Sheffield joined him, and, quote, the gentlemen of England hired ships from all parts at their own charge, and with one accord came flocking thither as to a set field, where glory was to be attained and faithful service performed unto their prince and their country, end quote. Raleigh justly praises the English admiral for his skillful tactics. Quote, Certainly he that will happily perform a fight at sea must be skillful in making choice of vessels to fight in. He must believe that there is more belonging to a good man of war upon the waters than great daring, and must know that there is a great deal of difference between fighting loose or at large and grappling. The guns of a slow ship pierce as well and make as great holes as those in a swift. To clap ships together without consideration belongs rather to a madman than to a man of war, for by such an ignorant bravery was Peter Strassi lost at the Azores when he fought against the Marquis de Santa Cruz. In like sort had the Lord Charles Howard, Admiral of England, been lost in the year 1588, if he had not been better advised than a great many malignant fools were that found fault with his demeanor. The Spaniards had an army aboard them, and he had none. They had more ships than he had, and of higher building and charging, so that had he entangled himself with those great and powerful vessels, he had greatly endangered this kingdom of England. For twenty men upon the defenses are equal to a hundred that board and enter, whereas then, contrarywise, the Spaniards had a hundred for twenty of ours to defend themselves withal. But our admiral knew his advantage and held it, which had he not done, he had not been worthy to have held his head up. End quote. The Spanish admiral also showed great judgment and firmness in following the line of conduct that had been traced out for him, and on July 27th he brought his fleet unbroken, though sorely distressed, to anchor in Calais Roads. But the King of Spain had calculated ill the number and the activity of the English and Dutch fleets. As the old historian expresses it, quote, It seemeth that the Duke of Parma and the Spaniards grounded upon a vain and presumptuous expectation that all the ships of England and of the Low Countries would, at the first sight of the Spanish and Dunkirk navy, have betaken themselves to flight, yielding them sea-room and endeavoring only to defend themselves, their havens, and sea-coasts from invasion. Wherefore, their intent and purpose was that the Duke of Parma, in his small and flat-bottomed ships, should, 
as it were, under the shadow and wings of the Spanish fleet, convey over all his troops armor and warlike provisions, and with their forces so united should invade England. Or, while the English fleet was busied in fight against the Spanish, should enter upon any part of the coast which he thought would be most convenient. Which invasion, as the captives afterward confessed, the Duke of Parma thought first to have attempted by the river of Thames, upon the banks whereof, having at the first arrival landed twenty or thirty thousand of his principal soldiers, he supposed that he might easily have won the city of London, both because his small ships should have followed and assisted his land forces, and also for that the city itself was but meanly fortified and easy to overcome, by reason of the citizens' delicacy and discontinuance from the wars, who, with continual and constant labor, might be vanquished, if they yielded not at the first assault. End quote. But the English and Dutch found ships and mariners enough to keep the armada itself in check, and at the same time to block up Parma's flotilla. The greater part of Seymour's squadron left its cruising ground off Dunkirk to join the English admiral off Calais, but the Dutch manned about five and thirty sail of good ships with a strong force of soldiers on board, all well seasoned to the sea service, and with these they blockaded the Flemish ports, that were in Parma's power. Still, it was resolved by the Spanish admiral and the prince to endeavor to effect a junction, which the English seamen were equally resolute to prevent, and bolder measures on our side now became necessary. The Armada lay off Calais, with its largest ships ranged outside, quote, like strong castles fearing no assault, the lesser placed in the middle ward, end quote. The English admiral could not attack them in their position without great disadvantage, but on the night of the 29th he sent eight fire ships among them, with almost equal effect to that of the fire ships which the Greeks so often employed against the Turkish fleets in their war of independence. The Spaniards cut their cables and put to sea in confusion. One of the largest galleasses ran foul of another vessel and was stranded. The rest of the fleet was scattered about on the Flemish coast, and when the morning broke, it was with difficulty and delay that they obeyed their admiral's signal to range themselves round him near Gravelines. Now was the golden opportunity for the English to assail them and to prevent them from ever letting loose Parma's flotilla against England, and nobly was that opportunity used. Drake and Fenner were the first English captains who attacked the unwieldy leviathans, then came Fenton, Southwell, Burton, Cross, Rayner, and then the Lord Admiral with Lord Thomas Howard and Lord Sheffield. The Spaniards only thought of forming and keeping close together, and were driven by the English past Dunkirk and far away from the Prince of Parma, who, in watching their defeat from the coast, must, as Drake expressed it, have chafed like a bear robbed of her whelps. This was indeed the last and the decisive battle, between the two fleets. It is perhaps best described in the very words of the contemporary writer as we may read them in Haklut. Quote, Upon the 29th of July in the morning, the Spanish fleet, after the foresaid tumult, having arranged themselves again in order, were within sight of Graveling, both bravely and furiously encountered by the English where they once again got the wind of the Spaniards, who suffered themselves to be deprived of the commodity of that place in Calais Road, and of the advantage of the wind near unto Dunkirk, rather than they would change their array or separate their forces now conjoined and united together, standing only upon their defense. And albeit there were many excellent and warlike ships in the English fleet, yet scarce were there twenty-two or twenty-three among them all, which matched ninety of the Spanish ships in the bigness, or could conveniently assault them. Wherefore the English ships, using their prerogative of nimble steerage, whereby they could turn and wield themselves with the wind which way they listed, came oftentimes very near upon the Spaniards, and charged them so sore that now and then they were but a pike's length asunder, and so continually giving them one broadside after another, they discharged all their shot, 
both great and small, upon them, spending one whole day from morning until night in that violent kind of conflict, until such time as powder and bullets failed them. In regard of which want, they thought it convenient not to pursue the Spaniards any longer, because they had many great advantages of the English, namely, for the extraordinary bigness of their ships, and also for that they were so nearly conjoined, and kept together in so good array, that they could by no means be fought with all one on one. The English thought, therefore, that they had right well acquitted themselves in chasing the Spaniards first from Calais, and then from Dunkirk, and by that means to have hindered them from joining with the Duke of Parma his forces, and getting the wind of them, to have driven them from their own coasts. The Spaniards that day sustained great loss and damage, having many of their ships shot through and through, and they discharged likewise great store of ordnance against the English, who, indeed, sustained some hindrance, but not comparable to the Spaniards' loss, for they lost not any one ship or person of account. For very diligent inquisition being made, the Englishmen, all the time wherein the Spanish navy sailed upon their seas, are not found to have wanted above one hundred of their people, albeit Sir Francis Drake's ship was pierced with shot about forty times, and his very cabin was twice shot through, and about the conclusion of the fight the bed of a certain gentleman lying weary upon was taken quite from under him with the force of a bullet. Likewise, as the Earl of Northumberland and Sir Charles Blunt were at dinner upon a time, the bullet of a demi-culvering broke through the middest of their cabin, touched their feet, and struck down two of the standers by, with many such accidents befalling the English ships, which it were tedious to rehearse. End quote. It reflects little credit on the English government that the English fleet was so deficiently supplied with ammunition as to be unable to complete the destruction of the invaders. But enough was done to ensure it. Many of the largest Spanish ships were sunk or captured in the action of this day, and at length the Spanish admiral, despairing of success, fled northward with a southerly wind in the hope of rounding Scotland and so returning to Spain without a further encounter with the English fleet. Lord Effingham left a squadron to continue the blockade of the Prince of Parma's armament, but that wise general soon withdrew his troops to more promising fields of action. Meanwhile, the Lord Admiral himself and Drake chased the, quote, vincible, quote, armada, as it was now termed, for some distance northward, and then, when they seemed to bend away from the Scotch coast toward Norway, it was thought best, in the words of Drake, to, quote, to leave them to those boisterous and uncouth northern seas, end quote. The sufferings and losses which the unhappy Spaniards sustained in their flight round Scotland and Ireland are well known. Of their whole armada, only fifty-three shattered vessels brought back their beaten and wasted crews to the Spanish coast, which they had quitted in such pageantry and pride. Some passages from the writings of those who took part in the struggle have been already quoted, and the most spirited description of the defeat of the Armada which ever was penned may perhaps be taken from the letter which our brave Vice Admiral Drake wrote in answer to some mendacious stories by which the Spaniards strove to hide their shame. Thus does he describe the scenes in which he played so important a part. Quote, they were not ashamed to publish in sundry languages in print great victories in words which they pretended to have obtained against this realm and spread the same in a most false sort over all parts of france italy and elsewhere when shortly afterward it was happily manifested in very deed to all nations how their navy which they termed invincible consisted of one hundred forty sail of ships not only of their own kingdom, but strengthened with the greatest argosies, Portugal, Carracks, Florentines, and large hulks of other countries, were, by thirty of Her Majesty's own ships of war, and a few of our own merchants, 
by the wise, valiant, and advantageous conduct of the Lord Charles Howard, High Admiral of England, beaten and shuffled together, even from the lizard in Cornwall first to Portland, when they shamefully left Don Pedro de Valdez with his mighty ship, from Portland to Calais, where they lost Hugh de Moncado, with the galleys of which he was captain, and from Calais, driven with squibs from their anchors, were chased out of the sight of England, round about Scotland and Ireland, where, for the sympathy of their religion, hoping to find succor and assistance, a great part of them were crushed against the rocks, and those others that landed, being very many in number, were, notwithstanding, broken, slain, and taken, and so sent from village to village, coupled in halters, to be shipped into England, where Her Majesty, of her princely and invincible disposition, disdaining to put them to death, and scorning either to retain or entertain them, they were all sent back again to their countries, to witness and recount the worthy achievements of their invincible and dreadful navy, of which the number of soldiers, the fearful burden of their ships, the commander's names of every squadron, with all others, their magazines of provision, were put in print, as an army and navy irresistible and disdaining prevention. With all which their great and terrible ostentation, they did not, in all their sailing round about England, so much as sink or take one ship, bark, pinnace, or cockboat of ours, or even burn so much as one sheepcoat on this land. End, quote. End of section 28. Read by Will Caffey. Section 29 of The Great Events by Famous Historians, Volume 10. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Great Events by Famous Historians, Volume 10 by Charles F. Horn, Rossiter Johnson, and John Rudd. Henry of Navarre accepts Catholicism. He is acknowledged King of France, A.D. 1593, by Maximilien de Béthun, Duc de Sully. Few periods in French history are of greater interest and importance than that of which Sully treats in the following pages. Henry of Navarre is regarded by the French people as the most brilliant of all their kings in personal qualities and achievements, and his great accomplishment of ending the terrible religious wars of his country is one of the most conspicuous of the happier results in modern annals. Sully, whose account of these matters stands alone among those of contemporary narrators, was the friend and companion of Henry of Navarre, with whom he served in the wars. He also became famous as King Henry's Minister of Finance, after the massacre of St. Bartholomew, the wars of the Huguenots in France continued with fury. In 1573, the year following the massacre, by the Peace of La Rochelle, Charles IX granted to the Protestants partial toleration. By the Peace of Monsieur in 1576, Henry III granted them free exercise of their religion in all France except Paris. Among French Roman Catholics, this treaty caused deep dissatisfaction, and in the same year they formed the Holy League, also called the Catholic League, for the purpose of wiping out the Huguenot party and raising the Guises to the throne. The League made an alliance with Philip II of Spain. Henry of Navarre, head of the Huguenot party after the death of Condé in 1569, became heir presumptive to the throne of France in 1584. The Holy League, refusing to recognize his title, proclaimed the Cardinal Charles de Bourbon heir presumptive. On the death of Henry III, successor of Charles IX in 1589, the League proclaimed Bourbon as king under the title of Charles X. In the following year, Henry of Navarre signally defeated the League at Ivry, but still the war went on. Battles and sieges, widespread intrigues, and frequent assassinations kept the kingdom in a condition of tumult and alarm. Disputes between the contending parties proved futile. 
debates in the states or legislative assembly of Paris availed nothing, and the successive treaties of the long war period failed to bring lasting peace. At length, Henry decided to abjure the Protestant faith, and his abjuration was followed by the surrender to him of the chief cities of the kingdom, 1593, including Paris. Still, although the king secured the general recognition of the Roman Catholics and was crowned as Henry IV in July 1594, war was continued by the League and its Spanish allies. In April 1598, Henry issued the famous Edict of Nantes, whereby Huguenots were granted the political rights enjoyed by Catholics, and religious, military, and judicial concessions were made to the Protestants. This edict ended the long religious wars, and in May the Peace of Vavin with Spain and the League was concluded. The central event selected for this work is the securing by Henry of the sovereign power, whereby the end of these prolonged troubles was finally reached. Alternate secession of war and debates lasted all the time that the states of Paris continued to be held, and even till the day that the king abjured the Protestant religion. His intention of changing his religion now became daily more certain. Many causes urged him to adopt this resolution, the principle of which, not to mention his conscience, of which he alone could be the true judge, were his grief for the miseries to which the people would still be exposed his dread of the Catholics about his person, the powerful and subtle theological arguments of Monsieur de Perron added to his sweet and agreeable conversation, the artful connivance of some of the ministers and Huguenots in the cabinet who were willing to profit by the times at any rate, the faithless ambition of many of the most powerful and distinguished among the Protestants, at the mercy of whom he dreaded falling, should the Catholics resolve to abandon him, the contempt which he had conceived against some of the zealous Catholics, and particularly Mr. Dole, on account of the insolent language they had used towards him, his desire of getting rid of them, and of one day making them suffer for their temerity, his dread lest the states, still sitting in Paris, might elect the Cardinal of Bourbon King, and marry him to the Infanta of Spain, finally the fatigue and troubles he had endured from his youth, the hope of enjoying a life of ease and tranquillity for the future, added to the persuasions of some of his most faithful servants, among whom may be also reckoned his mistress, the one by tears and supplications, the other by remonstrances, all these circumstances, I say, fixed him in his resolution of embracing the Catholic religion. While these things were under consideration, a great number of the larger towns, and Paris in particular, which were in the party of the League, being no longer able to endure the inconveniences and privations which the confusion of the times had occasioned, all commerce, internal as well as external, being at a stand on account of the prohibitions against trading with the places in the king's interest, disturbances broke out among the people who at last compelled their leaders to send a deputation to the king to request liberty to trade. Monsieur de Berlin was accordingly appointed for this purpose, and came to the king when he was either at Mantes or Vernon. But notwithstanding all his arguments, the whole council opposed his request. There was not a Protestant there who appeared willing that he should grant it, and what is still more surprising, it met with equal opposition from the Catholics, without their being able to assign a lawful or even a plausible reason for such a conduct. All these persons were perplexed in their debates, and perceived plainly that their opinion would signify nothing, yet could not prevail upon themselves to alter it. The king, looking at me that moment, Monsieur de Rosny, said he, what makes you so thoughtful? Will not you speak your mind absolutely any more than the others? I then began, and was not afraid to declare myself against all those who had voted, by maintaining that it was necessary not to hesitate a moment, but to endeavor to gain the affections of the people by kind treatment, as experience had proved that harsh measures were productive of no good consequences whatever. I therefore advised the king to grant them not only the liberty of trade which they requested, but also a general truce, if as the Count de Balan seemed to hint, they should desire it. To these I added many other reasons, but they only excited against me the hatred or contempt of most of the council, 
to whose decision the king was obliged to yield, and the Count de Bellin returned without being able to gain anything. Henry, reflecting upon this refusal, and judging that there wanted but little more of the same nature to alienate the people's affections from him without a possibility of regaining them, and to induce them to go over to the party of his enemies, he resolved to defer his abjuration no longer. He was now convinced that there was no probability of his subduing the reluctance of several of the Protestants, or of ever obtaining their free consent to this proceeding, but that it was necessary to act independently of them, and hazard some murmurs, which would end in nothing. As for the Catholics of his party, the king endeavored only to remove their fears, that, looking upon them as persons of whom he was already secure, he would apply himself wholly to gaining the rest by bestowing all rewards upon them. He therefore at last declared publicly that on July 20, 1593, he would perform his abjuration and name the Church of Saint-Denis for this ceremony. This declaration threw the League into confusion and filled the hearts of the people and the Catholics of the royal party with joy. The Protestants, although they had expected it, discovered their discontent by signs and low murmurs, and did, for form's sake, all that such a juncture required of them, but they did not go beyond the bounds of obedience. All the ecclesiastics, with Du Perron, intoxicated with his triumph, at their head flocked together. Every one was desirous of a share in this work. Du Perron, for whom I had obtained the bishopric of Evreux, thought he could not show his gratitude for it in a better manner than by exercising his functions of converter upon me. He accosted me with the air of a conqueror, and proposed to me to be present at a ceremony where he flattered himself he should shine with such powers of reasoning as would dissipate the profoundest darkness. Sir, I replied, all I have to do by being present at your disputes is to examine which side produces the strongest and most effectual arguments. The state of affairs, your number and your riches, require that yours should prevail. In effect, they did. There was a numerous court of Saint-Denis, and all was conducted with great pomp and splendor. I may be excused from dwelling upon the description of this ceremony here, since the Catholic historians have been so prolix upon the subject. I did not imagine I could be of any use at this time, therefore kept myself retired, as one who had no interest in the show that was preparing, when I was visited by Du Perron, whom the Cardinal of Bourbon had sent to me to decide a dispute that had arisen on occasion of the terms in which the King's profession of faith should be conceived. The Catholic priests and doctors loaded it with all the trifles their heads were filled with, and were going to make it ridiculous instead of a grave and solemn composition. The Protestant ministers and the king himself disapproved of the puerilities and trifles with which they had stuffed this instrument, and it occasioned debates which had liked to have thrown everything again into confusion. I went immediately with Du Perron to the Cardinal of Bourbon, with whom it was agreed that those articles of faith which were disputed by the two churches should be admitted, but that all the rest should be suppressed as useless. The parties approved of this regulation, and the instrument was drawn up in such a manner that the king there acknowledged all the Roman tenets upon the Holy Scripture, the church, the number and ceremonies of the sacraments, the sacrifices of the mass, transubstantiation, the doctrine of justification, the invocation of saints, the worship of relics and images, purgatory, indulgences, and the supremacy and power of the Pope, after which the satisfaction was general. The ceremony of the king's abjuration was followed by a deputation of the Duke of Nevers to Rome, who, together with the Cardinal de Gondi and the Marquis de Pisani, was to offer the Pope the submission usual in such cases. Although this change was a mortal blow for the League, yet the Spaniards and the Duke of Mayenne still held out. They endeavored to persuade their partisans that there still remained resources capable of making it ineffectual, but they spoke at that time contrary to their own opinion, and this feigned confidence was only designed to obtain greater advantages from the king before he was securely fixed on the throne. 
This is not a mere conjecture, at least with regard to the king of Spain, since it is certain that he ordered Taxis and Stunica to offer the king forces sufficient to reduce all the chiefs of the League and the Protestant party without annexing any other condition to this offer than a strict alliance between the two crowns and an agreement that the king should give no assistance to the rebels in the Low Countries. Philip II judged of Henry by himself, and considered his conversion only as the principle of a new political system, which made it necessary for him to break through his former engagements. It may not perhaps be useless to mention here an observation I have made on the conduct of Spain, which is, that although before and after the death of Catherine de' Medici she had put a thousand different springs in motion, changed parties and interests as she thought most expedient, to draw advantages from the divisions that shook this kingdom, yet the Protestant party was the only one to which she never made any application. She had often publicly protested that she never had the least intention to gain or suffer their alliance. It is by an effect of this very antipathy that the Spaniards have constantly refused the reformed religion admission into their states, an antipathy which cannot be attributed to anything but the republican principles the Protestants are accused of having imbibed, the king being fully convinced that to stifle the seeds of schism in his kingdom, it was necessary to give none of the different factions occasion to boast that his power was at their disposal, and that to reduce all parties he must be partial to none. He therefore steadily rejected these offers from Spain, and those which the Duke of Mayenne made him to the same purpose, but at that very time appeared willing to treat with any of the chiefs or cities of the League which would surrender and to reward them in proportion to their readiness and services and it was this prudent medium that he was resolved to persist in although he now professed the same religion as the league yet his aversion to the spirit which actuated that party and to the maxims by which they were governed was not lessened the very name only of the league was sufficient to kindle his anger the catholic leaguers supposing that his abjuration authorized them to abolish in those cities which depended upon them the edicts that were favorable to the huguenots the king caused them to be restored and though in some places the leaguers had obtained the consent even of the huguenots themselves determined to purchase peace at any price for this purpose yet the protestant party murmuring at it henry cancelled all that had been done to that effect and showed that it was his design to keep the balance even the duke of mayenne finding that in this last scheme which he had believed infallible he was disappointed as well as in the rest placed all his future dependence upon his old friends the parisians and neglected no method by which he might awaken their mutinous disposition but so far was he from succeeding in this attempt that he could not hinder them from discovering their joy at what had just passed at saint denis they talked publicly of peace and even in his presence and he had the mortification to hear a proposal to send deputies to the king to demand a truce for six months and they obliged him to give his consent to it the truce for three months which had been granted them at Sorene, had only inspired them with an inclination for a longer one the king gave audience to the deputies in full council the greatest number of those who composed it listening to nothing but their jealousy of the duke of mayenne whom they feared as a man that had the means in his power of purchasing favor and rewards were of the opinion that no attention ought to be paid to this demand of the deputies because the person who sent them persisted in his revolt against the king even after his abjuration notwithstanding the justice of not confounding the duke of mayenne with the parisians i saw this advice was likely to be followed and it certainly might have produced some very bad consequence i therefore insisted so strongly upon the advantage of letting the people already recovered from their first terrors taste the sweets of a peace which would interest them still more in the king's favor that this prince declared he would grant the truce they demanded of him but for the months of august september and october only the next day a prodigious concourse of the populace of paris assembled at saint denis the king showed himself to the people and assisted publicly at mass 
Wherever he turned his steps, the crowd was so great that it was sometimes impossible to pierce through it, while every moment a million of voices cried, Long live the king! Everyone returned, charmed with the gracefulness of his person, his condescension, and that engaging manner which was natural to him. God bless him, said they, with tears in their eyes, and grant that he may soon do the same in our church of Notre Dame in Paris. I observed to the king this disposition of the people with regard to him. Tender and sensible as he was, he could not behold the spectacle without strong emotions. Some months later, while on a mission for the king, I received from his majesty a letter, which concluded with these words, Come to me at saint Lee on the 20th of March, or at Saint-Denis on the 21st, that you may help to cry, Long live the king, in Paris, and afterward we will do the same at Rouen. It was upon some correspondence the king carried on in Paris that he founded his hopes of being soon admitted there, and he was on his way thither from Saint-Denis when I joined him. His party in that city was so firmly united, and so many persons of equal courage and fidelity had joined it, that it was almost impossible that it should succeed. Ever since the Battle of Arc, when the Count of Bellin was taken prisoner by the king's forces and had an opportunity of discovering the great qualities of Henry contrasted with the weakness of his enemies, the Duke of Mayenne perceived the inclinations of the Count to lean secretly toward the king. Full of this suspicion, he did not hesitate a moment about depriving him of the government of so considerable a city as Paris and seeking for a man whose fidelity to himself and the League could be depended upon, to whom he might entrust the care of this great city, at a time when the necessity of his affairs obliged him to repair to the frontier of Picardy, he fixed upon Brissac and made him governor. Brissac at first answered his purposes perfectly well. The study of Roman history had inspired this officer, who valued himself greatly upon his penetration and judgment with a very singular project, which was to form France into a republic upon the model of ancient Rome, and make Paris the capital of this new state. Had Brissac descended ever so little from these lofty ideas to an attention to particular applications, which in the greatest designs it is necessary to have some regard to, he would have perceived that there are circumstances under which a scheme, however happily imagined, may, by the nature of the obstacles which oppose it, by the difference of the genius and character of the people, by the force of those laws they have adopted, and by long custom, which, as it were, stamps a seal upon them, become alike chimerical and impracticable. Time only and long experience can bring remedies to defects in the customs of a state whose form is already determined, and this ought always to be attempted with a view to the plan of its original constitution. This is so certain that whenever we see a state conducted by measures contrary to those made use of in its foundation, we may be assured a great revolution is at hand, nor does the application of the best remedies operate upon diseases that resist their force. Brissac did not go so far. He could not for a long time comprehend from whence the general opposition his designs met with proceeded, for he had explained himself freely to the nobles and all the chief partisans of the League. At last he began to be apprehensive for his own safety, lest, while without any assistance, he was laboring to bring his project to perfection. The king should destroy it entirely by seizing his capital. Possessed with this fear, the Roman ideas quickly gave place to the French spirit of those times, which was to be solicitous only for his own advantage. When self-interested motives are strengthened by the apprehension of any danger, there are few persons who will not be induced by them to betray even their best friend. Thus Brissac acted. He entered into the Count of Belen's resolutions, though from a motive far less noble and generous, and thought of nothing but of making the king purchase at the highest price the treachery he meditated against the Duke of Mayenne in his absence. Saint-Luc, his brother-in-law, undertook to negotiate with the king in his name, and having procured very advantageous conditions, Brissac agreed to admit Henry with his army into Paris in spite of the Spaniards. 
the troops of the League were absolutely at his disposal, and there was no reason to apprehend any opposition from the people. Do lost no time in making application for the government of Paris and the Ile de France, and obtained his request. But now a conflict between his interest and ambition so perplexed the superintendent that, notwithstanding his new dignity, the reduction of Paris was among the a number of things he most feared should happen. He would have had it believed that the true motive of this fear was, lest the finances should become a prey to the men of the sword and gown, by whom, he said, the king, as soon as he was possessed of Paris, would be oppressed for the payment of pensions, appointments, and rewards. But this discourse deceived none but those who were ignorant of the advantage he found in keeping the affairs of the finances in their present state of confusion, and with what success he had hitherto labored for that purpose. The king, upon this occasion, put all the friends of the Count of Belin in motion, on whom he had no less dependence than upon Brissac, and at nine o'clock in the morning presented himself at the head of eight thousand men before the Porte Neuve, where the mayor of Paris and the other magistrates received him in form. He went immediately and took possession of the Louvre, the palace, the great and little Châtelet, and finding no opposition anywhere, he proceeded even to the church of Notre Dame which he entered to return thanks to God for his success. His soldiers, on their part, fulfilled with such exactness the orders and intentions of their master that no one throughout this great city complained of having received any outrage from them. They took possession of all the squares and crossways in the street, where they drew up in order of battle. Everything was quiet, and from that day the shops were opened with all the security which a long-continued peace could have given. The Spaniards had now only the Bastille, the Temple, and the quarters of Saint Anthony and Saint Martin in their possession, and there they fortified themselves, being about four thousand in number, with the Duke de Feria and Don Diego de Vora at their head, all greatly astonished at such unexpected news, and firmly resolved to defend themselves to the last extremity, if any attempts were made to force them from those advantageous posts. The king relieved them from their perplexity by sending to tell them that they might leave Paris and retreat in full security. He treated the cardinals of Placentia and Pelev with the same gentleness, notwithstanding the resentment he still retained for their conduct with regard to him. Soissons was the place whither these enemies of the king retired, protected by a strong escort. His majesty then published a general pardon for all the French who had borne arms against him. When this sacrifice is not extorted by necessity, but, on the contrary, made at a time when vengeance has full liberty to satiate itself. It is not one of the least marks of a truly royal disposition. End of section 29 Section 30 of The Great Events by Famous Historians Volume 10 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Great Events by Famous Historians, Volume 10 By Charles F. Horne, Rossiter Johnson, and John Rudd Culmination of Dramatic Literature in Hamlet, A.D. 1601, by James O. Halliwell Phillips The tragedy of Hamlet is generally regarded by critics as Shakespeare's masterpiece. Hence it is often referred to as the highest literary product of human genius. In the following discussion of the play, Mr J. O. Halliwell Phillips, the master and dean of later Shakespearean scholars, gives 1601 as the probable date of its first production. At that time... Shakespeare was a London actor and leading shareholder in the Globe Theatre, where his play was presumably produced. He had made his first big success some five years before with Romeo and Juliet and was, so far as we can judge, on the high tide of financial prosperity. The profession of an actor carried with it in those days much discredit, but in his far-off home at Stratford, Shakespeare had, in 1601, 
already begun to seek the repute of a country gentleman, and had purchased the finest house and estate in the little village. Mr. Halliwell Phillips' memoranda on Hamlet were never thrown into final shape by the author. Therefore the editors have taken such slight liberties in rearranging the order of his text as were necessary to make its discourse consecutive. The tragedy of Hamlet is unquestionably the highest effort of artistic literary power yet given to the world. There is nothing to be found in real competition with it, excepting in the other works of Shakespeare, but all are inferior to his great masterpiece. There is hardly a speech in the whole play which may not fairly be made the subject of an elaborate discourse, especially when viewed in connection with its bearings, however occasionally remote, on the character of Hamlet, the development of which appears to have been the chief object of the author not only in the management of the plot, but in the creation of the other personages who were introduced. There is contemporary evidence to this effect in the Stationers' Register of 1602, in the title there given, The Revenge of Hamlet. There was an old English tragedy on the subject of Hamlet, which was in existence at least as early as the year 1589, in the representation of which an exclamation of the ghost, Hamlet, revenge, was a striking and well-remembered feature. This production is alluded to in some prefatory matter by Nash in the edition of Green's Menophon, issued in that year, here given. I'll turn back to my first text, of studies of delight, and talk a little in friendship with a few of our trivial translators. It is a common practice nowadays amongst the sort of shifting companions that run through every art and thrive by none, to leave the trade of Nawarint whereto they were born, and busy themselves with the endeavours of art, that could scarcely latinise their neck verse if they should have need. Yet English Seneca, read by candlelight, yields many good sentences, as blind is a beggar, and so forth. And if you entreat him fair in a frosty morning, he will afford you whole hamlets, I should say handfuls of tragical speeches. Another allusion occurs in Lodge's Wit's Misery. And though this fiend be begotten of his father's own blood, yet is he different from his nature, and were he not sure that jealousy could not make him a cuckold, he had long since published him for a bastard. You shall know him by this. He is a foul lubber, his tongue tipped with lying, his heart steeled against charity. He walks for the most part in black under colour of gravity, and looks as pale as the visit of the ghost which cried so miserably at the theatre like an oyster wife. Hamlet! Revenge! Again, in Decker's Satyromastics, 1602. Asini, would I were hanged, if I can call you any names but Captain and Tucker. Took. No, Fiest, my name's Hamlet Revenge. Thou hast been at Paris Garden, hast not? Oh? Yes, Captain. I have played Sulzerman there. With which may be compared another passage in Westward Ho, 1607. Aye, but when light wives make heavy husbands, let these husbands play mad Hamlet and cry, Revenge! So, likewise, in Rowland's Night Raven, 1620, a scrivener who has his cloak and hat stolen from him exclaims, I will not cry, Hamlet, revenge my grieves. There is also reason to suppose that another passage in the old tragedy of Hamlet is alluded to in Armin's Nest of Ninnies, 1608. There are, as Hamlet says, things called whips in store a sentence which seems to have been well known and popular, for it is partially cited in the Spanish tragedy 1592, and in the first part of the contention 1594. It seems, however, certain that all the passages above quoted refer to a drama of Hamlet anterior to that by Shakespeare, 
and the same which is recorded in Henslow's diary as having been played at Newington in 1594 by My Lord Admiral and My Lord Chamberlain men, 9th of June 1594, received at Hamlet, five shillings. The small sum arising from the performance showing most probably that the tragedy had then been long on the stage. As Shakespeare was a member of the Lord Chamberlain's company at that time, it is certain that he must have been well acquainted with the older play of Hamlet, one of a series of dramas on the then favourite theme of revenge aided by the supernatural intervention of a ghost. There are a few other early allusions to the first Hamlet which appear to deserve quotation. His father's empire and government was but as the poetical fury in a stage action, complete, yet with horrid and woeful tragedies, a first but no second to any Hamlet, and that now revenge, just revenge, was coming with his sword drawn against him, his royal mother and dearest sister to fill up those murdering scenes. Sir Thomas Smith's Voyage and Entertainment in Russia, 1605. Sometimes he would overtake him and lay hands upon him like a catchpole, as if he had arrested him, but furious Hamlet would presently either break loose like a bear from the stake, or else so set his paws on this dog that thus baited him that, with tugging and tearing one another's frocks off, they both looked like mad Tom of Bedlam. Decker's Dead Term, 1608. If any passenger come by, and, wondering to see such a conjuring circle kept by hellhounds, demand what spirits they raise there, one of the murderers steps to him, poisons him with sweet words, and shifts him off with this lie, that one of the women is fallen in labour. But if any mad hamlet, hearing this, smell villainy and rush in by violence to see what the tawny devils are doing, then they excuse the fact, lay the blame on those that are the actors, and perhaps, if they see no remedy, deliver them to an officer to be led to punishment. Decker's Lanthorn and Candlelight, or The Bellman's Second Night's Walk, 1609, a tract which was reprinted under more than one different title. Mr. Collier, in his Father Particulars, 1839, cites a very curious passage. A trout hamlet with four legs which is given as a proverbial line in Clark's Paromyologia Anglo-Latina, or Proverbs, English and Latin, 1639. It was unnecessary to be too curious in searching for the exact meaning of the phrase, but as Dr Ingleby suggested to me, it is in all probability taken from the older play of Hamlet, which does not appear to have been entirely superseded at once by the new, or at least was long remembered by playgoers. The preceding notices may fairly authorise us to infer that the ancient play of Hamlet 1. was written by either an attorney or an attorney's clerk who had not received a university education. 2. was full of tragical, high-sounding speeches. 3. contained the passage There are things called whips in store, spoken by Hamlet. 4. included a very telling brief speech by the ghost in the two words Hamlet, Revenge. 5. Was acted at the theatre in Shoreditch and the playhouse at Newington Butts. 6. Had for its principal character a hero exhibiting more general violence than can be attributed to Shakespeare's creation of Hamlet. As the older Hamlet was performed by the Lord Chamberlain's company in the year 1594, it is possible that Shakespeare might then have undertaken the part of the ghost a character he afterward assumed in his own tragedy. There is a curious, inedited notice of this personage in Salton Stall's Picture Eloquentes, 1635. A Chamberlain is as nimble as Hamlet's ghost, here and everywhere, and when he has many guests, stands most upon his pantoffles, for he's then a man of some calling. There are a number of critics following the lead of Coleridge, who tells us that Shakespeare's judgment is commensurate with his genius. But they speak of the former generally as if it were always unfettered, and neglect to add that it was continually influenced by the conditions under which he wrote, and that it was often his task to discover a route to a successful result through the tortuous angularities of a preconceived foreground. 
There is every reason to believe that this was the case with the tragedy of Hamlet, and, if so, it is certain that no genius but that of Shakespeare could have moulded the inartistic materials of a rude original into that harmonious composition, which, although it has certainly been tampered with by the players, and is therefore not the perfect issue of his free inspiration, is the noblest drama the world is ever likely to possess. It must be recollected that in 1602 Shakespeare was in the zenith of his dramatic power. His tragedy of Hamlet was produced on the stage either in 1601 or 1602, as appears from the entry of it on the books of the Stations Company on July 26, 1602. James Roberts entered for his copy under the hands of Mr Pacefield and Mr Waterson. Warden, a book called The Revenge of Hamlet, Prince of Denmark, as yet was lately acted by the Lord Chamberlain, his servants. No copy of this date is known to exist, but a surreptitious and imperfect transcript of portions of the tragedy appeared in the following year under the title of The Tragical History of Hamlet, Prince of Denmark, by William Shakespeare, as it hath been diverse times acted by his highness servants in the city of London, as also in the two universities of Cambridge and Oxford, and elsewhere, at London, printed for N. L. and John Trundle, 1603. In the next year, 1604, N. L., who was Nicholas Ling, obtained by some means a playhouse copy of the tragedy, not a copy in the state in which it left the hands of the author, but representing in the main the genuine words of Shakespeare. It was published under the following title, The Tragical History of Hamlet, Prince of Denmark, by William Shakespeare newly imprinted and enlarged to almost as much again as it was, according to the true and perfect copy, at London, printed by I. R. for N. L., and are to be sold at his shop under St. Dunstan's Church in Fleet Street, 1604. This impression was reissued in the following year, the title page and a few leaves at the end being fresh printed, the sole alteration in the former being the substitution of 1605 for 1604. Hamlet is not mentioned by Mears in 1598, and it could not have been written before 1599, in which year the globe was erected, there being a clear allusion to that theatre in Act 2, Scene 2. The tragedy continued to be acted after Shakespeare's company commenced playing at the Blackfriars Theatre, it being alluded to in a manuscript list written in 1660 of some of the most ancient plays that were played at Blackfriars. According to Downs, Sir William Davenant, having seen Mr Taylor of the Blackfriars Company act it, who, being instructed by the author Mr Shakespeare, taught Mr Betterton in every particle of it. Rosicus Anglicus, 1708. Roberts, in his answer to Mr Pope's preface on Shakespeare, 1729, thinks that Lowin was the original Hamlet. The date of 1601 for the production of Hamlet appears to suit the internal evidence very well. That evidence decidedly leads to the conclusion that it could not have been written long before that time, and, without placing too much reliance on the general opinion that Shakespeare entirely laid aside his earlier style of composition at some particular era, that year is probably about the latest in which he would have written in the strain of the following lines, which taken by themselves, might be assigned to the period of the two gentlemen of Verona. Fear it, Ophelia, fear it, my dear sister, and keep you in the rear of your affection out of the shot and danger of desire. The dearest maid is prodigal enough if she unmask her beauty to the moon. Virtue itself scapes not columnous strokes. The canker galls the infants of the spring too oft before their buttons be disclosed and in the morn, and liquid dew of youth, contagious blasphemies are most imminent. Be wary then, best safety lies in fear. Youth to itself rebels, though none else near. Were it not that the elder play of Hamlet did not belong to Shakespeare's company, these lines might lead to the conjecture that he had made some additions to it long before he wrote his own complete tragedy. There was once in existence 
a copy of Spate's edition of Chaucer, 1598, with manuscript notes by Gabriel Harvey, one of those notes being in the following terms. The younger sort take much delight in Shakespeare's Venus and Adonis, but his Lucretia and his tragedy of Hamlet, Prince of Denmark, have it in them to please the wiser sort. This note was first printed in 1766 by Stevens, who gives the year 1598 as the date of its insertion in the volume, but, observed Dr Ingleby, we are unable to verify Stevens' note or collate his copy, for the book which contained Harvey's note passed into the collection of Bishop Percy, and his library was burned in the fire at Northumberland House. Under these circumstances, one can only add the opinions of those who have had the opportunity of inspecting the volume. Firstly, from the letter of Percy to Malone, 1803. In the passage which extols Shakespeare's tragedy, Spencer is quoted by name among our flourishing metricians. Now this edition of Chaucer was published in 1598, and Spencer's death is ascertained to have been in January 1598-1599, so that these passages were all written in 1598, and prove that Hamlet was written before that year, as you have fixed it. Secondly, from a letter from Malone to Percy, written also in 1803, in which he gives reasons for controverting this opinion. When I was in Dublin, I remember you thought that, though Harvey had written 1598 in his book, it did not follow from thence that his remarks were then written, whilst, on the other hand, I contended that, from the mention of Spencer, they should seem to have been written in that year, so that, like the two Reynoldses, we have changed sides and each converted the other. For I have now no doubt that these observations were written in a subsequent year. The words that deceive are our now flourishing matricians, by which Harvey does not mean now living, but now admired or in vogue. And what proves this? is that in his catalogue he mixes the living and the dead, for Thomas Watson was dead before 1593. With respect to Axiophilus, I think you will agree with me hereafter that not Spencer but another person was meant. Having more than once named Spencer, there could surely be no occasion to use any mysterious appellation with respect to that poet. My theory is that Harvey bought the book in 1598 on its publication, and then sat down to read it, and that his observations were afterward inserted at various times. That passage, which is at the very end, and subjoined to Lydgate's catalogue, one may reasonably suppose was not written till after he had perused the whole volume. The tragedy of Hamlet is familiarly alluded to more than once in the play of Eastward Ho, printed in 1605 in a manner which indicates that the former drama was very well established in the memories of the audience. There is a parody on one of Ophelia's songs, which is of some interest in regard to the question of the critical value of the quarto, 1604. The occurrence of the word all before flaxen, showing that the former word was incorrectly omitted in all the early quartos, excepting in that of 1603. One of the subordinate characters in Eastward Ho is a running footman of the name of Hamlet, who enters in great haste to tell the coachman to be ready for his mistress. Whereupon Potkin, a tankard bearer, says, What's afoot, Hamlet? Are you mad? Whither run you now? You should brush up my old mistress. There's an unsupported statement by Aldis to the effect that Shakespeare received but five pounds for his tragedy of Hamlet, but whether from the company who first acted it, or from the publisher is not mentioned. This is the only information that has reached us respecting the exact emolument received by Shakespeare for any of his writings, but it cannot be accepted merely on such an authority. It is, however, worthy of remark that Green parted with his Orlando to the Queen's players for twenty nobles, so the sum named appears to have been about the usual amount given for a play sold direct from the author to a company. But in all probability, when Hamlet was produced, Shakespeare was playing at the Globe Theatre on shares. Notwithstanding the extreme length of the tragedy of Hamlet, 
There is such a marvellously concentrative power displayed in much of the construction and dialogue that, in respect to a large number of the incidents and speeches, a wide latitude of interpretation is admissible. The selection in those cases from possible explanations depending on the judgment and temperament of each actor or reader. Hence it may be confidently predicted that no aesthetic criticisms upon this drama will ever be entirely and universally accepted, and are certainly that there will remain problems in connection with it which will be subjects for discussion until the end of literary time. Among the latter the reason or reasons which induced Hamlet to defer the fulfilment of his revenge may perhaps continue to hold a prominent situation. Although the solution of that special mystery does not seem to be attended with difficulties equal to those surrounding other cognate inquiries which arise in the study of the tragedy. In respect to this drama, as to many others by the same author, the prophetic words of Leonard Diggs may be usefully remembered. Some second Shakespeare must, of Shakespeare write, until this miracle occurs, it is not likely that any aesthetic criticism on the tragedy will be successful. And certainly at present, notwithstanding the numbers of persons of high talent and genius who have discussed the subject, nothing has been, nor is likely to be, produced which is altogether satisfactory. The cause of this may perhaps, to some extent, arise from the latitude of interpretation the dramatic form of composition allows. To the appreciation of the minor details of a character, and the various plausible reasons that can often be assigned for the same line of action. Something also may be due to the unconscious influence exercised by individual temperament upon the exposition of that character, and again much to the defective state of the text. But the reason of the general failure in Hamlet criticism is no doubt chiefly to be traced to the want of ability to enter fully into the inspiration of the poet's genius. It may, however, be safely asserted that the simpler explanations are, and the less they are biased by the subtleties of the philosophical critics, the more likely they are to be in unison with the intentions of the author. Take, for instance, the well-established fact that immodesty of expression, the recollection derived, it may often be accidentally and unwillingly from oral sources during the previous life, is one of the numerous phases of insanity, and not only are the song fragments chanted by Ophelia, but even the ribaldry addressed to her by Hamlet in the placing, vindicated, there being little doubt that Shakespeare intended the simulated madness of the latter through his intellectual supremacy to be equally true to nature, the manners of his age permitting the delineation in a form which is now repulsive and inadmissible. The present favourite idea is that in Hamlet the great dramatist intended to delineate an irresolute mind depressed by the weight of a mission which it is unable to accomplish. This is the opinion of Goethe, following, if I have noted rightly, an English writer in the Mirror of 1780. A careful examination of the tragedy will hardly sustain this hypothesis. So far from Hamlet being indecisive, although the active principle in his character is strongly influenced by the meditative, he is really a man of singular determination, and, excepting in occasional paroxysms, one of powerful self-control. His rapidity of decision is strikingly exhibited after his first interview with the ghost. Perceiving at once how important it was that Marcellus, at all events, should not suspect the grave revelations that had been made, although they had been sufficient to have paralysed one of less courage and resolution than himself, he outwits his companions by banter treating the apparition with intentional and grotesque disrespect and jocularity, at a moment when an irresolute mind would have been terrified and prostrated. Then Hamlet's powerful intellect not only enables him to recognise almost instantaneously the difficulties which beset his path, but immediately to devise a scheme by which some of them might be overcome. The compliance with the advice of his father's spirit in strict unison with his own natural temperament, that the pursuit of his revenge was to harmonise with the dictates of his conscience, involving, of course, his duties to others, was attended by obstacles apparently insurmountable. Yet all were to be removed before the final catastrophe. However acutely he might feel the effort of suppressing his desire for vengeance, 
that obligation, the fulfilment of which was postponed by subtle considerations and by fear, less precipitate action might leave him with a wounded name. But this duty, it is important to observe, was never sought to be relinquished. The influences practically render delay a matter of necessity with him, and leaving a murderer to contend against one who, as he must have felt, would not have scrupled to design his assassination if at any moment safety could be in that way secured. His determination to assume the garb of insanity in the presence of the king and of those likely to divulge the secret is easily and naturally explained. Hamlet is wildly impetuous in moments of excitement so that his utterances are not invariably to be accepted as evidences of his general nature. Much of the difficulty in the interpretation of the tragedy arises from the oversight of accepting his soliloquies as continuous illustrations of his character. Instead of being, as they mostly are, transient emanations of his subtle irritability, even in the midst of his impetuosity, the current of violent thought was subject to a controlling interruption by a sudden reaction arising from the influence of reason. But it was natural on occasions that, stirred by his desire for revenge, he should doubt the validity of his reasons for delay. A wide distinction must also be drawn in the matter of time for vengeance between action resulting from sudden and that from remoter provocation. There seems to have been in Hamlet, so far as regards the commands of the apparition, an almost perpetual conflict between impulse and reason, each in its turn being predominant. The desire for revenge is at times so great that it is only by the strongest effort of will he resists precipitate action. Then, losing no pretext to find causes for its exercise, overpowering the dictates of his penetrative genius. It is not rashness in Hamlet on one occasion and procrastination on another, but a power of instantaneous action that could be controlled by the very briefest period of reflection. The great feature in his intellect being a preternaturally rapid reflective power, and men of genius almost invariably do meditate before action. Among the numerous unsupported conjectures respecting this tragedy may be mentioned that when Shakespeare drew the characters of 1. Hamlet, 2. Horatio, 3. Claudius, 4. The Queen, he had in his mind 1. The Earl of Essex, or Sir Philip Sidney, or himself. 2. Lord Southampton, or Fulke Greville. 3. The Earl of Leicester. 4. Mary, Queen of Scots. Although some of these suggestions are ingeniously supported, there is not one of them which rests on any kind of real evidence or external probability. Burbage was the first actor of Hamlet in Shakespeare's tragedy. His performance is spoken of in terms of high commendation, but there's no record of his treatment of the character, his delineation probably differing materially from that of modern actors. Stage tradition merely carries down the tricks of the profession, no actor entirely replacing another, and in the case of Hamlet, hardly two of recent times whose performances I have had the opportunity of witnessing, but who are or have been distinct in manner and expression, and even in idea. Few actors or readers can be found to agree respecting Shakespeare's conception of the character. This, however, may be safely asserted, that no criticism on Hamlet will ever be permanent which does not recognise the sublimity of his nature. Horatio understood Hamlet better than anyone, and his judgment of him doubtless expressed Shakespeare's own estimate. Now cracks a noble heart. Good night, sweet prince and flights of angels sing thee to thy rest. A noble heart that ever shrank from an act that would have resulted in his own aggrandizement, for, although the monarchy was elective, not hereditary, the succession of Hamlet had been proclaimed by the king, and tacitly accepted. End of section 30 Read by Bryn Roberts Kings Winford, 2023
Section 31 of The Great Events by Famous Historians, Volume 10. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Great Events by Famous Historians, Volume 10. By Charles F. Horn, Rossiter Johnson, and John Rudd. Downfall of Irish Liberty. Flight of the Earls, A.D. 1603. Justin McCarthy. At the accession of Henry VIII to the English throne, that portion of Ireland mainly colonized from England, the ruling country, was known as the English Pale, that is, district. It comprised the four shires, or counties, of Dublin, Kildare, Meath, and Louth. Beyond this district, the country was held by various Celtic clans ruled by their own chieftains. Early in Henry's reign, the English lords began to show their independence of royal authority, and also to ally themselves with the native chieftains. Henry saw that the Irish, who had often before aimed at independence of England, were about to renew the struggle. He determined to forestall them, and sent one lord deputy after another to Ireland, in charge of the royal interests. Disputes between his own representatives and their doubtful loyalty caused the king much trouble, and Irish affairs were far from being composed when Thomas Fitzgerald, 10th Earl of Kildare, renounced his allegiance to Henry, and headed an unsuccessful rebellion. Fitzgerald was executed at Tyburn in 1537. Matters were now further complicated by the introduction of the Reformation into Ireland. Most of the Irish people were stanch adherents of Catholicism, while some of the leading English Protestants in Ireland favored Irish nationality as strongly as did the Catholics. After the death of Henry VIII, the religious troubles were intensified. Under Edward VI, a severe policy was pursued against the Irish Catholics and Nationalists. After a brief reaction under Mary, the Catholic sovereign of England, the policy of suppression was renewed with still greater severity by Queen Elizabeth, and the condition of Ireland became one of chronic rebellion. This time of trouble called forth some powerful champions of the Irish national cause. One of these, Shane O'Neill, has been celebrated in many a popular ballad. The head of the house to which he belonged had acknowledged allegiance to Henry VIII and received the title of Earl of Tyrone. The English title carried with it, according to English law, the principle of hereditary succession. But when the first Earl died, the clan of O'Neill refused to adopt the English practice, and according to the Irish principle of tanistry, chose as his successor the member of the house for whom they had the highest regard. This was Shane O'Neill who was a younger and not even a legitimate son of the Earl of Tyrone, but whose energy, courage, and strong national sentiments had already made him the hero of his sect. Shane O'Neill at once proclaimed himself the champion of Irish national independence. Queen Elizabeth, amid all her troubles with foreign states, had to pour large numbers of troops into Ireland, and these troops, as all historians admit, overran the country in the most reckless and merciless manner. Shane O'Neill, however, held his own, and began to prove himself a formidable opponent of English power. The evidence of history leaves little or no doubt that Elizabeth connived at a plot for the removal of O'Neill by assassination. This project did not come to anything, and the Queen tried another policy. She was a woman not merely of high intellect, but also of artistic feeling, and it would seem as if the picturesque figure of Shane O'Neill had aroused some interest in her. She proposed to enter into terms with the new lord of Ulster, as he now declared himself, and invited him to visit her court in England. O'Neill seems to have accepted with great goodwill this opportunity of seeing a life hitherto unknown to him, and he soon appeared at court. We read that O'Neill and his retainers presented themselves in their saffron-colored shirts and shaggy mantles, bearing battle axes as their weapons, amid the stately gentlemen, the contemporaries of Essex and Raleigh, who thronged the court of the great queen, a meeting took place on January 6, 1562. Brode tells us of the effect produced upon the court by the appearance of O'Neill and his followers. The council, the peers, the foreign ambassadors, bishops, aldermen, dignitaries of all kinds, were present in state, as if at the exhibition of some wild animal of the desert. O'Neill stalked in, his saffron mantle sweeping round and round him, his hair curling on his back and clipped short below the eyes, which gleamed from under it with a gray luster, frowning, fierce, and cruel. Behind him followed his gallo glasses, bareheaded and fair-haired, with shirts of mail which reached beneath their knees, 
a wolf's skin flung across their shoulders, and short, broad battle axes in their hands. O'Neill made a formal act of submission to the queen, and negotiations set in for a definite and lasting arrangement. Nothing came of it. O'Neill seems to have understood that he was acting under a promise of safe conduct, and was to be confirmed in the ownership of his states in return for his submission. But, whatever may have been the misunderstanding, it is certain that these terms were not carried out according to O'Neill's expectation. He was detained in London in qualified captivity, and was informed that he could only be restored to his lands when he had engaged to make war against his former allies the Scots, had pledged himself not to make war without the consent of the English government, and set up no claim of supremacy over other chiefs in Ireland. O'Neill seems to have proved himself skillful as a diplomatist, and he greatly gratified the queen by paying intense deference to all her suggestions, and even by modestly requesting that she would choose a wife for him. He seems to have agreed to what he did not intend to carry out. Some terms were understood to be arranged at last, and on May 5, 1562, a royal proclamation was issued declaring that in future he was to be regarded as a good and loyal subject of the queen. Shane returned to Ireland and made known to his friends that the Articles of Agreement had been forced upon him under peril of captivity or death, and that he could not regard them as binding. He went so far to maintain the terms of the treaty as to begin a war against the Scots, and sent the Queen a list of his captives in token of his sincerity. But he still insisted that he had never made peace with the Queen except by her own seeking, that his ancestors were kings of Ulster, and that Ulster was his kingdom and should continue to be his. He soon after applied to Charles IX, King of France, to send him five thousand men to assist him in expelling the English from Ireland. Then war set in again between the English Lord Deputy and Shane O'Neill. Defeated in many encounters, O'Neill again tried to make terms with the Queen, and again applied to the King of France for the help of an army to drive the English from Ireland and restore the Catholic faith. By this time, the Scottish settlers in Ulster, who appear to have once been as much disliked by the English government as the Irish themselves, had turned completely against him. His end was not in keeping with his soldierly, picturesque career. After a severe defeat, he took refuge with some old tribal enemies of his, who at first professed to receive him as a friend and find a shelter for him. A quarrel sprang up at a drinking festival during the June of 1567, and Shane and most of his companions were killed in the affray. It is not easy to come to a satisfactory estimate of the character of Shane O'Neill. Some English historians treat him as if he were a mere monster of treachery and violent crime. Most Irish legends and stories convert him into a perfect hero and patriot, while most other Irish writers of graver order are inclined to dwell altogether upon the wrongs done to him and the perfidies employed to ensnare him by those who acted for the English government. It is necessary to keep always in mind that in their dealings with the Irish native populations, the English government only too frequently employed deception and treachery, thus giving the Irish chieftains what they considered warrant enough for playing a similar game. Shane O'Neill was very unscrupulous in his methods of dealing with his enemies. He was a man of sensuous passion and fierce hatred, but he was gifted with splendid courage, a remarkable capacity for soldiership, and much of the diplomatist's or statesman's arts. An Irish essayist who writes with much judgment and moderation on the subject, describes Shane as a thorough Celtic chief, not of the traditional type, but such as centuries of prolonged struggle for existence had made the chieftains of his nation. This seems the only fair standard by which to judge his career. No Irish family gave more trouble in its time to the English conquerors than did the O'Neills, and Shane O'Neill was in some of his qualities the most extraordinary man of the family. There were other O'Neills who bequeathed to their country's history a brighter and purer fame, and of whose characters we can form a common estimate with less chance of dispute. But in Shane O'Neill we see a genuine type of the ancestral Irish chieftain brought into dealings and antagonism with the advances and the emissaries of a newer civilization. In this prolonged period of incessant war brought about the almost complete devastation of wide tracts of country in Ireland. Historians and poets tell the same sad story. Hollinshead says that except in cities or towns, the traveler might journey for miles without meeting man, woman, child, or even beast. Edmund Spencer declared that the story of many among the inhabitants, and the picture one could see of their miserable state, 
or such that any stony heart will rue the same. Mr. Prude affirms that in Munster alone there had been so much devastation that the lowing of a cow or the sound of a ploughboy's whistle was not to be heard from Valencia to the rock of Cashel. It was a boast made by at least one of those engaged in ruling Ireland on behalf of the Queen that he had reduced some of the population so deeply down that they preferred slaughter in the field to death by starvation. When the supposed pacification of Munster was accomplished, the province was divided into separate settlements to be held under the crown at hardly more than a nominal quit rent by any loyal settlers who were willing to hold the land as vassals of the sovereign and fight for their lives. All these lands were obtained by the confiscation of the estates of the rebellious chieftains. A new deputy, Sir John Parrott, convened a parliament in Ireland. There was something farcical as well as grim in calling together a parliament under such conditions, when the delegates were supposed to be convened that they might give frank and sincere advice to the representative of the sovereign. Some of the Irish chieftains who had given their allegiance to the English sovereign not only accepted the deputy's invitation, but actually presented themselves in full English costume. In former parliaments, when Irish chieftains were loyal enough to take part in the sittings, they still wore the costume of their sept. But now, after so many struggles, some of the Irish nobles thought they would do better by making a complete submission to the conqueror and inaugurating the new season of peace and prosperity by adopting the costume of their rulers. This parliament naturally proved most obedient. Whatever the deputy wished, it promptly adopted. More estates were confiscated to the crown, and the land thus obtained was parceled out on the cheapest terms of holding to English nobles, and also to mere English adventurers, who undertook to colonize it with workmen and traders from England. But it was soon found that English traders and laborers were not easily to be persuaded into the risks of a settlement under these conditions, and the new owners were compelled in most cases either to put up with such labor as the country afforded, or to allow the soil to lie barren for the time. The scheme which the rulers had in mind, a scheme which meant nothing less than the substitution of an English for an Irish population, proved a failure. An English nobleman, endowed with a spirit of adventure, might be tempted to accept an estate in Ireland on the chance of making a brilliant career there, winning the favor of his sovereign and becoming a great figure in the eyes of his own court and his own country. A mere adventurer might be as ready to try his fortunes in Ireland as in some unexplored part of the New World beyond the Atlantic. But the ordinary trader or working man of English birth and ways did not at that time feel inclined to give up his business and his home to venture on a settlement in that wild western island where all reports told him that every man's hand was against every other man and that the loyal subjects of the queen were hunted like wild game by the uncivilized Irish. Sir John Parrott was not a man qualified to make the situation any better than he had found it. A man of quick and violent temper, he succeeded in making enemies of some of the Irish chieftains who had lately been coming over to the service of the crown, and converted some of his friends in office into his most bitter enemies. Sir John Parrott had to be withdrawn, and a new deputy appointed in his place. Such a representative of the English government was not likely to encourage many of the Irish chieftains to accept the advances of an English deputy, or to believe that they could secure safety for themselves in their land by submitting to his rule. The new deputy, Sir William Russell, had a hard task before him. One of the most important and famous struggles made during these years against English dominion was led by Hugh O'Neill. This celebrated Irish leader was the grandson of that Shane O'Neill whom Henry VIII had created Earl of Tyrone. He had led thus far a very different life than that usually led by an Irish chieftain. The ruling powers were at first inclined to make a favorite of him, and confirmed him in his earldom and estates. He was brought over when very young to England, and we learn that even in the brilliant court of Queen Elizabeth he was distinguished for gifts and graces of body and mind. For a long time Tyrone seemed a loyal supporter of English rule. He commanded a troop in the Queen's service, and even took part in the suppression of risings in his own country, cooperating with the Earl of Essex in the Ulster Wars and in the settlement of Antrim. One romantic incident of his life brought him into personal antagonism with Sir Henry Bagnall, the Lord Marshal of Ireland. Hugh O'Neill had been left a widower, and he fell in love with Bagnall's beautiful sister. Bagnall highly disapproved of the match, but as the lady was heart and soul in love with the Irish chieftain, her brother's opposition was vain. She eloped with her lover and married him. Bagnall became O'Neill's determined enemy. 
It may be that Sir Henry Bagnall did his best to prejudice the ruling authorities against O'Neill, and at that time no very substantial evidence was needed to set up a charge of treason against an Irish chieftain. Perhaps when O'Neill returned to his own country, he was recalled to national sentiments by the sight of oppression there, and it is certain that he was roused to indignation by the arbitrary imprisonment of one of his kinsmen known as Red Hugh. When Red Hugh succeeded in escaping from prison, he inspired Tyrone with a keen sense of his wrongs and brought him into the temper of insurrection. O'Neill threw himself completely into the new movement for independence. A confederation of Irish chieftains was organized, and O'Neill took the command. He proved himself possessed of the most genuine military talents, and he could play the part of the statesman as well as of the soldier. The confederation of Irish chieftains soon became an embattled army, and the brothers-in-law met in arms as hostile commanders on the shores of the northern Blackwater. As one historian has well remarked, there was something positively Homeric about this struggle, in which the two men connected by marriage encountered each other as commanders of opposing armies. Events had been moving on since the marriage between Tyrone and Bagnall's sister. O'Neill's young wife had found her early grave before this last engagement between her husband and her brother. The army of Bagnall was completely defeated, and Bagnall was killed upon the field. For a time, victory seemed to follow Tyrone. Before long, the greater part of Ireland was in the hands of the Irish forces. The Earl of Essex was sent to Ireland at the head of the largest army ever dispatched from England for the conquest of the island. But Essex does not seem to have made any serious effort. He appears to have had some idea of coming to terms with Tyrone. The two had a meeting, over which many pages of historical description and conjecture have been spent, but it is certain that, so far as Essex was concerned, neither peace nor war came of his intervention. He was recalled to London. His failure in Ireland and the trouble it brought upon him in England only drove him into the wild movements which led to his condemnation as a traitor and to his death on the scaffold. The place which Essex had so unsuccessfully endeavoured to hold was given to Lord Mountjoy, who proved himself a more fitting man for the work. Mountjoy was a strong man, who made up his mind from the first that he was sent to Ireland to fight the Irish. He had a great encounter with Tyrone, and Tyrone was defeated. From that moment the fortunes of the struggle seemed to have turned. The resources of the Irish were very limited, and it was almost certain that, if the English government carried on the war long enough, the Irish must sooner or later be defeated. It was a question of numbers and weapons and money, and in all these the English had an immense superiority. Tyrone had great hopes that a Spanish army would come to the aid of the Irish. A large Spanish force was actually dispatched for the purpose, but the news of Tyrone's defeat reached the Spaniards on their arrival, and they promptly re-embarked and gave up what they considered the lost cause. Some of the Irish chiefs were compelled to surrender, Others fled to Spain in the hope of stirring up some movement there against England, or at least of finding a place of shelter. Ireland was suffering almost everywhere from famine, and in many districts famine of the most ghastly order. Tyrone found it impossible to carry on the struggle for independence under such terrible conditions. There was nothing for it but to surrender and come to terms as best he could with his conquering enemy. The times just then might have been regarded as peculiarly favorable for Tyrone. Queen Elizabeth was dead, and the son of Mary Stuart sat on the English throne. Tyrone made a complete surrender of his estates, pledged himself to enter into alliance with no foreign power against England, and even undertook to promote the introduction of English laws and customs into any part of Ireland over which he had influence. In return, Tyrone received from the king the restoration of his lands and his title by letters patent, and a free pardon for his campaigns against England, and was brought to London to be presented to King James and was treated with great courtesy and hospitality. This aroused much anger among some of the older soldiers and courtiers in London who did not understand why an Irish rebel should be treated as if he were a respectable member of society. Sir John Harrington expressed his opinions very freely in letters which are still preserved. I have lived, he wrote, to see that damnable rebel Tyrone brought to England, honored and well-liked. Oh, what is there that does not prove the inconstancy of worldly matters? I adventured perils by sea and land, was near starving, ate horse flesh and monster, and all to quell that man who now smileth in peace at those who did harass their lives to destroy him. And now doth Tyrone dare us, old commanders, with his presence and protection. When Tyrone returned to his own country, he found that the reign of peace and reconciliation between England and Ireland was as far off as ever. 
Tyrone had believed it was fortunate for him to have made terms of peace in King James's reign and not in Elizabeth's, but he soon found that his hopes of a better time coming were premature. James no doubt thought it good policy to secure the allegiance of a man like Tyrone by apparently generous concessions, but he had no idea of adopting any policy toward Ireland other than the old familiar policy of striving to reduce her to the conditions of an English province with English laws, customs, costumes, and religion. The king appears to have set his mind on the complete suppression of the national religion by the enforcement of these sternest penal laws against Catholics, and he was determined also to blot out whatever remained of the old Braham laws, still dear to the memories of the people, and still cherished among the sacred traditions of the country. When King James succeeded to the throne, he promised the Irish that they should have the right of practicing their religion at least in private, but he soon recalled his promise, and made it clear that those who would retain the protection of the new ruling system must abjure the faith of their fathers. Those who were put into the actual government of the country saw that this policy could not be carried out without much resistance, and therefore decreed the complete disarmament of all Irish retainers who still acknowledged the leadership of the chieftains. One of the greatest of these chieftains, O'Donnell, Earl of Tyrconnell, was called upon to conform openly to the English church, under pain of being proceeded against as a traitor. The state of things he found existing on his return to Ireland would naturally have driven Tyrone into rebellion, and the rulers of the country appear to have made up their minds that he must be planning some such rising. Tyrconnell was naturally regarded as an enemy of the same order, and the policy of the ruling powers was to anticipate their designs and condemn them in advance. Tyrone and Tyrconnell were accordingly proclaimed traitors to the king, the two earls determined that, as immediate insurrection had no chance of success, there was no safety for them but in prompt escape from the country. Then followed the flight of the earls. Tyrone and Tyrconnell, with their families and many of their friends and retainers, nearly a hundred persons in all, made their escape in one vessel from the Irish shore, and for twenty-one days were at the mercy of the sea and of the equinoctial winds, for they sailed about the middle of September. A story characteristic of the faith which then filled the hearts of the Irish chieftains is told. Tyrone fastened his golden crucifix to a string and drew it through the sea at the stern of the vessel in the hope that the waves might thus be stilled. In the first week of October, they landed on the shore of France and traveled on to Rouen, receiving nothing but kindness from the French. When King James heard of their plight, he at once demanded from France the surrender of the earls, but Henry IV refused to surrender them. Henry received the exiles with gracious and friendly greeting, but it was not thought prudent by the earls any more than by the French king. They should remain in France at the risk of involving the two countries in war. The earls, with their families and followers, went into Flanders and then on to Rome. Pope Paul V gave them a cordial welcome and made liberal arrangements for their maintenance, while the king of Spain showed his traditional sympathy with Ireland by settling pensions on them. Tyrconnell died soon after in the Franciscan church of San Pietro di Montorio, and was laid in his grave wrapped in the robe of a Franciscan friar. Tyrone lived for several years. He was filled in this later time by a passionate longing to see once more the loved country of his birth, and he appealed to the English government for permission to return to Ireland and live quietly there until the end came. His request was not granted. The English authorities, no doubt, felt good reason to believe that his return to Ireland would be the cause of profound and dangerous emotion among the people who loved him and whom he loved so well. His later years in Rome were literally darkened because his sight, which had been for some time failing, soon left him to absolute blindness. He died on July 20th, 1616, having lived a life of 76 years. Tyrone's body was laid to rest in the same church which held the body of his comrade Tyrconnell. Their graves are side by side. A modern writer tells us that the church, which has become the tomb of the two exiled earls, stands where the geniculum overlooks the glory of Rome, the yellow Tiber and the Alban hills, the deathless Colosseum and the stretching Campania. Raphael had painted his transfiguration for the grand altar. The hand of Sebastiano del Piombo had colored the walls with the scourging of the Redeemer. The present writer has seen the graves, and even the merest stranger to the spirit of Irish history must feel impressed by the story of the two exiles who found their last resting place enclosed by such a scene. End of section 31
Section 32 of The Great Events by Famous Historians, Volume 10. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Caveat. The Great Events by Famous Historians, Volume 10, by, by Charles F. Horn, Roster Johnson, and John Rudd. Section 32. The Gunpowder Plot. A.D. 1605. Samuel R. Gardner The gunpowder plot acquires importance from the fact that its anniversary, November the 5th, is still celebrated in England with firecrackers, burnings of Guy Fawkes scarecrows, and other patriotic manifestations. Historically, the plot being detected before its execution ended in smoke, with no more terrible result than the execution of the conspirators. James I, son of the ill-starred Mary of Scotland, succeeded Elizabeth on the English throne in 1603, and held both England and Scotland under his sway. The English Catholics had been led to hope that James would be lenient toward their faith, but in this they were disappointed, and a few desperate followers of their religions united in the gunfire plot. More than one attempt has been made to prove that this really amounted to very little, and was exaggerated by James's minister, the Earl of Salisbury, to justify the harshness of the government towards Catholics. Father Gerard's book, What Was the Gunpowder Plot, is the strongest argument yet produced in favour of this view, but the fact remains undenied and undeniable that some sort of plot existed. We present here the latest summarising of the matter, 1897, by the standard English historian Gardner, confining the account almost wholly to Fawkes's own confessions. Before examining the evidence, it will be well to remind my readers what the so-called traditional story of the plot is, or rather, the story which has been told by writers who have in the present century availed themselves of the manuscript treasures now at our disposal, and which are, for the most part, in the public record office. With this object, I cannot do better than borrow the succinct narrative of the Edinburgh Review. Early in 1604, the three men, Robert Catesby, John Wright and Thomas Winter, meeting in a house at Lambeth, resolved on a powder plot, though, of course, only an outline. By April they had added to their number Wright's brother-in-law, Thomas Percy, and Guy Fawkes, a Yorkshireman of respectable family, but actually a soldier of fortune, serving in the Spanish army in the Low Countries, who was specially brought over to England as a capable and resolute man. Later on they enlisted Wright's brother, Christopher, Winter's brother Robert, Robert Keyes, and a few more, but all with the exception of Thomas Bates, Catesby's servant, men of family, and for the most part of competent fortune. Though Keyes is said to have been in straitened circumstances, and Catesby to have been impoverished by a heavy fine levied on him as a recusant. Percy, a second cousin of the Earl of Northumberland, then captain of the gentlemen pensioners, was admitted by him into the body in, it is said, an irregular manner, his relationship to the Earl passing in lieu of the usual oath of fidelity. The position gave him some authority and license near the court, and enabled him to hire a house, or part of a house, adjoining the House of Lords. From the cellar of this house they proposed to burrow under the House of Lords, to place there a large quantity of powder, and to blow up the whole, when the King and his family were assembled at the big opening of Parliament. On December the 11th, 1604, they began to dig in the cellar, and after a fortnight's labour, having come to a thick wall, they left off work and separated for Christmas. Early in January they began at the wall, which they had found to be extremely hard, so that after working for about two months they had got no more than halfway through it. Then they learned that a cellar actually under the House of Lords and used by a coal cellar was to be let, and as it was most suitable for their design, Percy hired it as though for his own use. The digging was stopped, and the powder to the amount of thirty-six barrels was brought into the cellar, where it was stowed under heaps of coal or firewood and so remained, under the immediate care of Guy Fawkes, till the night of November the 4th, 1605, the opening of Parliament being fixed for the next day. Sir Thomas Knivet, with a party of men, was ordered to examine the cellar. He met Fawkes coming out of it, and arrested him, and on a close search found the powder of which a mysterious warning had been conveyed to Lord Mount Eagle a few days before. On the news of this discovery, the conspirators scattered, that by different roads rejoined each other in Warwickshire, whence endeavouring to raise the country, they rode through Worcestershire, and were finally shot or taken prisoner at Holbeck in Staffordshire. 
It is this story that I propose now to compare with the evidence. First of all, let us restrict ourselves to the story told by Guy Fawkes himself in the five examinations to which he was subjected, previously to his being put to the torture on November the 9th, and to the letters, proclamations issued by the government during the four days commencing with the 5th. From these we learn not only that Fawkes' account of the matter gradually developed, but that the knowledge of the government also developed, a fact which fits in very well with the traditional story, but which is hardly to be expected if the government account of the affair was cut and dried from the first. Fawkes' first examination took place on November the 5th, and was conducted by Chief Justice Popham and Attorney General Coke. It is true that only a copy has reached us, but it's a copy taken for Coke's use, as shown by the headings of each paragraph, inserted in the margin in his own hand. It is therefore out of the question that Salisbury, if he had been so minded, would have been able to falsify it. Each page has his signature, in copy, of John Johnson, the name by which Fawkes chose to be known. The first part of the examination turns upon Fawkes' movements abroad, showing that the government had already acquired information that it had been beyond sea. Fawkes showed no reluctance to speak of his own proceedings in the low country, or to give the names of persons he had met there, and who were beyond the reach of his examiners. As to his movements after his return to England, he was explicit enough, so far as he himself was concerned, and also about Percy, whose servant he professed himself to be, and whose connection with the hiring of the house could not be concealed. Fawkes stated that after coming back to England, he came to the lodging near the Upper House of Parliament, and that Percy hired the house of Winyard for £12 rent about a year and a half ago, that his master, before his own going abroad, i.e. before Easter, 1605, lay in the house about three or four times. Further, he confessed, that about Christmas last, i.e. Christmas 1604, he brought in the night-time gunpowder to the cellar under the Upper House of Parliament, Afterward, he was told how he covered the powder with faggots, intending to blow up the king and the lords, and being pressed how he knew that the king would be in the house on the 5th, said he knew it only from general report, and by making ready of the king's barge, but he would have blown up that upper house whensoever the king was there. He further acknowledged that there was more than one person concerned in the conspiracy, and said that he himself had promised not to reveal it, but denied that he had taken the sacrament on his promise. Where the promise was given, he could not remember, except that it was in England. He refused to accuse his partners, saying that he himself had provided the powder and defrayed the cost of his journey beyond sea, which was only undertaken to see the country and to pass away the time. When he went, he locked up the powder and took the key with him, and one Gibbon's wife, who dwells thereby, had the charge of the residue of the house. Such is that part of the story told by Fawkes which concerns us at present. It's obvious that Fawkes, who, as subsequent experience shows, was no coward, had made up his mind to shield as far as possible his confederates, and to take the whole of the blame upon himself. He says, for instance, that Percy had only lain in the house three or four days before Easter, 1605, a statement, as subsequent evidence proved, quite untrue. He pretends not to know, except from rumour and the preparation of the barge, that the king was coming to the House of Lords on the 5th, a statement almost certainly untrue, in order not to criminate others, and especially any priest. He denies having taken the sacrament on his promise, which is also untrue. What is more noticeable is that he makes no mention of the mine, about which so much was afterwards heard, evidently, so at least I read the evidence, because he did not wish to bring upon the stage those who had worked in it. If indeed the passage which I have placed in square brackets be accepted as evidence, Fawkes did more than keep silence upon the mine. He must have made a positive assertion, soon afterwards found to be untrue, that the cellar was hired several months before it really was. This passage is, however, inserted in a different hand from the rest of the document. My own belief is that it gives a correct account of a statement made by the prisoner, but omitted by the clerk who made the copy for Coke, and inserted by some other person. Nobody that I can think of had the slightest interest in adding the words, while they were just what Fawkes might be expected to say, if he wanted to lead his examiners off the scent. At all events, even if these words be left out of the account, it must be admitted that Fawkes said nothing about the existence of a mine. Though Fawkes kept silence as to the mine, he did not keep silence on the desperate character of the work on which he was being engaged, and, runs the record, he confesses that when the king had come to the Parliament House this present day, and the upper house had been sitting, he meant to have fired the match, and have fled for his own safety before the powder had taken fire. 
and confesses that if he had not been apprehended this last night, he had blown up the upper house when the king, lords, bishops, and others had been there, and saith that he spake for and provided those bars and crows of iron, some in one place, some in another in London, lest it should be suspected, and saith that he had some of them in or about Gracious Street. Fox here clearly takes the whole terrible design, with the exception of the mine, on his own shoulders. Commissioners were now appointed to conduct the investigation further. There were Nottingham, Suffolk, Devonshire, Worcester, Northampton, Salisbury, Marr and Poppen, with Attorney General Coke in attendance. This was hardly a body of men who would knowingly cover an intrigue of Salisbury's. Worcester is always understood to have been professedly a Catholic. Northampton was certainly one, though he attended the King's service. While Suffolk was friendly towards the Catholics, and Nottingham, if he is no longer to be counted among them, was at least not long afterward a member of the party which favoured an alliance with Spain, and therefore a policy of toleration towards Catholics. Before five of these commissioners, Nottingham, Suffolk, Devonshire, Northampton and Salisbury, Fawkes was examined a second time on the forenoon of the 6th. In some way the government had found out that Percy had had a new door made in the wall leading to the cellar, and they now drew from Fawkes an untrue statement that was put in about the middle of Lent, that is to say early in March 1605. They had also discovered a pair of brewer's slings, by which barrels were usually carried between two men, and they pressed Fawkes hard to say who was his partner in removing the barrels of gunpowder. He began by denying that he had had a partner at all, but finally answered that he cannot discover the party, but, i.e., lest he shall bring him in question. He also said that he had forgotten where he slept on Wednesday, Thursday or Friday in the week before his arrest. Upon this, James himself intervened, submitting to the commissioners a series of questions with the object of drawing out of the prisoner a true account of himself and of his relations to Percy. A letter had been found on Fawkes when he was taken, directed not to Johnson, but to Fawkes, and this, among other things, had raised the King's suspicions. In his third examination on the afternoon of the 6th, in the presence of Northampton, Devonshire, Nottingham and Salisbury, Fawkes gave a good deal of information, more or less true about himself, and while still maintaining that his real name was Johnson, said that the letter, which was written by a Mrs. Bostock in Flanders, was addressed to him by another name, because he called himself Fawkes, that is to say, because he had acquired the name of Fawkes as an alias. If he will not otherwise confess, the king had ended by saying, that the gentler tortures are to be first used unto him, et sic per graduus ad imma tentur. To us living in the nineteenth century, these words are simply horrible. As a Scotchman, however, James had long been familiar with the use of torture as an ordinary means of legal investigation, while even in England, though unknown to the law, that is to say to the practice of the ordinary courts of justice, it had for some generations been used, not infrequently, by order of the council to extract evidence from a recalcitrant witness, though, according to Bacon, not for the purpose of driving him to incriminate himself. Surely, if the use of torture was admissible at all, this was a case for its employment. The prisoner had informed the government that he had been at the bottom of a plot of the most sanguinary kind, and acknowledged by an implication that there were fellow conspirators whom he refused to name. If indeed Father Gerard's view of the case, that the government, or at least Salisbury, had for some time known all about the conspiracy, nothing, not even the gunpowder plot itself, could be more atrocious than the infliction of torments on a fellow creature to make him reveal a secret already in their possession. If, however, the evidence I have adduced be worth anything, this was by no means the case. What it shows is that on the afternoon of the 6th, all that the members of the government were aware of was that an unknown number of conspirators were at large. They knew not where, and might at that very moment be appealing, they knew not with what effect, to Catholic landowners and their tenants who were without doubt exasperated by the recent enforcement of the penal laws. We may, if we please, condemn the conduct of the government, which have brought the danger of a general Catholic rising within sight. We cannot deny that, at that particular moment, they had real cause of alarm. At all events, no immediate steps were taken to put this part of the King's orders in execution. Some little information, indeed, was coming in from other witnesses. In his first examination on November the 5th, Fawkes has stated in his absence he locked up the powder, and one Gibbon's wife, who dwells thereby, had the charge of the residue of the house. An examination of her husband on the 5th, however, only elicited that he, being a porter, 
had with two others carried 3,000 billets into the vault. On the 6th, Ellen, the wife of Andrew Bright, stated that Percy's servant had, about the beginning of March, asked her to let the vault to his master, and that she had consented to abandon her tenancy of it if Mrs. Winyard, from whom she held it, would consent. Mrs. Winyard's consent having been obtained, Mrs. Bright, or rather Mrs. Skinner, she being a widow, remarried, subsequently to Andrew Bright, received two pounds for giving up the premises. The important point in this evidence is that the date of March 1605, given as that on which Percy entered into possession of the cellar, showed that Fawkes' statement that he had brought powder into the cellar at Christmas 1604 could not possibly be true. On the 7th, Mrs. Winyard confirmed Mrs. Bright's statement and also stated that a year earlier, in March 1604, Mr. Percy began to labour very earnestly with this examinate and her husband to have the lodging of the Parliament House, which one Mr. Henry Ferris of Warwickshire had long held before. And having obtained the said Mrs. Ferris's goodwill to part from it, after long suit by himself and the great entreaty of Mr. Carlton, Mr. Epsley, and other gentlemen belonging to the Earl of Northumberland, affirming him to be a very honest gentleman, and that they could not have a better tenant. Her husband and she were contented to let him have it, the said lodging at the same rent Mr. Ferris paid for it. Mrs. Winyard had plainly never heard of the mine, and that the government was in equal ignorance is shown by the endorsement on the agreement of Ferris, or rather the Ferrers, to make over his tenancy to Percy. The bargain between Ferris and Percy for the bloody cellar found in Winter's lodging. Winter's name had been under consideration for some little time, and doubtless the discovery of this paper was made on, or more probably, before the 7th. The government, having as yet nothing but Fawkes's evidence to go on, connected the hiring of the house with the hiring of the cellar, and at least showed no signs of suspecting anything more. On the same day, the 7th, something was definitely heard of the proceedings of the other plotters, who had either gathered at Dunchurch for the hunting match, or had fled from London to join them, and a proclamation was issued for the arrest of Percy, Catesby, Rokewood, Thomas Winter, Edward Grant, John and Christopher Wright, and Catesby's servant, Robert Ashfield. They were charged with assembling in troops in the counties of Warwick and Worcester, breaking into stables and seizing horses. Fawkes, too, was on that day subjected to a fourth examination. Not very much that was new was extracted from him. He acknowledged that his real name was Guy Fawkes. That, which he had denied before, he had received the sacrament not to discover any of the conspirators, and also that there had been at at first five persons privy to the plot, and afterwards five or six more were generally acquainted that an action was to be performed for the Catholic cause, and saith that he doth not know that they were acquainted with the whole conspiracy. Being asked whether Catesby, the two rights, Winter or Tresham, were privy, he refused to accuse anyone. That Fawkes had already been threatened with torture is known, and it may easily be imagined the threats had been redoubled after his last unsatisfactory acknowledgement. On the morning of the 8th, however, Wyatt, who was employed to worm out his secrets, report that little was to be expected. I find this fellow, he wrote, who this day is in a most stubborn and perverse humour, as dogged as if he was possessed. Yesternight I had persuaded him to set down a clear narration of all his wicked plots from the first entering to the same to the end that they pretended with the discourses and projects that were thought upon amongst them, which he undertook to do and craved time this night to bethink him the better. But this morning he hath changed his mind, and is so sullen and obstinate as there is no dealing with him. The sight of the examiners, together with the sight of the rack, changed Fawkes's mind to some extent. He was resolved that nothing but actual torture would wring from him the names of his fellow plotters, who, so far as was known in London, were still at large. He prepared himself, however, to reveal the secrets of the plot so far as was consistent with the concealment of the names of those concerned in it. His fifth examination on the 8th, the last one before the one taken under torture on the 9th, gives the inquirer into the reality of the plot all that he wants to know. So he confesses, so the tale begins, that a practice was first broken unto him against his majesty for the Catholic cause, and was not invented or propounded by himself, and this was first propounded unto him about Easter last, was twelve month beyond the seas in the Low Countries, by an English layman, and that Englishman came over with him in his company into England, and they two and three more were the first five mentioned in the former examination, and they five resolved to do somewhat for the Catholic cause, of our being first taken by all of them for secrecy. One of the three propounded to perform it with powder, 
and resolved that the place should be where this action should be performed and justice done, in or near the place of the sitting of Parliament, wherein religion had been unjustly suppressed. This being resolved, the manner of it was as followeth. First, they hired the house at Westminster of one Ferris, and having his house they sought then to make a mine under the upper house of Parliament, and they began to make the mine in or about the 11th of December. And they five first entered into the works, and soon after took another to them, having first sworn him and taken his sacrament for secrecy. And when they came to the wall, that was about three yards thick, and found it a matter of great difficulty, they took to them another in like manner, with oath and sacrament as foresaid, all which seven were gentlemen of name and blood, and not any was employed in or about this action, no, not so much as in digging and mining, that was not to gentlemen. And having wrought to the wall before Christmas, they ceased, till after the holidays, and the day before Christmas, having a mass of earth that came out of the mine, they carried it to the garden of the said house, and after Christmas they wrought the wall till Candlemas, and wrought the wall half way through, and saith that all the time while the other wrought, he stood as sentinel to decry any man that came near. And when any man came near to the place, upon warning given him, they ceased, until they had noticed to proceed from him, and saith that, and that they seven all lay in the house, and had shot and powder, and they all resolved to die in that place before they yielded or were taken. And, as they were working, they heard a rushing in the cellar, which grew by one bright selling of his coals, whereupon this examinant, fearing they had been discovered, went into the cellar and viewed the cellar, and perceiving the commodity thereof for their purpose, and understanding how it would be let by his master, Mr. Percy hireth the cellar for a year for four pounds rent, he confesses that after Christmas twenty barrels of powder were brought by themselves to the house, which they had on the bank side in hampers, and from that house removed the powder to the said house near the upper house of Parliament, and presently, upon hiring the cellar, they themselves removed the powder into the cellar, and covered the same with faggots, which they had before laid into the cellar. After, about Easter, he went into the low countries, as he hath before declared in his former examination, and that the true purpose of his going over was, lest being a dangerous man, he should be known and suspected. And in the meantime, he left the key of the cellar with Mr. Percy, who in his absence caused more billets to be laid into the cellar, as in his former examination he confessed and returned about the end of August, or the beginning of September, and went again to the said house near to the said cellar, and received the key of the cellar again of one of the five. And then they brought in five or six barrels of powder more into the cellar, which also they covered with billets, saving four little barrels covered with faggots, and then this examinant went into the country about the end of September. It appeareth the powder was in the cellar, placed as it was found, the 5th of November, when the lords came to progue the Parliament, and saith that he returned again to the said house near the cellar on Wednesday, the 30th of October. He confesseth as he was at the Earl of Montgomery's marriage, but as he saith, with no intention of evil, having a sword about him, and was very near to his majesty and the lords present. For so much they knew not well how they should come by person with Duke Charles, being near London, where they had no forces, if he had not been also blown up, he confesses that it would be resolved among them that the same day that this detestable act should have been performed, the same day should other of their confederacy have surprised the person of the Lady Elizabeth, and presently have proclaimed her queen, to which purpose a proclamation was drawn, as well as to avow and justify the action as to have protested against the Union, and in no sort meddled with religion therein, and would have protested also against all strangers, this proclamation should have been made in the name of the Lady Elizabeth. Being demanded why they did not surprise the king's person, and draw him to the effecting of their purpose, saith that so many must have been acquainted with such an action, as it would not have been kept secret. He confesses that if their purpose had been taken, till they had had power enough, they would not have avowed the deed to be theirs. But if their power for their defence and safety had been sufficient, they themselves would have taken then have taken it upon them. They meant also to have sent for the prisoners in the tower, to have come to them, of whom particularly they had some consultation. He confesses that the place of rendezvous was in Warwickshire, and that the armour was sent thither, but the particular thereof he knows not. He confesses that they had consultation for the taking of the Lady Mary into their possession, but knew not how to come by her. And he confesses that provision was made by some of the conspiracy to 
as a armour of proof this last summer for the action. He confesses that the powder was brought by the common purse of the Confederates. The ninth, the day on which Fawkes was to be put to the torture, brought news to the government that the fear of insurrection need no longer be entertained. It had been known before this that Fawkes' Confederates had met on the 5th at Dunchurch on the pretext of a hunting match, and had been breaking open houses in Warwickshire and Worcestershire in order to collect arms. Yet so indefinite was the knowledge of the council that, on the 8th, they offered a reward for the apprehension of Percy alone, without including any of the other conspirators. On the evening of the 9th, they received a letter from Sir Richard Walsh, the Sheriff of Worcestershire. We think fit, he wrote, with all speed to certify your lordships of the happy success it hath pleased God to give us against the rebellious assembly in these parts. After such time as they had taken the horses from Warwick upon Tuesday night last, they came to Mr. Robert Winter's house to Huddington upon Wednesday night, where, having entered, they armed themselves at all points in open rebellion. They passed from thence upon Thursday morning unto Hewell, the Lord Windsor's house, which they entered and took from thence by force great store of armour, artillery of the said Lord Windsor's, and passed that night to the county of Staffordshire, unto the house of one Stephen Littleton, gentleman, called Holbeck, about two miles distant from Starbridge, whither we pursued with the assistance of John Folliot, knight, Francis Kettlesby, a squire, Humphrey Solway, gentleman, Edward Walsh, and Francis Conyers, gentleman, with a few other gentlemen in the power and face of the country. We made against them upon Thursday morning, and freshly pursued them until the next day, at which time, about twelve or one o'clock in the afternoon, we overtook them at the same Holbeck house, took the greatest part of their retinue, and some of the better sort being dispersed and fled before our coming. Whereupon, and after a summons and warning first given and proclamation in His Highness's name, to yield and submit themselves, who, refusing the same, we fired some part of the house, and assaulted some part of the rebellious persons left in the said house, in which assault one Robert Catesby is slain, and three others verily thought wounded to death, whose names, as far as we can learn, are Thomas Percy, gentleman, John Wright, and Christopher Wright, gentleman, and these are apprehended and taken, Thomas Winter, gentleman, John Grant, gentleman, Henry Morgan, gentleman, Ambrose Rookwood, gentleman, Thomas Ockley, carpenter, Edward Townsend, servant to the said John Grant, Nicholas Pellbrowrow, servant unto the said Ambrose Rookwood, Edward Ockley, carpenter, Richard Townsend, servant to the said Robert Winter, Richard Day, servant to the said Stephen Littleton, which said prisoners are in safe custody here, and so shall remain until your honour's good pleasures to be further known. We have cause to be followed with fresh suit, and hope of their speedy apprehension. We have also thought fit to send unto your honours, according unto our duties, such letters as we have found about the parties apprehended. And so, resting in all duty at your honours further command, we take leave from Stourbridge this Saturday morning, being the ninth of this instant, November 1605. Your honours most humble to be commanded. Richard Walsh End of section 32《Section 33 of the Great Events by Famous Historians, Volume 10. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. — The Great Events by Famous Historians, Volume 10, by Charles F. Horne, Rossiter Johnson, and John Rudd. Cervantes's Don Quixote Reforms Literature A.D. 1605, by Henry Edward Watts. Miguel de Cervantes Saavedra is the most celebrated of Spanish authors, but his fame rests upon a far more solid basis than merely that of having written the most readable and tender of humorous romances. He reformed literature. He tilted at windmills as truly as ever his hero did, and overthrew the false taste for wordy pomp and emptiness which was characteristic of his times. It was not only Spanish literature that felt the impulse of his warm, frank honesty and insight into life. All Europe was his debtor. Cervantes was an impoverished nobleman, that too common product of Spain in those days 
when her American gold fleets had begun to fail her. In his early manhood he was an author and then a soldier of fortune in Italy. He fought as a common soldier on one of the Genoese galleys in the great sea fight of Lepanto, distinguished himself there by his heroism, and was three times wounded, crippled in one arm for life. Later he was captured by Algerian pirates and was for five years a slave, ever planning and attempting escapes, a daring, dashing hero, the life and admiration of his fellow captives. After his ransom and return to Spain, Cervantes once more took up literature, the amusement of his youth. He became a playwright and romancer. The government gave him a small position as a tax collector, but with such good-natured carelessness did he handle this uncongenial employ that he had repeatedly to make good from his own pocket the losses he entailed upon the government. Even this unsatisfactory labor failed the impractical author about the period of the death of King Philip II, 1598. He was imprisoned for debt and sank into such abject poverty that he depended on his friends for bread. How much the gloomy Philip II is satirized in Cervantes's masterpiece has always been a disputed question. The accession of the new king, which had been hailed as the light after darkness, had little effect on Cervantes's fortunes. Philip III, though he had some taste for letters and was not without sprouts of kindliness in his heart, had been by education and by an overstrict regimen in youth debased, so that he was even more completely a slave to the priestly influence than his father had been, without any of his father's ability or force of character. The Duke of Lerma was, quote, the Atlas who bore the burden of the monarchy, end quote. He was a man, according to Quevedo, quote, alluring and dexterous rather than intelligent, ruled by the interested cunning of his own creatures, but imperious with all others, magnificent, ostentatious, choosing his men only by considerations of his own special policy or from personal friendship. End quote. Under such a man who ruled the king at his will, it was not likely that any portion of the royal benevolence should light on Miguel de Cervantes. Moreover, the crowd of suppliants at court was very great, their appetite stimulated doubtless by the flattering reports of the new king's liberal disposition. A contemporary writer laments with pathetic zeal and pious indignation the lot of many famous captains and valiant soldiers who, after serving the king all their lives and being riddled with wounds, were not only pushed aside into corners without any reward, but condemned to see unworthy men without merit loaded with benefits, merely through enjoying the favor of some minister or courtier. The Duke of Lerma, as one who professed a contempt for all letters and learning, was even less likely to be influenced by Cervantes's literary merits than by his services as a soldier, services which had now become an old story. Disappointed in his hopes of preferment, Cervantes had to maintain himself and his family by the exercise of his pen, writing, as we learn, letters and memorials for those who needed them while busy upon his new book. Without the gifts which are in favor at court, unskilled in the arts of solicitation, we can imagine with a man of Cervantes's temperament what a special hell it must have been, quote, in suing long to bide, end quote. About this time he seems almost to have dropped out of life. The four years between 1598 and 1602 are the obscurest in his story. We do not know where he lived or what he did. 
It was the crisis of the struggle with his unrelenting evil destiny. The presumption is that he was still in the South, engaged in his humble occupation of gathering rents, of buying grain for the use of the fleet, with intervals perhaps of social enjoyment among such friends as he had made at Seville, among whom is reckoned the painter Francisco de Pacheco. This was for our hero the darkest hour before the dawn. For already, according to my calculation, he must have begun to write to Don Quixote, being now, 1602, in his 55th year. He had duly qualified himself, by personal experience, to tell the story of the adventures of him who sought to revive the spirit of the ancient chivalry. His own romance was ended. The pathetic lines of Goethe might seem to be written for his own case. Wer nie sein Brot mit Tränen aß, wer nicht die kummervollen Nächte auf seinem Bette weinen saß, der kennt euch nicht, ihr himmlischen Mächte. Footnote from Wilhelm Meister Lehrjahre, Chapter 12, thus English by Thomas Carlyle. Who never ate his bread in sorrow, who never spent the darksome hours weeping and watching for the morrow, he knew you not, ye unseen powers. And a footnote. Never had any man of letters to go through a severer ordeal. At last his genius found the true path for which it had been beating about so many years, but not until his prime of life had passed, when even that brave heart must have been chilled and that gay spirit deadened. In 1601 Philip III, at the instance of the Duke of Lerma, removed the court to the old capital of Castile, Valladolid, by nature far better situated for a metropolis than Madrid, which had been the choice of his grandfather, Charles V. Thither Cervantes repaired, in 1603, doubtless with some hope of gleaning some crumbs of the royal favor. He was no more fortunate with the new king than he had been with the old. Despairing of place or patronage, he turned with his brave spirit unquenched, as by the record sufficiently appears, to completing this new thing among books. Don Quixote was probably finished by the beginning of 1604, though some further time elapsed, as it seems, before the author had courage to go to print. His genius had lain fallow for twenty years. He was now old and had written nothing or at least published nothing, since Galatea. What fame was left to him he had earned as a poet among many poets. As an author, if he was remembered at all, it was in a line wholly different from that which he now essayed. There is reason to believe that the manuscript of the new book was in circulation among those who called themselves the author's friends, as was the custom of the age, before he found a patron and a publisher. The publisher was got at last in Francisco Robles, the king's printer, to whom the copyright was sold for ten years. The patron appeared in the person of the Duc de Bihar, a nobleman described by a writer of that age, Cristobal de Mesa, as himself both a poet and a valiant soldier. The choice was not altogether a happy one for the Duke of Bihar might be said to have an ancestral claim to be regarded as a patron of books of chivalries. It was to his great-grandfather that one of the silliest and most extravagant of the romances had been dedicated by the author Feliciano de Silva, who is the writer specially ridiculed by Cervantes, the very book which is the subject of a parody in the opening chapter of Don Quixote. The Duke of Bihar was noted, moreover, for his own uncommon affection for the books of chivalries then in fashion, and it is probable that he at first understood Don Quixote to be one such as he was in the habit of reading. Learning of his mistake, he refused, it is said, the dedication, 
and withdrew his patronage from the author. Then, according to the pleasant story first told by Vicente de los Rios, was enacted that scene which has been so favorite a subject with modern artists. Cervantes begged of the duke to give him a hearing before deciding against his book, upon which he was permitted to read a chapter, which the duke found so much to his taste that he graciously readmitted the author into his favor and consented to receive the dedication. There is another tradition which imputes to the duke's confessor, an ecclesiastic who must have had a cleaner nose for heterodoxy than most of his fellows, the original rejection of the dedication by the duke, the alteration in its wording, and the subsequent neglect of the author. The dedication which now does duty at the opening of the first part of Don Quixote, I have shown to have been tampered with by someone bearing no good will to Cervantes. The privilege of publication is dated September 26, and the Tassa December 20, 1604. The book itself, the first part of Don Quixote, it was not so called in the first edition, of course, was printed by Juan de la Cuesta during 1604 and published at Madrid in January 1605. The impression was very carelessly made and swarms with blunders, typographical and otherwise, showing that it was not corrected or revised by the author. The press work, however, is quite equal in execution to that of most books of that age. The reception which Don Quixote met on its first appearance was cordial beyond all precedent, and such as must have convinced the author, who was evidently doubtful of his new experiment, that here at last his genius had found its true field of exercise. The persons of culture, indeed, received the book coldly. The half-learned sneered at the title as absurd and at the style as vulgar. Who was this ingenio lejo, this lay unlearned wit, quote, a poor Latinless author, end quote, which is what they said of Shakespeare, outside of the cultus proper of no university education, who had dared to parody the tastes of the higher circles. The envy and malice of all his rivals, especially of those who found themselves included in the satire, even the great Lope himself, the phoenix of his age, then at the height of his glory, spoke out with open mouth against the author. The chorus of dispraise was swelled by all those, persons chiefly of high station, whose fashion of reading had been ridiculed. A book professing to be of entertainment, in which knights and knightly exercises were made a jest of, in which peasants, innkeepers, muleteers, and other vulgar people spoke their own language and behaved after their own fashion, was a daring innovation all the more offensive because the laugh was directed at what was felt to be a national infirmity. Who was the bold man who, being neither courtier nor ecclesiastic, made sport for the world out of the weaknesses of caballeros? An old soldier of Lepanto, indeed. Lepanto was a name outworn. Spain was now in a new world. Crusades against the unbeliever even those more popular ones, which combined the saving of souls with the getting of gold, were long out of fashion. Lastly, the entire ecclesiastical body, the formidable phalanx of the endowed, with their patrons, dependents, and dupes, though they were too dull to perceive and too dense to feel the shafts aimed at obscurantism and superstition, had something more than a suspicion that this book, called Don Quixote, was a book to be discouraged. In spite of the frowns and sneers of the quality, however, and the ill-concealed disgust of the learned, Don Quixote was received with unbounded applause by the common people. Those best critics in every age and country, the honest readers, 
were neither bourgeois nor genteel, neither learned nor ignorant, welcomed the book with a joyous enthusiasm, as a wholly new delight and source of entertainment. Nothing like it had ever appeared before. It was an epoch-making book, if ever there was one. The proud and happy author himself spoke of his success with a frank complacency, which in any other man would savor of vanity. Some seven or eight editions of Don Quixote are supposed to have been printed in the first year, of which six are now extant, two of Madrid, two of Lisbon, and two of Valencia. The number of copies issued from the press in one year was probably in excess of the number reached by any book since the invention of printing. But though all Spain talked of Don Quixote and read Don Quixote, and though the book brought him much fame, some consolation, and a few good friends, it does not appear to have helped to mend the fortunes of Cervantes in any material degree. In accordance with the usual dispensation, the author derived the least benefit from his success. Francisco Robles and Juan de la Cuesta, doubtless, made a good thing of it, but to Miguel de Cervantes there must have come but a small share of the profit. The laws of copyright were in that age little regarded, and it may be questioned whether in a book published in Madrid they could be enforced outside of Castile. The pirates and the wreckers were busy upon Don Quixote from its very earliest appearance, and its quick and plentiful reproduction in all the chief cities, not only of Spain but of the outside Spanish dominions, though highly flattering to the author, could not have greatly helped to lighten his life of toil and penury. Taking the object of Don Quixote to be what Cervantes declared it, quote, the causing of the false and silly books of chivalries to be abhorred by mankind, end quote, no book was ever so successful. The doughtiest knight of romance never achieved an adventure so stupendous as that which Miguel de Cervantes undertook and accomplished. With his pen keener than the lance of a Splendian or Felix Mart, he slew the whole herd of puissant cavaliers, of very valiant and accomplished lovers. Before him went down the Florisandros and Florizels, the Lisuartes and Lepolemos, the Primaleons and Polindos, and the whole brood of the Invincible. Scarcely a single romance was printed, and not one was written, after the date of the publication of Don Quixote. Such a revolution in taste was never accomplished by any single writer in any age or country. A few words only are here needed in the discussion of that question which has occupied so largely the ingenuity of writers, native and foreign, as to what was the object of Cervantes in writing Don Quixote. There are those who insist upon seeking in every work of humor or of wit some meaning other and deeper than in the book appears, as though it were impossible that an author should be disinterested or write merely out of the fullness of his heart or pride in his work. With Cervantes's own declaration, more than once repeated of the purpose of his book, the critics will not be content. So good a book must have had a better reason for being than Cervantes's dislike of the fantastic books of the later chivalry. Who then was the man, the original of Don Quixote? Against whom was the satire leveled? Of course, nothing was then known to the world outside of poor Don Rodrigo de Pacheco, the Argamazilan Hidalgo. Some great man Cervantes must have intended to ridicule. It was Charles V, said some. It was his son Philip, cried others, ignoring the absurdity of the prudent one losing his wits through excessive reading of romances. 
it was the Duke of Lerma, or the Duke of Osuna, or some other great man, or Cervantes's wife's cousin, who opposed his marriage with Catalina. It was Ignatius Loyola, our own countryman, the good John Bowles suggested. Surely these various theories are a little far-fetched, and not a little grotesque and absurd. What there is in either of the two Spanish monarchs to liken him to the Knight of La Mancha, it is difficult to see. Those who have looked upon that wonderful equestrian picture of Titian's in the Museo at Madrid, with its weird, weary, far-off expression, are irresistibly led to think of Don Quixote, but the converse is by no means so clear that on looking at Don Quixote we are tempted to think of that most unromantic of monarchs, Carlos V. His son is still more unlike his supposed portrait. As to the Duke of Lerma, they who can believe on the faith of the cock and bull stories told by the Abbé Langlais de Frenois and the Jesuit Rapin that Cervantes satirized the all-powerful minister in revenge for personal injuries suffered at his hands, may be consigned to the same limbo with the believers in the Bacon Shakespeare. The theory about Loyola, first mooted by Bowle, the English commentator, is of all perhaps not the least absurd. The one shred by which it hangs is a passage in Don Quixote, where the angry Biscayan, the adversary of Don Quixote, is made a native of Athpathia, this being the name of the obscure village where Loyola was born. A sufficient answer to all these theories is that contained in the book itself. Surely no one has read Don Quixote with profit to himself, who has been unable to see that the hero is not one whom the author desired to revile or to malign. Never was a satire like this which leaves us full of love and sympathy for the object. And why cannot we believe the author when he avers that never did his humble pen stoop to satire? He meant, of course, the satire of persons as distinguished from the reprehension and the ridicule of human follies and general vices. As a lampoon, Don Quixote could hardly have endured to this day. The spirit which has given it eternal life is love and not hate. To estimate the worth of the service performed by Cervantes, not in abolishing romance, as has been absurdly said, still less in discrediting chivalry, as with even a more perverse misconception of his purpose has been suggested, but in purging books of fiction of their grossness and their extravagance, and restoring romance to truth and to nature, we have to consider the enormous influence exercised by this pernicious literature over the minds of the people of Spain in the 16th century. The ceaseless wars with the Moors had trained the whole manhood of the nation to soldiership. The trade of fighting was familiar to every man of good birth, so that the word for knight, caballero, came to be synonymous with that for gentleman. The constant exercise in arms made of chivalry in Spain a more solemn and more serious calling than elsewhere. As a native writer says, with equal point and spirit, there was developed by the chronic war with the Moor a caballerismo. There is none but a Spanish word for a quality purely indigenous, essentially distinct from the gay, fantastic chivalry of the North. It extended to all classes of the people. It was not confined to the aristocracy. Quote, every Spaniard was a warrior, every warrior a noble, and every noble a knight of his country." End quote. They had not to go far to seek for adventures. They had the Paynim at home. Mahound and Termagant were at their doors. There was a constant supply at hand of men of the wrong faith and alien habits, the delight in fighting whom was enhanced by the fact that they equally were possessed of the chivalric fervor 
and though moors and misbelievers, gentlemen still, and cavaliers. The long and desperate struggle for existence evolved the highest qualities of the race, and small wonder it was that out of that fruitful soil which had grown the Cid and the warriors of the heroic age, who should be rightly classed as pre-chivalric, there sprung up that rancor produce, the knight-errant. Of these, the seekers after adventures, the bohemians of the knightly order, Spain, as their native historians boast, was the teeming mother. No other country in that age, or in the previous one, could show the world such a scene as that gravely enacted before King Juan II and his court, when eighty knights ran a tilt with each other, and incurred serious loss of limb and permanent injury to their persons, in order that one of them might fulfill a fantastic vow made to his mistress. Knight errantry, which was a caprice in France and in England, in Spain was a calling. No other country could afford such a field for it, and to no other society was it so well suited. The grave and wise Fernando de Pulgar, the counselor and chronicler of Ferdinand and Isabella, speaks with complacency of the noblemen he knew who had gone into foreign countries in search of adventures, quote, so as to gain honor for themselves and the fame of valiant and hardy knights for the gentlemen of Castile, end quote, boasting that there were more Spanish knights of the errant sort than of any other nation. The romance of chivalry was the natural growth of this fashion of knight errantry, and, like its parent, flourished nowhere so luxuriantly as in Spain. Amadis of Gaul and Bellianis of Greece are in fact as much quote-unquote racy of the soil as Don Quixote itself. There were some simple or devout enough to take the romance for a gospel who believed in Amadis as much as in any other hero or saint. In the Arte de Galanteria, written by Francisco de Portugal about the close of the 16th century, it is mentioned that a Portuguese poet, Simon de Silveira, once swore upon the evangelists that he believed the whole of Amadis to be true history. This is kept by another story in the same book of how a certain knight came home from hunting and found his wife and daughters dissolved in tears, asking them what was the matter, whether any child or relation was dead, they said, no, but Amadis is dead. They had come to the 174th chapter of Lisuarte of Greece, where the old Amadis finally dies. The influence of the Palmarins and of the Carlovingian romances, which form a class by themselves, was scarcely inferior to that of Amadis. Palmerin of England himself, the patriarch of the family, that quote-unquote palm of England, as Cervantes calls him, may be placed second to his rival in merit. The difference in spirit is great between the two, for Amadis really is, though in its present form of the 15th of the 14th century, when chivalry was in its early prime, and Palmerin was not written till the 16th century, when the true ideal of knighthood had already been dimmed by the lust of gold-seeking and religious adventure. Southey perhaps ranks Palmerin too high in the literary scale by placing it on a level with Amadis, and averring that he knew, quote, no romance and no epic in which suspense is so successfully kept up, end quote. Of their successors, the long line of sons, grandsons, and nephews, each more valiant and puissant than the last, it must be said that they are as scant of beauty as of grace. In order to keep up the interest of their readers, the authors of the Primalians and of the Palindos, the Florizels and the Florizandos, were compelled to put in wonders on an ascending scale, to pile up adventure upon adventure, to make the dragons fiercer, the giants huger, 
the fighting more terrible and the slaughter more bloody. The popular appetite, which craved for more and more excitement with every successive stimulant, could only be fed by inventions so monstrous that it is a wonder the stomach of the readers of romances of chivalry did not reject the nauseous element. Yet there is no evidence of any decline in the production of these books up to the date of the appearance of Don Quixote. It was to do battle with this brood of fabled monsters against whom the pulpit and the parliament had preached and legislated in vain that Cervantes took up his pen. The adventure was one reserved for his single arm, and it was achieved with a completeness of success such as must have astonished our hero himself, as we know by many signs that it disgusted and irritated many of his literary rivals. The true nature of the service performed as well as Cervantes's motive in undertaking it, has been greatly misrepresented. Nothing can be more certain that his aim in Don Quixote was primarily to correct the prevailing false taste in literature. What moral and social results followed were the necessary consequences of the employment of his rare wit and humor on such a work. There is no reason to believe that Cervantes at first had any more serious intention than that which he avowed, namely to give, quote, a pastime to melancholy souls, end quote, in destroying, quote, the authority and influence which the books of chivalries have in the world and over the vulgar, end quote. That he was not impelled to this work by any antipathy to knightly romances as such, still less by any ambition to repress the spirit of chivalry or to purge the commonwealth of social and political abuses, is abundantly proved by the whole tenor of his book, if not by the evidence of his life. His own tastes strongly inclined him to books of romance. Perhaps no one in that age had read more of those books or was so deeply imbued with their spirit. The opinion of an acute Spanish writer, Don Vicente de Salva, on this point we hold to be a very sensible one. Quote, Cervantes did not intend to satirize the substance and essence of books of chivalries, but only to purge away their follies and impossibilities. End quote. What is Don Quixote itself, it is truly added, but a romance of chivalry, quote, which has ruined the fortunes of its predecessors by being so immensely in advance of them, end quote. What was Cervantes's own last books, as we shall presently show, but in some kind a romance of chivalry, not free, alas, from some of the very errors he had himself burlesqued? Nay, what was Cervantes's own life but a romance of chivalry? That, after all, the overthrow of the books of chivalries was but a small part of the good work which Cervantes performed in Don Quixote is only to say that, like all great writers, he, quote, built it better than he knew, end quote. The pen of the genius, as Heine says, is even greater than the man himself. Rejecting all the many subtle and ingenious theories as to what was Cervantes's object in writing his book, that it was a crusade against enthusiasm, as even Heine seems to suspect, that it was a missionary tract intended to destroy popery and throw down Antichrist, as some, even bearded men, have dared to suggest, that it was a program of advanced liberalism artfully veiled under a mask of levity, and indeed the forerunner of that gospel of sentimental cosmopolitanism since preached by other eminent persons supposed to resemble Cervantes in their character or Don Quixote in their careers, I hold that the author wrote but out of the fullness of his own heart, giving us by a happy impulse a fable in which are transparently figured his own character, his own experiences, and his own sufferings. 
What is the key but this to the mystery which makes this book, on a purely local subject of passing interest, the book of humanity for all time, as popular out of Spain as among Spaniards? A mere burlesque would have died with the books which it killed. A satire survives only so long as the person or the thing satirized is remembered. But Don Quixote lives, and, by a miracle of genius, keeps Amadis and Palmerin alive. The invention is the most simple, as it is the most original in literature. From Don Quixote dates an epoch in the art of fiction. For once Cervantes was happy in his opportunity. And what is the secret of his success? Is it that this, quote, child of his sterile, ill-cultured wit, end quote, is no creature of pure fancy, but fashioned in the very likeness of its parent, drawn out of his life, shaped after his pattern, an image of its creator. How could Cervantes's romance fail of holding the field against all the romances? It was his own life from which he drew, that life which had been a true knight-errantry. The hero himself, the enthusiast, nursed in visions of chivalry, who is ever mocked by fortune, the reviver of the old knighthood, who is buffeted by clowns and made sport by the baser sort, who, in spite of the frequent blows, jeers, reverses, and indignities he receives, never ceases to command our love and sympathy. Who is he but the man of Lepanto himself, whose life is a romance at least as various, eventful, and arduous, as full of hardships, troubles, and sadness, as prolific of surprising adventures and strange accidents as the immortal story he has written. This is the key to Don Quixote, which, unless we use, we shall not reach to the heart of the mystery. End of section 33